Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the council meeting for the 7th of June. Please join me in, as, in standing for the opening karakia. Oh, Tyler, thank you. Thank you. Now, I'd just like to say, um, yeah, we will, we will, we will stand. A, a fortnight ago, or I'll do, I'll stand. Yeah. Yes. A fortnight ago, we were all saddened to hear of the death of Max, Max Freudenberg, Freudenberg in Hagley Park. He was an arborist contracted by us and worked close, closely with our team in the park for some, for some long time. We always want our staff and contractors to go home safely at the end of the day. This has been a tragedy for Max's family and friends and his colleagues. And I now ask you if you could join me in standing for a moment's silence in recognition of his work for council. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <coughs> now, before we get started, I'd just like to say that, that some, some parts of this meeting may get a bit exciting and stuff like that. I'd just like everyone to respect everyone else and not go off at, at a tangent. That's members, that's people out there. Um, we're respecting that you've come into our house and you want to speak to us, so we will listen. So, And we will, we will give you the same respect back. Thank you very much. Right, we have no apologies for today. Uh, I do have a couple of the declarations of interest from councillors McDonald and Templeton regarding item 20 about LPC governance. We have no petitions today, but as we have a large number of public partition speaker, participation speakers, we're going to confirm our previous meeting minutes first and then hear from the community boards. Can I get a mover and Sam? And Sorry. Yes. Sorry. Certainly. Yep, we can do that. Yep, excellent. So Sam's happy to... And, and Pauline? Yep. Which minutes? Sorry, we're just confirming at which part of the annual plan hearings the, the apologies were for. Just at the beginning. At the beginning. Yep. So okay. Mel gave an apology for late notice. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tyra. Okay, so I'll put that motion. All those in favour? Against. Thank you. Carried. So now, monthly reports from the community boards. Um, we'll hear from the community boards first. Up is Horswell Hornby Rickerton, and I'd like to welcome Chair Helen and Deputy Chair Marie to the table, please. And please, um, time is of the essence today because we've uh, got over 100 minutes of um, delegations and public forums, so uh, please. <laughs> Um, good morning, everyone. Um, so the community board has made some decisions um, under delegation, and highlights of it are which of which are um, the uh, adoption of the community board plan for the 2023 to 2025, and um, board has also approved 15 community service award nominations and four 
Youth Service Award nominations. Um, the others, um, four um, fund applications were also approved. Um, next, um, we have an update on the Matatiki Hornby Center. Um, an operator is being sought to lease the new cafe, which will be located in the heart of the Matatiki Hornby Center. Proposals are open and closed midday, um, Wednesday, June 14th. And the library wing is almost um, enclosed with the majority of cladding and windows now in place. All main superstructure elements in the pool hall have been installed and the roof system over this space is about to commence. Um, we have a community board site visit scheduled on June 22nd. Um, the Springlands Reserve Trapping Project, um, located at the intersection of Murphy's Road and Quaves Road in Hallswell, Springlands Reserve is a fantastic eight-hectare reserve with wetlands, native plantings, and walkways. And a um, small group of volunteers um, meet every six weeks <coughs> to do planting and maintenance work in the reserve. They've also set up 20 traps as part of a project, which received support from the board's um, off the ground fund. Since setting up the traps last year, they have had over 250 catches, including several mustelids. Um, these are the weasels, stoats, and ferrets, which originally um, came from Europe and were first introduced in the 1880s to control New Zealand's growing rabbit population. Unfortunately, they had limited effect, and all three have become pests in their own right and they now pose as a significant threat to native wildlife nationwide. Um, next is we have um, the Waikola Hoops. Um, we had an event on Anzac Day afternoon, which was successful, um, the three-on-three -three basketball competition. Um, and th that's it. I pass thank you, you on to our chair. And thank you. Now, first of all, I'd like to thank you for approving the Horsell Junction Road extension. It's really been necessary. For a long time, so thank, thank you to this council. Uh, we've had had one quite difficult issue, in that um, residents of Copper Ridge have come to us and lodged a petition or at least a memo. I think it's been tabled with you. We've had meetings with Kaying Aura, meetings with our senior planning staff. Um, we've attended to drop-ins sessions um, run by Kainga Aura, um, and there may be a, a further meeting, a small round table meeting. We can't, what has happened is that a private developer was progressing the project and then it's been picked up by Kainga Aura, and from what I've seen of emails since, it's happening elsewhere in Belfast in this city but all around the country. So there's a different process. If Kaying Aura own the land, they consult early. If, however, it's being put through by a private developer and then they pick it up, they don't have that time for proper, proper consultation. So that's really to um, tell council that this seems to be an ongoing issue. It's not just a one-off. Um, and we had a meeting with Hornby residents recently. It was a very fruitful meeting with staff, and we're looking at a very difficult intersection. Um, the Greater Hornby Residents Association is now doing its own consultation with their own residents. They'll feed that back to us, and then we'll come back to council. It won't be in this annual plan. It's, it's next year's long-term plan. So thank you very much indeed for your time. Spot on time. Thank, time. thank you very, time. very much. Thank you, Alan. Thank, thank you, Marie. Okay, so next we have Coastal Burwood Limwood with his Paul and Jackie, please. <coughs> Welcome. Tēnā um, katoa. Thank you. We'll, we'll be trying to be quick uh, this morning because um, I know that you have lots of people waiting for you. Um, uh, firstly, just uh, I'd like to again thank my colleagues for their constructive work um, on our community board plan, uh, which we uh, which we developed um, collaboratively uh, with staff and uh, community, um, and uh, just a few highlights. 
uh, we, uh, we're supporting uh, things like the Bromley Traffic Plan uh, and environmental uh, well-being uh, across, uh, across the, um, the ward, um, uh, ward area, including um, air quality, which includes um, dealing with the wastewater treatment plant on the gas processing plant, and dealing with uh, noise coming from um, Portland containers. Um, and, and, and also looking after um, the, the three rivers which run through our board area, um, and also a bunch of um, uh, safety initiatives in um, places like Woolston and New Brighton, um, and supporting community facilities uh, in, um, in Burwood. Um, and um, and uh, next, I uh, just want to draw attention to the, uh, the refurbishing of the Bromley um, Community Centre. Uh, it's fantastic. Uh, work that has been done there. Uh, the, the staff there are absolutely wrapped um, and we've got a few more things to bring it up to the standard that we'd like uh, but yeah just really want to commend uh, the staff and the council staff and the, the <coughs> community centre staff for uh, their work there. Um, Jackie? Yeah, I'd just like to comment on the Garden Pride Awards. We did have a wonderful function um, to give out these awards. I do think it's excellent that we encourage these kind of events and that we recognise the contribution that gardeners bring to the beautifying of our city, and that is for all of us, whether we're walking the streets or driving around, we get to enjoy the beauty of other people's work. So um, the event in itself was was um, very successful with um, 80 people in attendance, and... Yeah, well received. Thank you. Thanks, Jackie. Um, and and uh, yes, yeah, but good to great to celebrate um, young people around the east. Uh, as you'll be aware, there's some we young people in the east face um, uh, some challenges, but we have some amazing uh, youth organisations uh, which work in tandem with uh, the, the council and other community organisations um, to support young people and provide uh, pro-social activities. Uh, so it's great uh, to see that happening. Um, again, thanks to the, our, our local government staff uh, for their work on that. Um, and finally, oh, we've got a video, but we don't have time, so yeah, I'm going to skip it. Um, the, uh, I, I just wanted to uh, talk about the Startworks Notice Communication. Um, I know that uh, um, some councillors are concerned about this too, uh, but essentially it doesn't appear to be enough coordination and communication around the starting of works. Um, when we uh, ask about things, uh, so when, like at the moment, Bromley is kind of ring fenced with um, with roadworks, uh, and there and there was uh, some some works that were planned to make it even not not the intention, but to make it worse. Uh, and when we asked for them to be changed, they were, but it doesn't appear to be the communication, particularly when it comes to council works, NZTA works, and Orion works, all conflicting with each other. I think we need some kind of deconfliction uh, type process, um, and also we've just asked to get uh, um, start works notices from NZTA because uh, keep coming by surprise. Uh, so it'd be good to have a more systemic uh, response to that. Jackie. Okay, um, I'm aware that there has been recent briefings on the Bromley um, Organics Processing <coughs> Plant, and um, I acknowledge that you are doing work in this area, but I also wish to state uncategorically. 14 years of air pollution has impacted terribly on the people of Bromley with ongoing trauma, mental health issues, and that is now beginning to affect them in a physical way where they are getting physiological symptoms of ill health due to 14 years of air pollution. I cannot implore you enough to close this plant, and I need it, we need it to be closed. The Bromley community will not accept anything less than normal life. And finally, um, I mean, and similar things have happened with both the wastewater treatment plant and the organics processing plant, where there's been uh, disruption to the normal uh, process, and we've been all been taken by surprise. And when I say all, you as well. Um, and I don't think uh, that's acceptable. That uh, the um, whoever is managing it is uh, taken has something go wrong, and then doesn't immediately inform council so that we get to uh, answer the question of what's what's happened, what's made it worse, um, and we don't even know. So. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Okay, all done? Thank you very much for coming. That's perfect timing. Thank you. And certainly take on board what you're saying. Thank you. Okay, so now we have Banks Peninsula. We've got Reuben and Penelope.
and Penelope's changed. Penelope looks a little different this morning. Morning, <laughs> <laughs> um, Okoto. Um, thanks, Phil, for the Ford tease about things getting a little bit exciting this morning. I'm sure you were referring to the Te Pātaka or Rākaihotu Banks Peninsula Community Board report. Absolutely. Um, of which it is my pleasure to share. And uh, our overarching principle in our board plan was... Um, deepening engagement with the six Papataburunanga across Banks Peninsula. And the photo on our cover here is board and staff at a recent visit to Onukumarai, which is at the heart of Akaroa, but also uh, at the heart of, of New Zealand's history, a really significant site and a really productive day um, for the board and staff to continue forming the relationships that are so important in governance in this space. Jumping on to the next slide, we've got some discretionary response funding. Um, the first was to the Living Streams Nursery in Little River. Um, this is a fantastic community nursery with a really large um, native propagation operation going on. It's also the reason I always have old plant pots in the back of my car, because you can drop them in there and they'll reuse them. So um, they don't need to go in the yellow bin, they can go to Little River. Um, the Loons Club also received a grant towards Anzac Day. Um, the club's got a really strong history of um, community support and involvement in Littleton, and their open door policy on Anzac Day is fantastic if you're ever in Littleton, get along. And um, $4,000 also to the Akaroa District Promotions Group, who have a really important role in Akaroa, bringing local businesses and, and tourism operators together. Uh, the Youth Development Funding um, Charlie Bridger got $500 towards, not to cover the entire costs, a trip to Costa Brava, Spain, um, which should bode well next time we have Sale GP in town, we'll have even more local expertise. Um, coming back to the overarching principle around um, Runanga engagement, we recently had an excellent briefing from uh, Coco Rarata, Port Levy, around some of the issues that are faced in that community. It's, it's a theme that we keep coming back to in our reports across the peninsula around resilience and infrastructure support for our coastal communities. But more than that, these are really active and engaged communities. And what they're really asking for is a much more strategic approach from council so that they are really included in the process of remediation work, of caring for these environments, and of being across what's going to happen when it's going to happen and how it's going to happen so that that process is um, a partnership process, not something that happens to those communities. Uh, that's that, I've spoken to that. And yeah, it does, it does really require some much greater coordination within council so that when, when contractors arrive the local people know that that's going to happen and um, and things don't have to be fixed retrospectively. They can, the, the relationships can be much stronger. Is it, is it? Oh, that is a video. So this is from the <coughs> what happens in Kokodata to Port Levy because the already stream is currently Maybe underground. So it essentially just runs across people's gardens and sections and um, these are not particularly extreme weather events and these are not at high tide. So you can imagine if you get an extreme weather event at high tide how much, how much worse it will be. So we do really need to work with these communities to support them. Uh, in Littleton we were really grateful for Te Hapua Ngāti Whiki uh, giving a new name to the Littleton Rec Centre. Manawa Kafu and uh, the board also um, put an application through for the Little River Toilets to the Tourism Infrastructure Fund and also provided a letter of support for Te Puna Oaha, which is a um, creativity collective with a tool library and they're currently working on facilities for shared workshops for the community to create projects in as well. And we've supported the... Um, Installation of a Pigeon Bay's new kitchen in the historic Settlers Hall. Uh, we've received a really good response back from the Minister of Tourism regarding the concerns that we raised, that the community raised with us around 
cruise ships and their impact, particularly in Littleton and on the Littleton community in this last season, and on an ongoing matter of the Banks Peninsula Destination Management Plan. Um, this, is, this is something that we've been working on for as long as anybody can remember. Um, it has been out for some initial consultation. We've got a fantastic response back from across Banks Peninsula on this. And we've worked with Christchurch NZ on extending the time frame for that and on making sure that everybody across the peninsula who's been involved in that process so far is able to engage further as we shape that document because the potential for that document to really shape the future of Banks Peninsula and to serve the environment and the community cannot be lost. It's, a, it's too good an opportunity to let it go by. And just playing to the gallery, I'd suggest that things such as... Uh, you know, more cycleways across Banks Peninsula could be the kind of thing that we would see in the destination management plan. Um, but yeah, that's everything from us for our Banks Peninsula <coughs> report this month. Thank you, Reuben. Absolutely perfect. Thank you. Okie dokie. So we now have Fendleton, Waimari, Herewood, uh, Bridget, and is Jason here? I didn't see him. Yep. Did I miss one? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yes. I don't think it doesn't matter. They're here now. Okay. You stay you here. Sure? Yeah, All right. go for it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We will. We'll be. Um. We'll be quick and brief. It's not a race. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, kia ora, everyone. So, just to kick things off with our board report, um, I'd like to take you through just some of the decisions made under delegations which you can see here. But just in summary, some of those delegations included um, road safety improvements, uh, parking restrictions. Um, there was also a few uh, tree removals, but also native forest planting. Um, and we've had a few discretionary response funds and also some youth development funds. Um, and we've also adopted our 2023 to 2025 community board plan, which Jason will take you through. At our meeting on the 8th of May, the board is very pleased to adopt our 23 to 25 board plan. Um, I understand you've been provided with a link to all of the plans, so I won't go into too much detail on the content, but up on the screen, we just have one example of a priority from each of our wards in the area. Um, Brenchley Ave in Strowan experiences significant flooding after rain events and we are keen to undertake a scoping exercise to identify the causes and look at some options for mitigation there which is common in a few parts around town at the moment. Residents from the Rustley area particularly around Bentley Street, Foven Street and Pinehurst Crescent have been raising concerns with our board around traffic safety. <coughs> These streets are very narrow and both sides of the road are full with parking from nearby the nearby business park. We're keen to look at some ways to improve safety, particularly for pedestrians who feel unsafe trying to cross the street there. As we've mentioned previously, Sheldon Park at Belfast is a very well utilised park with a number of groups located there. We're keen to work with them to advocate for improvements to the driveway, car park and upgrading of the playing fields. We've recently received some really positive feedback from our community and on these and now look forward to working with them and the council staff to progress the priorities in our plan. Um, so something that's pretty exciting, so through our discretionary response fund, the board was pleased to be able to purchase the installation of an AED at St Tim's on Kendall Avenue. This life-saving device provides 24-7 access to anyone in the community and has been registered with St John's and added to the AED location app, ensuring uh, easy and quick access in an emergency. St Tim's is the perfect location for the device as it's opposite the old Kendall School which is now home to numerous organisations, the Bishopdale Men's Shed and Kindergarten. St Tim's is also next to a block of shops and social housing units. So in addition to the installation, St John's will be providing training to members of the church, key users and the men's shed to ensure the proper use of the AED. Uh, pictured on the screen <coughs> is Chris Ponia, the minister at St Tim's, and Richard Rendell from the Men's Shed, who did the installation of the device. <coughs> the community project group coordinating and working on regeneration in Bishopdale have completed their latest beautification project in the Bishopdale Village Mall. 
The group is made up of representatives from the Bishopdale Centre Association, Bishopdale Community Trust, Council's Local Community Development Advisor and two members of the Enlivened Bishopdale Group. As the project team works its way towards revamping the public toilet block in the mall, the next phase has been collaborating with a local artist to create a mural on the outer wall of the toilet building. The building is owned by a private business and creates an alleyway with a library. Two small green spaces in front of the mural are being tipped as a contender to be part of the council's wildflower planting this spring, which will further enhance the experience of the mural, giving it a colourful connection between the spaces. While doing the artwork, the artist Bruce engaged with many people in the community, and it was a great conversation starter and community connection during its construction as well as after. Staff at the Bishop Dale Library say they are getting really good feedback from the community about this mural. And that's us. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you very much. And that mural is outstanding. It, it's, <laughs> I wish I could paint quarter as good as that. Yeah. <laughs> Don't we all? Right, thank you very much. <clears throat> so <clears throat> now we will go back to uh, Callum and Kia, please. Sorry about that, missing you out. You're very important. <laughs> Oh, oh Kia, Kia sends his apologies. He had a, 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 an urgent thing come up we had to attend to. Um, tēnā koutou katoa, uh, and kapi nui ki a koutou. Uh, thanks for welcoming me here today. Um, my name is Callum Ward. I'm the chair of the Waihoro Spray and Cashmere Heathcote Community Board. Um, and yeah, I'll just charge right into it. And I'm not going to take up too much of your time. I know that we've got a lot of important things on your agenda today. Um, so. On your agenda, one of the things on your agenda is a part of a report from, from our board around the Sumner Tennis and Squash Club application to lease the property, as you can see up on the screen there. So this is a, um, a, a project that, uh, with, a, with a club, which together with staff, to develop a proposal that came to the board and now, and now it's coming to you. Um, there's unanimous support from this, for this from our board. Um, we're happy that there's robust consultation processes in place and that the that the club uh, has the right intentions in mind for the community and what, what that space will be used for. So we encourage council to accept the staff recommendation on that report. <coughs> um, the Community Pride Garden Awards. So our board held this at the Matuku Takotako Sumner Centre. So um, we had a huge turnout, uh, lots of avid gardeners and lots of discussion about gardening. There's something that you can always rely on uh, getting with a group of gardeners is a lot of a lot of conversation, um, lots of advice being thrown around. So that was great fun. I'm really really proud of that event and the engagement we got from the community. Um, just want to quickly cover off some of the things that are happening in our area um, on the ground. We've got the uh, approval of the Kashmir Sanatorium Open Air Shelter uh, to be, or it's been added to the heritage list. So that's really exciting. Um, for context, this is a this is a building that was used. It, it was one of what used to be many dozens, hundreds of buildings up on the on the, on the Port Hills that were used to uh, provide quarantine and, and recovery for people who were suffering from Spanish flu after the First World War. So there's only one of them left now, um, and. You know, so it's obviously got a lot of historical significance. We're excited that it's been heritage listed and the board's priority for this now is to ensure it has a proper maintenance plan in place that that, that meets that sort of status that it has uh, so that it can, can last well into the future. Uh, the board's approved pedestrian improvements on uh, the corner of Rose Street and Hunhei Road. So this is a theme, I guess. This, this touches on a theme across our whole board area of the fact that as we're getting more people in the city, uh, our transport infrastructure is getting more uh, more utilised by pedestrians, cyclists and, and cars and what we're seeing is that, that that usage is driving a bit of conflict and lack of safety, especially for our active transport users, our cyclists and pedestrians. So um, our board's looking at ways that we can help make our spaces safer um, for those active transport users and sometimes that means putting in pedestrian improvements but on the whole it's, it's a programme that stretches across our entire board area. Um, I also want to talk a bit about the, yeah, there's a dog park that we're investigating suitable sites for um, in, in Heathcote. We're looking at some of the, le the red zone land around there uh, as possible sites for a, uh, for a dog park. Um, we know that that's uh, currently a really popular spot for people to take their dogs is the estuary, and we know that, um, that actually that's really harmful for a lot of the bird life 
that lives in the estuary and some of, that, some of those birds are really uh, precious uh, taonga, endangered species. Um, so what we're wanting to do is provide alternatives where possible. Um, we're hoping that, that we can find somewhere in, in, in former red zone land that we could provide a dog park. Uh, and finally, I just want to touch on the South Library rebuild. Um, <clears throat> so this is open for, the, the, the board's been briefed on the design for this uh, that's come from the design team, which we're really excited to see uh, what they've managed to achieve within, within the budget that they had. Um, we, this, this is something that's open for consultation now, so I encourage anyone who's watching or listening uh, to, 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 to get, log in and have your say on, on the South Library rebuild project. Uh, the thing that our board's really excited about is the potential to connect the library itself with the surrounding space. You know, it's got the beautiful um, Opawaho River that runs beside it. Um, at, at the moment, those two, you know, the, the building and the river aren't very well connected. Um, and we're excited that the proposed plan envisages much more flow between the natural environment and this, this wonderful community centre, which, as I will say again, is much more than just a library. Um, but that's all I've got to talk to today. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much. And I, and I must say that, that library, that, the plan of that library concept looked absolutely fantastic. So uh, well done to the team. So yes, thank thanks. you very much, Colin. Okay, and lastly, but certainly not least, is um, Papnew Inner Central. With Emma and Simon, please. <coughs> Kia ora koutou. thank you very much for having us along today. Um, we'll jump straight into it. Um, to get the right slide up. Um, first up, we have some um, decisions made under delegations at our May meeting. We granted some funding to the St Albans Residents Association towards the cost of their newsletter. And we approved tree plantings along Worcester Street, Cashel Street and Hereford, as well as some parking changes along Hereford Street as part of the Greening the East plan. We made a recommendation, uh, which you have before you today, on C1 Cafe's licence to occupy the High Street Triangle with their tables and chairs. And we approved some no stopping and parking restrictions to improve safety outside Christchurch Adventist School. Um, and then we were also pleased to adopt our Community Board Plan for 2023 to 2025 which outlines our vision and priorities as a board for the rest of this electoral term. Um, usually we hold our meetings at the boardroom at the back of the Papanui Library, but we're aware that this is a long way to travel for those who live in the central and southern parts of our board area. So last month we took our meeting to the Phillips Town Hub. Uh, a number of people made the most of this and came and, ga um, came and presented at our public forum, and you'll see them listed there. Uh, this is something we'll look at doing throughout the term in order to make our meetings more accessible for all. Final feedback and reimbursements are coming in now for the Summer With Your Neighbours uh, program of events that have been supported by the Community Board. The photos here are from Shirley, uh, from Avery House at Richmond and from Redwood. Uh, and as always, there's been really positive feedback uh, from the public around the, how those events have run and appreciation for the support from the Community Board. We've also just recently <coughs> had the Walking Festival with a couple of events in our uh, community board area, including a dog stay out in Richmond at the Revolution Eco Hub, and the uh, going on a bear hunt a regular event, which was held at Walter Park with more than 150 participants, uh, mostly young children. Uh, and that's an event that's been held in partnership between the Shirley Community Trust, Libraries, and Kia Kori Waitaha. Uh, one of our priorities in our community board plan um, is around safety initiatives. And we've kick-started this recently by having a briefing with a senior sergeant of the New Zealand Police. This was a really worthwhile opportunity for our board to get an insight into what police are dealing with presently in the city. And I think the biggest thing we got from this discussion was the role that we as elected members can play in encouraging the public to report all crime as police resources are directed according to the reports they receive. We also had a board visit to Council's Real-Time Operations Centre last week to learn more about the part that that team plays in safety and traffic matters as well as the role that the council plays in the planning, installing and monitoring of CCTV cameras across the city. And then also last week, our board was invited along with councillors to visit the site of the uh, new youth hub being built on Salisbury Street. This is going to be an amazing facility for our city, offering a safe haven for young people aged 10 to 25 needing support with a collaboration of co-located services. It's the first of its kind in the country and will offer wraparound services including mental health, medical, education, employment and training, recreation, creativity, social entrepreneurship and housing support in a one-stop shop. I encourage you to head along and check it out if you get the opportunity. 
and urge Council to support the Trust in every way possible to complete what will be a truly valuable project for the city. And that is us. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very good. And ahead of time too. Okay, so what have we got, Dawn? We've got an amendment. Uh, we've got a potential amendment put forward by Councillor Johansson. I wonder if we could take five minutes, Mayor, to have a discussion with the Councillor before you take a mover and seconder. Okay, very well. well. We'll have a breather for five minutes to get our head around this amendment, and then we will come we back. Be. Thank you.
So Yanni has put an amendment up there, which is just getting the ink dripping off it as we speak. Everyone can see that. Yanni, have you got a second for this? Celeste, thank you. Do you want to speak with, to it at all? Thank you. Um, just wanted to recognise the concerns that have been expressed by both the local community board and the local community over the communications around the Christchurch Wastewater Treatment Plant recovery and response. There's no doubt in my mind that we need to do better. Um, and Council currently has several things that it's doing in that regard. One is there is currently an external independent review that is underway and I look forward to getting those results back shortly um, so that we can uh, share with the community the lessons that we've learned and the feedback that we've got and, and look at what we can do going forward. But secondly, I think what's really important is that uh, the Council uh, has worked with staff to reintroduce the daily updates and also the weekly community newsletter and we are reconvening the communication advisory group um, to look at what we can also improve. You know, it's it's really disappointing that we've got the odours back, um, and I know that we're working hard to look at what we can do to try and mitigate the odours, but <coughs> what's clear is that we do need to improve our communications around it so the community understand uh, what when things go wrong, we don't wait for them to complain, but we actually tell them, uh, and so that they can be aware that there are issues that we're having, and so we can be more proactive. So just wanted to acknowledge the concerns that have been raised and say that you know, we should just note that so that people know that we are taking proactive steps to remedy the best we can the, the communications around what's going on. Thank you. OK, thank you. It sort of would have helped the situation a wee bit if you'd done that last night, um, but never mind. We're the <laughs> community board we're going to... OK, so now I just ask for a movement second for the whole lot, yep. which is Sarah, uh, Mark and... Aaron, for the whole lot. Uh, I'll put that motion. Everyone in favour? Aye. Thank you very much, Kerry. So, for the forums. So, yes, now we will come back to item 3.1, the public forums, and hear from a number of individuals and groups regarding the Park Terrace Works Notice of Motion. I welcome back Simon from Papua Innes uh, Deputy Chair, uh, and he's also the LGNZ Zone 5 representative to start things off. Welcome back, Simon. Thank you. Thank you very much. And just to be clear, I am making this presentation in my capacity as the regional representative and as co-chair of the LGNZ Community Boards Executive Committee, CBEC. CBEC represents all community boards in New Zealand and is an advisory committee to LGNZ's National Council. We advocate for community boards, which is why I'm here, and promote best practice. With respect to item 16 on your agenda today, Notice of Motion Park Terrace Works, I'm firstly bringing to your attention the fact that decision making on this project to date has disregarded the Council's delegation of responsibilities to the Waipapa Papua Nui Innes Community Board and has breached the Governance Partnership Agreement. The Council Community Board Governance Partnership Agreement states that delegations to community boards are guided by the principle of subsidiarity and that issues specific to a community board should be dealt with and decided on within the affected locality. The Council's delegations register includes delegating Clause 7 of the Traffic and Parking Bylaw to community boards. On the 14th of March this year, a report titled Parking Changes on Gloucester Street and Hereford Street was presented to this Council, recommending parking restrictions be made under that clause of that bylaw. And of course that's the same report that also describes the changes planned to be made on Rolleston Avenue and Park Terrace to implement the on-road cycleway. I note from the minutes that the recommended parking restrictions were accepted without change by the Council. Now just this past week, Council staff have acknowledged that the 14th of March report should have been presented to the Community Board, not the Council, as it's outside the Plan A area, and they've apologised for that error. No doubt the advice given about the project to the Council on the 9th of January this year should also have come to the Community Board, along with any other communications on this matter. <coughs> and that brings us to today's agenda item. Today's Notice of Motion is a further breach of the Governance Partnership Agreement. The Notice of Motion proposes preempting a decision that is, in the first instance, the Community Board's to make. The Board understands that the public consultation process that's currently underway will lead to a report to the Board's July meeting in order for the Board to make a recommendation to Council on the future of the changes to both Rolleston Avenue and Park Terrace. <coughs> the Council has got an opportunity to support public involvement with Council decision making by allowing the public consultation process to run its course 
and by respecting the role of the community board that, and the role the board has through delegations and the governance partnership agreement. So my asks this morning are, firstly, that it's this council that apologises to the community board for making decisions in March that were the board's responsibility to make. It shouldn't be staff carrying the can for that. Elected members should be familiar with community board delegations and governance arrangements. And secondly, that the notice of motion be withdrawn from today's agenda and that the process runs its course as planned with community board's role respected. Thank you, that's the end of my submission. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you very much, Ia. Um, you've got time for one question. Yanni. Yeah, thank you for your de uh, deputation. Um, I appreciate that you're concerned about item, um, sorry, the just uh, six, 16. Um, but I was just wondering in regards to item 15, whether you had a view on that as a community board as well. Uh, speaking not on behalf of the community board, I'm speaking purely on my, from my role as CBEC, and I don't have a position on that. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Holman. Right, you. now we have um, Aurora on Zoom. Hello. Hi, thank you for having me. Audio working? Yep, yep, excellent. Go cool. for your life. Kia ora, my name is Aurora, and I'm a high school student here in Otutahi. I'm here to urge you city councillors not to waste taxpayers' money on getting rid of existing cycling infrastructure on Park Terrace. It's a terrible step back for the city's sustainability and emissions goals. It shows complete contempt for cyclists in our city, and it's a total waste of money and resources. Firstly, I'd like to remind the council of their sustainability goals that they have pledged to. On your website, you've stated that Christchurch City Council has committed to do everything we can for now and for our future with targets for reduced emissions across our district. Our emissions reduction targets from a 2016-17 baseline are net zero greenhouse gas emissions for Christchurch by 2045 and a 50% reduction by 2030. No matter how you spin it, no matter how you might justify it, fact is getting rid of this existing cycleway is a direct contradiction of that goal. Cycling is the lowest emissions form of long distance transport we have here. And not only does it keep those transport emissions low, but it keeps our citizens active and healthy, which is a really good goal. We know how much of a problem our high transport emissions are in Ototahi. It's stated plainly on your website, Christchurch's main sources of greenhouse gas emissions are from transport, with around 55% of our emissions. We are an incredibly car and fossil fuel reliant city with a culture of using these private fossil fuel guzzling vehicles. Secondly, if this plan to destroy this park terrace cycleway goes ahead, it signals a larger contempt and lack of respect for cyclists. Sure, it is just one cycleway, it is just one section of infrastructure out of the larger network, but it sends a discouraging message to those who use bikes to get around the city. Cyclists shouldn't be treated as second-class citizens and prioritised second to those who have the money and resources to own and operate cars. We should be treated with dignity and provided with the resources necessary to get around the city safely. And that means connected cycleways, separated from car lanes to keep us safe throughout the city. When you take away existing cycling lanes, you show cyclists that you don't care about their comfort when they're traveling around the city. And you make cycling that little less, little bit less safe and a little bit less comfortable. This plan is a total waste of money and time. We have an existing functional cycleway. Let's not ruin it. Thank you to those councillors who are planning to vote against this destructive plan. To the rest of you, I hope that you will actually listen to me and other members of the public and hear us when we ask you to do the right thing here. Christchurch City Council, please back up your sustainability goals with your actions. As we at School Strike for Climate say, votes, not words. Thank you. Thank you, Aurora. We've actually got time for one quick question, if someone has one. No, you must have done, you did a very good job. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good on you. So next we've got Simon Kingham. Please, g'day mate. 
and there's a presentation, I believe. Oh, cool, you got it. Yeah, I can use that. Uh, my name's Simon King. I'm, I'm a professor of geography at University of Canterbury. I think I know most of you. I'm also Chief Science Advisor of the Ministry of Transport, so I'm really just here to talk about some of the evidence about cycling very quickly. Uh, why do we encourage cycling? Why do we want to? Number one, air pollution. 2,000 people a year die from air pollution in this country. Over 2,000 people a year from air pollution from vehicles. So anything we can do to reduce it is good, and bikes do that. Second one, oh, physical health. Uh, active commuters have lower BMIs in countries where you have more active commuters. You have lower BMIs and the other way around. So again, it's good for physical health. It's good for mental health. Um, we know that active commuters have better mental well-being. Um, really good report from Minister uh, Wakatahi, if you want to, go, he's, want to go and have a look at that, just backs that one up. Good for climate change. This research was done by Oxford University, so it, wasn't, um, it was a good, good piece of research, um, 10 times better than um, electric vehicles, so cycling is good for climate change as well. How do we encourage cycling? First thing, most of you might know this already, but there's a very small proportion of people uh, under 8% who will cycle whatever you do. At the other end, there are 33% of people who will never cycle. But there's that big group in the middle, 60%, who are interested but concerned. And the interested concerned, we need to know what the barrier is to them cycling. We did some research. Oh, and this applies in Christchurch. The, this typology of people has been shown to be the same in Christchurch. Um, how do we encourage them? Some research for Wakatahi. The biggest barrier is people don't feel safe. And the key is you have to make them feel safe. And the way to do that is keep them away from fast moving traffic. And on some cases, that's separated infrastructure. So on busy roads, you have to separate them. Sometimes it has to be engineered and big. Sometimes it can be very cheap, like Park Terrace. And in other cases, it can be slow speed, quiet streets. So it's a mixture. It has to be a mixture. Shared paths are the least effective and least liked. Shared paths with cars are obviously not good but even shared paths with pedestrians are not good. So actually, this is where separation is really important, like Park Terrace. Build it and they will come. Um, all around the world, there's evidence that when you build more cycleways, more people use them. Um, so that's good. I can't see the timer, which is even better. Not for you lot, though. Uh, and, and there's all sorts of research from all, all, all over the place. Pop-up cycleways work as well. So I guess that's the analogy with Park Terrace. But there's heaps of research all around the world showing that you build infrastructure, people come and use it. How does it work? It doesn't, it works in waves or surges. As you open up more infrastructure, if you like open up a big cycle where you get an increase in cyclists using it then, um, and you get those interested but concerned people. You're not building for existing cyclists, you're building for the people who are currently not cycling. They're the ones we're trying to get cycling. Park Terrace is a key connector. I happen to use it almost by accident on the first day it opened because I happened to be going that way with my wife and she said, this is a fantastic, we don't have to share with pedestrians, I'm feeling really safe. So it does work and it does actually kind of link us to north of the city center when you're coming in on one of the cycleways in front of the museum. Um, oh, oh dear, something's happened here, sorry. Anyway, I think there's reputational risk. Christchurch is a great city to cycle in, build it and they will come, does work. We have a global reputation. Unfortunately, this week, Wellington got some award for being the best cycling city. We need to get that back. Let's keep going and grow our reputation. More people cycling has multiple benefits. Good cycle infrastructure is the key, and we're building it, and they are coming. So that's my bet. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Um, is that right? Yeah, you're fine. Kia ora, Simon. Um, so are you suggesting that we should use science, evidence and research um, to make decisions <laughs> instead of um, reckons and hot takes? We should always use science and evidence, and the science and evidence is really clear. That <laughs> it works. Um, just quickly, we've had some assertions that because some vehicles might be slowed up a little bit in other areas because of the cycle way that it would actually increase emissions. Could you talk to that? No, no, that's not the case because what you actually do, I mean, this is the thing I mentioned the other week about slow speed limits, you actually smooth traffic out. And of course, overall, you've got to look at the overall benefits. So if there were to be any small increase, it would be over, over, overcome by the benefits of more people cycling. But, but smoother traffic is what you want. Yeah. yeah. And, sun, and sun congestion suppresses demand for driving too. So there's multiple ways of doing it. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you, Simon. Yes. Um, Stephen. Uh, 
Good morning um, to the Mayor, Councillors and staff. Today I'm talking for myself and for Spokes Canterbury. <coughs> uh, we both support the Council's anti-bullying campaign. Um, can we... Oh. I'm here to talk to you about <coughs> the trial cycle lane on Rolleston Avenue in Park Terrace. I used to live in Otatahi as a student, and one of the big reasons I've come back here is the investment that's been made here in safe cycling infrastructure. Nowadays I get more, around more on a bicycle than I do in a car. This year is the first time in living in four council areas that I've felt a need to come and talk directly to a council, first on the draft annual plan and now on this. Our city vision is very strong on diversity, active transport, sustainability, communities, and good governance. There's been a lot said about this project, so I went back to the initial briefly. If you read it, I'll put it up there, you quickly get the sense that the motivation was to improve safety and reduce conflict. Some of the issues here are long-standing. I remember in the 1980s, you go through the park, over the Armagh Street Bridge, and you're suddenly into city busy streets. The shared pedestrian cycle area in Rosalston Ave has helped a little, but it's often congested and conflicted. And it wasn't going to work through the museum renovation. The solution, an on-road cycleway as a trial, is brilliant. It was extended up to Park Avenue to address some different safety concerns, and it's not all about cyclists. It helps pedestrians, pedestrians crossing, or all cyclists crossing at Salisbury Street. The two-way cycleway is a really good solution and the council should be heartily congratulated for it. This is an overall CBD transport plan from post-earthquake. It's the idea of different corridors of different uses, streets where cars are the main mode, streets that are there to help other modes but not exclusively, streets that become boulevards and plazas. Good job. Compared to the 1980s, the, the CBD is a great place to come to on a bicycle. For cycling, Hagley Park is an entry point into the city from the west, the northwest, the southwest, and also now the south. How do these people then connect to where they need to go? Whether it's on the River Corridor, Worcester Street, Solbs Street, or wherever. The, the answer is they need a connector up and down Hagley Park. Those roads were busy and tight, there was conflict with other modes, cars, pedestrians, trams, buses. The trial cycle lane is a great solution to this. Again, congratulations. Please keep it. It's not perfect. Some tweaks to improve safety and connectivity could make it even better. I thought I'd also say something about Waka Katahi's current priorities. Their interim cycle plan action plan is quite a vision. It's a big change for them, driven by safety and emission reductions targets. It's got safe connected networks, quick build projects, reallocation of existing street space, a focus on short trips and destinations. I was recently in Wellington and saw some of the work being done there with quick fit, quick fit interim cyclist solutions. I even saw one that had the same marker post as you've used on Rolleston Avenue and Park Terrace. Waka Katai funds a lot of our riding projects some of them at 50%, sometimes at 90%. <coughs> Given what's on the cycle plan, they'd be very keen on this project. In fact, one of their senior managements told me yesterday she'd been in touch with the council to congratulate them on the project and ask if it can be used as an example for other councils. Could it have been done like this? If, if Park Avenue had been set up with orange cones like this, would it be seen as an effective trial? Would it be safe for the cyclists? I'd suggest not. We'd probably just have people complaining about a road cone city. You've been making this a car versus bike scrap. It doesn't need to be. On 90% of our road network, cars and bikes use the same space. Where that space is busy, congested, complex or unsafe, then it's best to separate them. The biggest barrier to more people taking up cycling is that it's perceived as unsafe. The solution is to make it safe and to make it seem safe. Major cycleway routes are the rock stars of our cycle network. 
The rest is feeder routes, neighbourhoods, destinations, connections. To make it all work, it needs a collaborative approach, not a scrap. It needs more projects like Rolston Ave and Park Terrace. I didn't anticipate there'd be any time for questions, but what I did was picked a few likely questions. And if you've got questions along those lines, there's some notes that I provided of the way I would answer them. And the other thing is, I'm wearing an armband today because another person died in a car versus bicycle crash on New Zealand's roads yesterday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. No hands up. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Right, now we have Harrison, please. Welcome. Morena. Um, I don't actually have a presentation, I've just got some notes here. Um, there's going to be plenty of people talking about the cycleway today. Um, mine is more in line with what Simon spoke about and the nature of the motions that have been put forward today. Um, it is fairly disappointing to see that the nature of this dispute has been um, fairly public, when in the reality the majority of the disputes in these reports that are put forward and in the motions is actually an internal matter for council. Um, disputes between councillors and staff are matters of employment, not a matter of public interest. So it's fairly disappointing to have seen it become such a large thing that it's been taken. Um, so with a, with a degree of vitriol actually to the public, um, by elected members. Um, this includes a lot of recent articles, uh, commentary, and it really doesn't show the council in good light. When, uh, as a as a you know as a member of the city and you know as somebody who's concerned about this, that I am reading every second day commentary in the newspaper that regards an internal affair of council's own disputes. Um, it doesn't bode well for a council that is currently running on a very low trust relationship. Um, has very poor staff um, satisfaction and turnover levels, especially in senior departments. Um, it really isn't the kind of behaviour that's acceptable to have seen. We've already heard from Simon that this was running roughshod over the community board's responsibilities and delegations. Um, that is a core part of the, how the city functions, is the reason the community boards exist, is to deal with these delegations. The reason staff uh, in teams and we have experts is that this is delegated to them with a reason they are experts in these fields they have made these decisions based on good solid legal advice a need a perceived need and best practice it's not something that necessarily is liked by some councillors but it is the reality that staff exist for a reason which is to provide you with expert advice and to make decisions under delegation so if you look at your, your attachments, per clause um, 11 and schedule 10 of the Local Government Act, you're empowered to delegate this to the Chief Executive, which you did. The Chief Executive then in her role has delegated this to staff, the correct team, who has dealt with this in an appropriate manner, sought legal advice, and done it in a manner that is befitting and proper of council process. The response to this has not been fitting in council of council process. The cycleway is currently under consultation. It has not been received or looked at by the community board, as Simon said, that is the June, um, July meeting. As such, these motions of notice are occurring before there is any fact or evidence to actually support their, their conclusion, right? We have a cycleway that is in the busiest section of town, is used frequently. I used it to get here this morning. My partner uses it every day to commute to and from her workplace. And it's fairly uncommon to see this sort of behaviour happening and it's not something that should be expected. I would remind councillors of the code of conduct that actually should govern your relationship with the public and with staff, 5.2, 5.3 and 6.2. And in these matters, I don't believe councillors upholding themselves to the standard that they should in terms of how they're engaging with staff, with the media, with their own social media, which is explicitly stated within 6.2. And I don't actually believe that some of the members of council have upheld themselves to the proper standards that should be held when we're discussing this. It's not a matter of public affair. If I, if I take the council as a, a business, right, 
and we take the chief executive as CEO. This makes you a board of directors. As a rate payer, this makes me a shareholder. If I was to go into this business and find that members of the board of directors had been publicly denouncing or um, destroying the integrity of my business, I would not be happy. That's my position. I also take this as a matter of if, for example, we look at employment law and one of the people on this team decided to leave because of the commentary made by the highest level of counsel, that's a form of constructive dismissal. That is an illegal form of workplace environment, right? That's the sort of thing that lands a lot of businesses in trouble. That's not the sort of behaviour we should expect, and it's not the sort of, like, position that the council wants to put itself in in a risk environment. That's not something you should be encouraging or even looking at. So I argue that even if you disagree with the cycle way on principle, you must agree with the process, right? Otherwise, what's the point in having a council if due process is not followed and code of conduct is not upheld? Cool. Thank you very much, mate. Right, next we have um, Grace from the Transportation Group, Canterbury and West Coast Branch. Are we welcome. Kia ora koutou. I'm here as a representative of the Transportation Group Local Branch, which is a technical interest group of Engineering New Zealand. I myself am a transport professional, um, a decade of experience, um, got a master's and um, bachelor's degree, and I'm a chartered professional engineer. So I'm speaking with someone with a bit of experience with both designing and also, in fact, using these type of facilities around Christchurch. There are two motions before you today, councillors. The first is about removing the existing facility, which was set up as a temporary facility to trial this type of infrastructure. I strongly urge you not to accept that motion. The second motion I understand, and I'm speaking frankly here, but essentially would relate to censoring council staff, previously mentioned, from delivering this type of infrastructure for your city, which is aligned with delivering the policies and strategies that have been agreed, both at a national and obviously local level too. Your council staff are qualified and competent, I can say that firsthand, my own personal experience as well, and we simply cannot relitigate every single project of this nature going forward, there simply is not time, and it's a waste of everyone's uh, energy and efforts here today. So, that said, right, let's talk to the technical matters at hand. First of all, the existing shared path facility along the eastern side of the river is two metres wide. That's a footpath. That's a standard minimum size for a footpath, notwithstanding that it's also bumpy and uneven and can be slippery with leaves at uh, certain times of year like now. The existing facility addresses a really complex urban area. It's very, very busy. There are a lot of people with different needs and are there for different purposes. This is outlined in our submission document. But the existing trial facility really successfully mitigates that width. A key tenant of road safety is predictability. If you can predict someone's behaviour and what they're going to do, you can mitigate it and therefore you can avoid a conflict which may result in injury, at the very least a nasty surprise and <coughs> someone may not want to go that way again, which again defeats the strategies and policies that have been mentioned here today. So a wider facility or a separated facility, which is what the current guidance is, there's a lot of information and evidence around this, um, would be preferred. And that is what we've achieved today out, out, out there, which I also use to get here today. It's my new preferred route to meetings in the middle of town from where I currently work. So it achieves that safety outcome. The other thing um, is that it is loved. I, th I would really encourage you, if you haven't ridden it yourself, you're making a decision potentially on an infrastructure you haven't actually used and it's two, metres, two minutes walk away, is to at least listen to the people, get second-hand uh, opinions of people who are using it today, like I did, and I stopped and chatted to, there's a few pedestrians, and I chatted to this young lady here, and she literally said, um, she uses it regularly, she also walks in cycles there, she said that she loves it because she doesn't have to dodge around other people, um, and she also, it's faster for her when she's on her bike. And I thought, that's, that's fantastic because that resonates with my own personal experience too. The other thing is that we have a range of different users along this corridor. Um, that includes not just people who are cycling, but also scooters, people walking their dog, people taking their toddler for, you know, on, um, on a new scooter and things like that. The, what I would like to stress is that this infrastructure could be considered pedestrian. 
infrastructure actually, not cycling infrastructure, because we've removed cyclists from a high conflict narrow area, particularly speaking to park terrace here, and put them onto a road environment that is predictable, that is safe, that is smooth, and therefore create a more intuitive space for all those road users and, and motorists alike as well. The other key thing I need to speak to on a technical matter is the road space allocation, which I know has come up and has um, potentially there's perceptions where, of where the congestion might originate. Um, the Kilmore Street signals um, is where it will drive that capacity along the park terrace road, um, not the lane capacity. So what we've done is removed the two lanes along Park Terrace heading northbound uh, down to one lane. It was previously one lane um, years ago anyway, but what that's done is that when you're crossing at Salisbury Street, like I also personally do every day, um, you're only navigating with one lane of traffic at a time, not two. And so you avoid that masking effect, um, also that judgment and gap, um, just judgment is, is made a lot, a lot easier. So there's a, there's a strong safety benefit in that case too. So. These, these reasons have been touched on previously, I don't want to relitigate that further, but I would strongly encourage you to re both retain the existing facility and be bold to keep innovating and delivering infrastructure that is so loved and why there are so many people here today to speak to this. We love it, please keep it. It's a step in the right direction. Kia ora, thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Grace. Um, now we have uh, Storm and Ray. Not oh, Ray and Storm, I should say. No, thank you very much. Um, thank you. There was no problem on Park Terrace to be solved. There were already two cycle tracks, one on either side of the river. Worse, these unauthorised and ill considered changes to Park Terrace have actually created serious issues. Congestion, not only on Park Terrace, but in all the streets leading into it. Increased emissions caused by congestion. You don't get smoothing of traffic whilst waiting behind a bus in the middle of a lane. Health and safety issues, pointless additional crossing points at two busy intersections. It is not okay to put a bus stop in the middle of the only traffic lane. There is no mandate for this. Councillors need to take decisive action to address this mistake and its consequences and vote in favour of this notice of motion. The productive people, most of, <laughs> most of whom can't be here today, that is the payers of rates, not the squanderers of them. Thousands of us, actually, have had enough. This madness has gone too far. And this is not just about Park Terrace. This is a tipping point. Christchurch City Council and its out of control staff should know this is the beginning of scrutiny and accountability. Thank you. Right. So, has anyone got any? Sarah, you've got a question. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering if you, you you said that there was um, no problem to be solved. That's probably no problem on the road. What about the conflicts on the on the shared path? There has been no issue with the shared path in the last ten years, not one. Okay. And when it comes to the um, several times that the bus has to stop down Park Terrace in rush hour, do you believe that? Um, the ability for, or the necessary um, waiting of two or three cars behind a bus outweighs the ability for kids to cross the road safely to get to school? I don't think that's the issue here at all. I think you're misstating the proposition. So you don't believe that there's any safety issues with kids crossing the road? I think there are there? increased safety issues as a result of the changes of the traffic layout. <laughs> okay, Sam? Yeah, thank you for coming in, Storm. I just wondered if you could talk through um, any consultation you had on this proposal. None. And I note that it's been referred to as consultation. As far as I'm aware, and I, I am a lawyer myself, consultation occurs <coughs> in advance of doing something, not a retrospective justification of it. Yeah. Kelly? Uh, thank you. 
Would you support the widening of the current footpath on the park side of Park Terrace? Yes, I would. Thank you. Melanie. Have you cycled along the path in Park Terrace? I've scooted, oh. uh, sorry, along. In, inside the park. Have you have you biked or yeah skirted in the park? And walked, the park? yes. And biked? No, I don't bike in Christchurch. So you just walked? Yes. And have you? And, and I've scooted as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, and thank you, councillors, for nice short questions. Thank you, Storm. Very very clear and concise. Thank you, Ray. Very clear and concise. And no relevant experience. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Mayor. Um, noting we've got limited time, I've given a presentation. I didn't quite print enough, but if you can, hopefully you can all see one. I will ask that you reread this again afterwards. I'll just go through key points now, just I'm conscious of the clock. Uh, in just paragraph one, I've been doing transportation planning and roading engineering for 37 years, nearly all of it in Christchurch. I've been around a long time. I've watched what's been happening in the central city in particular over the last 10 years with a lot of dismay. I've been watching what's been happening with the cycleway network with a lot of dismay as well, but I've actually seen on the Rolleston Avenue thing some really good ideas. So I just want to talk about that. Uh, I am a cyclist as well. I don't feel a need to wear a cycle helmet this morning. It's my favourite exercise thing. I've spent a fortune on bikes. I love biking. If I didn't have to work, I'd be biking right now. I want to see more bikes across the city on the cycleway network. What my issue's been on a number of occasions is the fact that what we've been seeing so far in terms of engineering design solutions is just grossly over the top, over-engineered, over-expensive, over-designed and unsafe. And I'm just going to raise the ugly thorn again in Sanasa Street. I, I have a significant issue with the design where you place the cycle network behind park, park cars on the street. Paragraph four, um, I don't want to get involved in the legality matter. I simply don't care. I want to see the cycleway stay but be improved. Um, how the council went about doing this, is, look, it's not my problem. You can work that out. A point I do want to make, which is a touch on in paragraph five, is that there's a major but to what's been done down there because um, I'm going to point out later in this that on the council's traffic counts website, which is an excellent resource, it's really good, Harman does a great job on that, there's no traffic counts that are published for this intersection of Kilmore and Park, which is the only issue I want to talk about this morning. There's no intersection counts and there's no link counts. And normally when you do roading design work, you get traffic volumes. Well, where have they got the traffic volumes from? We've just heard about um, Councillor Simpleton talking about several buses in the peak hour having to be stopped and cars backing up behind them. There's actually only one bus every half an hour on the one route that goes up Park Terrace and stops at the Peterborough Street bus stop. One bus route, one bus every half an hour. I have not seen any information published anywhere on pedestrian count data from the schools. I have sat down there at this intersection for several hours over the last few days. The number of pedestrians that cross the road at Salisbury Street and at Kilmore Street in an hour is about 10. That's actual data. I have not seen any data from the council on any of this. Moving on, planned road function. I've attached to this little submission, a map at the back, and great hindsight I should have highlighted where Kilmore Street is and um, Park Terrace. But it's along the middle top there, you'll see the dark blue line, which is for a, a distributor road, and then it connects up Montreal Street to Beely Ave. Now I don't know who came up with this 10 years ago, but no one in their right mind heading east down Kilmore Street is going to go up Montreal Street to turn left onto Beely Ave to go through another set of signals at the Carlton Mill intersection to carry on northwest or west, where you can actually just go straight down Kilmore, right turn and straight up Kilmore. And you see that in the traffic volume. So at the moment, the very eastern end of Kilmore Street, which used to be an arterial, it's now a local road, is actually a two to three lane, one way westbound route with high traffic volumes. So it's function, even though it's been designated as a local road, it's functions actually as an arterial, Park Terrace was a minor arterial, for now some reason it's not, it's a local distributor. Its function is as an arterial if you look at its position in the road network. The road hierarchy is just wrong, it doesn't reflect what actually happens. So paragraph 10, I'm just noting that the Kilmore Street Park Terrace link, so from, I don't know, the Town Hall to Carlton Mill just to give it a start and end point, that's a critical distribution link for the CBD, it's one of the main arteries. 
to get traffic out of the CBD where the council, and I agree, is wanting to get population into the CBD to make the CBD a vital place. You can't have a vital, vibrant CBD if you bugger up the roads, okay? You've got to keep your arterial roads flowing, and then what you do in between the arterials, so let's just say the arterials are the one ways, make those puppies flow. What you do inside that 30 k slow it down, positionize it, cycle friendly, brilliant. But don't affect the arterials because you're going to kill your CBD. It's that simple. Um, providing for cyclists, what's happened with Christchurch over the last 100 plus years is being flat, the main roads tend to be the shortest route as the crow flies. Papanui Road is the best example. CBD, Victoria Street, Papanui, done. Ferry Road, Sumner, we're a squash spider is the layout because we don't have any hills or anything controlling where you put your road network. The outcome of that is that those shortest routes also become the most popular routes for the cyclists. You're always going to have cyclists on your arterial roads. We need to provide for them. The issue that I've historically had with the way the council's been approaching this is that there's been a disproportionate amount of road space allocated to the cyclists. Now, I am a cyclist and I look at it, Harewood Road being a classic, it's just over the top. What I've seen done on Rolleston Avenue, when I went and walked it the other day, I was really impressed with some of the new ideas that I saw, particularly the flexible bollards for separation rather than concrete. Because in my opinion, if you take Sanasa Street as an example, you've got concrete on one side, concrete on another, and I'm doing 30k an hour, the only thing, and the staff should be congratulated for it, paragraph 13, I've allocated there, I think, how you should allocate space in those points A to F. I won't read it out right now. The short version is it's arranged between do nothing or have actually separated cycle lanes behind the curb. It's point F that I want you to concentrate on. The best thing you can do for a cyclist is actually have the cycleway behind the curb. That's where it's been for the last 30 or 40 years along Rolleston Avenue. As Storm alluded to, I did a search of the NZTA reported crash database. I'll be honest, I'm a bit surprised at this. There is not one reported crash in the last 10 years involving a cyclist going up and down the cycleways or the cycle path. Thank not you. one. Right, right. We've, we've gone on a bit first. It's my fault for actually, I, I didn't realise you were going to speak and I let people I'm, talk with I'm questions. I'm nearly finished because yeah, I want okay. to finish on a yeah, positive. Good man. I'm, I'm conscious. <laughs> so paragraph 14, I've touched on that. I've seen nothing from the council staff that came to the numbers that justify what they've done. 15, I've talked about the, cash, the crashes. I want to go to the recommended improvements, and again, the key thing I'm concentrating on is Kilmore and Park. Removing the dual lane discharge at the west end of Kilmore Street is just patently daft, because what's happening <coughs> down there, if you go down and have a look, go down at five o'clock and watch what happens. There's just going to be crash after crash, because what's happening is people are coming down the, the lane that's now a left turn only into Rolleston Avenue, and they try and jam into the right-hand lane at the last minute. The other thing that's happening, and I've never seen it like at any other intersection, 30 plus years of county, I've never seen so much red light running at one intersection. Because what's happening is there's not enough capacity at the actual lights itself, so people are just running a red light. So what I'm suggesting we do is, I'm not here to say get rid of the cyclone, I'm here to say make it better. Mm. Reinstate the dual lane discharge at Kilmore Park, and you can do that so easily by pushing the cycleway back behind the curb. You need to do a little tiny bit of retaining, which will be that high, and you've got the width, three and a half, four metres to be a shared path. On Rolleston Avenue, north of the Armagh Street gates, the pedestrian count is really low because you've got the parallel path inside Hagley Park as well. There is no issue with putting a shared cycle path behind the curb north of Armagh Street. Make that change. Th Happy thank, days. You, thank you very much. And I must say that that's very balanced um, presentation. It, it worked on both sides, so thank you very much. Okie dokie, so now we have uh, Meg, please. Thanks, Sarah. Tēnā koutou katoa. Well, I'm here with um, two other hats on today. I'm an everyday cyclist, but I'm here to represent people who walk. Um, I'm representing both uh, the Active Canterbury Network and the Living Streets Aotearoa. So the Active Canterbury Network, its memberships includes, it's not limited to, uh, representatives from the exercise and dance industry, the Heart Foundation, Hewakotapi Trust, Pegasus Health, Te Mana Ora, 
Whānau Whanaki, the YMCA and the Selwyn Waimakariri and Christchurch City Council. Our vision is that every Cantabrian is engaged in regular physical activity during their lifespan. One of the most accessible and affordable types of physical activity is walking. According to the Active New Zealand Sports and Active Recreation Profile, 60% all adults over 16 identify walking as a key way of getting their physical activity. This makes walking one of the most, well, the most popular choice for sport, exercise and recreation. And if you add in jogging and running, it bumps it up to 80%. Swimming, by contrast, is the second most popular at 30%. So that's a bit about the Active Canterbury Network. Living Straits Aotearoa is New Zealand's pedestrian advocacy group and it's not so concerned about recreational walking or walking for fitness, but walking for utility purposes, for getting from A to B, for work, play, learning or socialising. Some of the pedestrians we represent have no other means of transport and we hear this especially from the low vision population. The shared paths along Rolleston Ave and Park Terrace have both types of pedestrians, recreational users and commuters. It is a key route into Hagley Park, the Botanic Gardens, the museum for locals and tourists, mobility scooter riders, dog walkers, pram pushers the lot. It's also a key commuter route for those needing to access the Christchurch City Hospital campus and the rest of the health precinct and for students and staff getting to Christ College, Cathedral Grammar, and St Michael's School. It's also a pleasant route for others to choose to access the central city from the southwest of the CBD by foot. Except, up to now, it hasn't been that pleasant. The shared path has not been fit for purpose for decades now, with users fighting for space, with people on bikes, and more recently, micro-mobility users and e-bikes, this environment in the heart of our tourist area with the picturesque his historic buildings either side of the road, the Botanic Gardens and the beautiful Hagley Park means that walkers meander all over the path and the cope-up of keeping left, left is not adhered to, and understandably. And you put into that mix the elderly, the very young, the vision, hearing and mobility impaired, the runners and the joggers, people on cell phones and so on, it's becoming a really crowded space of disparate users. If people have to step off the sealed path and make way for others, or ride off the sealed path, they are at risk of tripping and slipping on the muddy and uneven verges, and that's especially so for the park terrace um, span of this road, this, the cycle path. So what relative bliss it's been in the last three weeks on the path without our friends on bikes. Still not perfect. Yes, Park Terrace section north of Armour street gates continues to be way too narrow and uneven. And all along the route, the tactile pavers have not been installed correctly or even logically. But it's been better, vastly better, without having to share with people on bikes. <coughs> so on behalf of the Active Canterbury Network, and Living Streets Aotearoa, I ask you, I beg you, to retain the very effective and immediately popular cycling infrastructures question. This helped keep pedestrians safe and has contributed to making their trips more enjoyable and comfortable. And in just reflection on the last speaker, I need to speak on behalf of particularly women who find that the bit of uh, cycling and walking infrastructure within the Hagley Park boundary is really scary and feels unsafe after dark. And they're the ones that are going to be using this very narrow path north of the uh, Armour Street gates on um, along Park Terrace. So thank you.
Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Sorry to push you along, but we've got a we've got a big day. We've uh, just got some slight amendments yeah, we changed, moved yeah. up and an extra one. Yep. Okay. So here we are on item eleven, the urban forest plan. Everyone's uh, deputations, five minutes each. Um, first up is uh, Paul McMahon from Coastal Burwood, Linwood. Welcome back. Hello again. Um, our community board um, is, is broadly supportive um, of the plan um, and um, our that I guess the, the emphasis that we'd, we'd want to put on is uh, is we need to plant a lot more trees. Um, there was some concern though about um, just the thought of um, thought that go into uh, in terms of the impact that it has on um, infrastructure uh, and, and what you know the costs that might be associated with um, with that kind of thing. Um, and you know out in, out east we have a bunch of trees like like I guess everywhere in the city we have certain types of trees that have been planted that uh, cost quite a lot to mitigate their effect on on drains and that kind of thing um, and the the other thing is that we also uh, there's not doesn't appear to be any policy around uh, what to do with uh, tree stumps um, and we again we have a number of of areas throughout the east where there are uh, un unstable tree stumps and, and that kind of thing that, that some members, uh, particularly in coastal, uh, were concerned about. Like, like, so, you know, making sure that we're um, keeping an eye on uh, community safety and, and that kind of thing around uh, the riverbanks and that kind of thing. Um, but, yeah, but broadly speaking, we, we really do uh, strongly support uh, the, the aim to increase tree canopy. Uh, and just wanted to uh, remind you of our community board submission to the annual plan where we finger pointed um, the Palinuris Road section, uh, which is down for disposal, and we wanted to, that to be used uh, as an urban forest. So there's a big section where it's not being used uh, for anything. Um, where it's sort of been sat there in the in the background, uh, has been used for grazing, uh, but the council doesn't even know <laughs> why it was originally acquired. Uh, so, and it's not suitable for housing, uh, but it would, could be suitable for uh, um, some kind of urban forest. So it'd be great if that could be used too. And yeah, happy to take any questions. All done? Yes. Okay, has anyone got any questions of Paul? No, thank you. Thank you very much, mate. That's much appreciated. Right. Good on you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Greg, please. On Zoom. Sorry, yes, you are right. Yes. How are you, mate? Can you hear me okay? Not, obviously not. Are you there, Greg? Hello? No, he's not even talking. Just just while you're doing that, can we also get the page number of where the actual submissions are? <coughs> well, shall we get Mark to come up whilst we're waiting? Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, Mark, you're on, bud. And Ross, welcome back. <coughs> Sorry, is it possible to get the page numbers of where the submissions are? Does anyone have that? Or can someone just call it out when we get... It's just the, really hard to find. Yeah, the submissions of the deputations, they should be on the victim cam. They should be outlined. There's 340 pages. <laughs> yeah, the, so. those individuals who are speaking here, they, they should be prioritised at the beginning of the submissions. Just. Okay. Sure, all yours, Mike. Um, just while they, um, I won't start the five minutes yet. I'll just wait for them to get the presentation correct. At the back to the first slide. I do want to say though, and being in the chamber this morning, and, and I back up the count, uh, comments of Harrison. I think the last couple of weeks have been really disappointing as a resident of Christchurch and seeing the debate that's happened in public media between councillors. I think it's councillors' behaviours on both sides of the argument, and not all councillors. I think this chamber is where councillors should view their opinions and residents view theirs outside the chamber, and we get the chance here. But I, I just, it just looks like you've learnt nothing from the resident survey and the, also the other um, staff survey, and I really think that councillors should view their opinions in here, because it isn't a good look for our city. 
Um, sorry. Um, so the uh, first slide says it for itself. Um, I actually think this is the most important thing on your whole agenda today, because without trees we can't live. You know, we can talk about cycleways. Cycleways is only one component of the climate change. We've got a climate emergency, and trees, I think this is much more important. Okay, cycleways have got their point, but without trees, I say, we can't live. So there's the figures of where Hornby's sitting. We estimate we're down to about 4.9%. Uh, Mia, maybe we could swap the rates rise for that, and we could have that as our tree canopy rate that we aim for, and we chop it around. Um, this is actually next door to Ross's house, but it's an example of where we had a property that had good uh, tree growth, a spread amongst it, and now we have none. I didn't get any more of Ross's uh, house in the picture because he was having his afternoon nap. <laughs> this is another example of a section that I estimated had 20 to 25 trees on it before it was cleaned off. And the other concern here, I just raised this as a general issue. That's how they, this, when this goes in as a two or three storey housing, I'll actually overlook a public uh, school swimming pool, which I think is a major concern and there's no legislation to stop that happening. So what I want to see in the... I, I don't think the tree policy has gone far enough. It ticks a lot of boxes, it says they're not in life things, and it involves the word climate change. So you've ticked all the boxes. But what I really want to see going forward in our organisation was to see is that there is good funding in the long-term plan that backs up the tree policy that you're moving today. And one of these projects, I think, that should be given really high priority in the lowest ward, should I say it with tree canopy rates, is to a Broomfield Common to make that the Hornby Bush because we really do need something like that. And this was raised by a resident at one of our very first meetings. Um, so then we move on. This is actually the uh, motto that Hornby High lives by, and it's a good one. Um, I'm lucky enough to work near the north-south uh, holiday camp, and the amount of birds, the trees out there, and the birds that come because of it, uh, Aaron will know, it's, it's a real... They've actually created this sort of environment there. Yeah. Finally, um, before I hand over to Ross, the urban tr the tree register is one thing that we had massive problems trying to find out when a cycleway went through where the replacement trees went. So we think the tree register should be a public document, an online document that we can look up and see where trees are taken down that we are getting the two for one replacement. Um, it most probably is transparent, but it's not transparent to the residents at the moment. We can't look up and see if a tree's removed where the other two replacement trees have gone. And with that, I'll hand over to Ross. Yeah, I've just written a wee bit here. There's a copy up at the desk. What the silly city really needs is a fully committed team to investigate how we can plant areas of native trees from the likes of Otahuna and or Omahu Reserve by the establishment of bush reserves along the Hallsville boundary to Hornby, then back across the back of Christchurch to the Waimak. This would ensure the spread of native bird life around the city, as well as the trees. And from here, corridors and natives can be planted back into the city to return the bird life to the city. The establishment of corridor in the inner city is not enough, and it needs to be wider spread. It has to be remembered the city does not just consider the CBD, and it's much wider. As a matter of interest, I've received a complaint regarding deciduous trees along the southwest cycleway. They're dropping leaves over the path used by cyclists and creating a slip hazard through rotting and becoming wet in rainy weather. I note someone spoke about that earlier. Perhaps Council may have to consider sweeping these before ACC start receiving claims through accidents or replacing those trees with natives, which don't shed. Of further interest is the fact that it now appears that council considers low-lying shrubs or bushes as a plant that does not qualify as a, for a tree for replacement. We've only learnt of this. Hence, many shrubs in Waterloo Road planted by residents are at present subject to removal without replacement for a cycleway. So much for zero carbon climate in this zone, right next to a rail line. Maybe it's time for a rethink. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have you got the He's going to try to get in by his phone. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank okay. you.
I'm going to turn that way. Okay. I'm just going to see if we can get dragons. Okay. He may be coming in by phone. Okay, shall we go to Penny? Yep. Okay, we're just, just having a bit of trouble getting hold of Greg. Is Penny available, yep. please? Yep. Far away, mate. Thank you. And Penny looks like she's speaking to us. Yep. Uh, kia ora koutou. Uh, nā mihi nui o tēnei rā. Um, I'm Penny Carnaby, chair of the Banks Peninsula um, Conservation Trust <coughs> and also chairing the Banks <coughs> Peninsula um, Native Forest Climate Change Group. Uh, there are two submissions this morning and I'm rolling them in um, to, together because they sort of complement each other. Um, so um, the, the comments will um, be over the 10 minutes. Um, they're interrelated. Um, look, we're really pleased to, to be able to respond to the um, urban forest um, plan. It's um, for the purposes of these submissions, we're we're talking about the parts of the peri-urban and urban parts of Bank Banks Peninsula, um, so around the Sumner Redcliffs, Tale of Mistake, round the Port Hills, Whakarau Po Harbour, um, and, and, and all of the communities of Diamond Harbour, Governors Bay and Littleton. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the importance of uh, w w the, the activities of the Banks Peninsula Conservation Trust and the Climate Change Group. Um, and I'm going to link it back with the Urban Forest Plan. Two, two things about the Banks Peninsula Conservation Trust. It was been set up by landowners of Banks Peninsula um, who wanted to protect um, areas of their land, um, um, but basically didn't want to be told to do that. Um, there would be a familiar ring. Um, and the um, Banks Peninsula Conservation Trust became a covenanting authority, the only independent covenanting authority, I think, in New Zealand, with all the same legal frameworks as QE2. And I make that point um, because in terms of the urban forest plan, uh, protection of recovering native bush is going to be really important. The other thing is uh, the trust brings together large collaborations um, the, uh, of 14 organisations with the Pest Free Banks Peninsula. And in the uh, Whakarapu Harbour, the Te Kahuhu Kahukura project brings together 20 um, organisations, including the council, um, all working together um, on restoring the biodiversity and native corridors uh, that feed into the city. Uh, the Banks Peninsula uh, Climate Change Group um, is looking at how we can um, sequest massive amount of carbon from recovering native forest and get a return to uh, the landowners that um, are, are basically gifting this part of the land. So in terms of the um, urban forest plan, look, we're generally really in support of it. Um, trees are a good thing, increasing biodiversity. But if, if I can be slightly cheeky, um, it, it, the narrative, I am a librarian in a previous life, the, the narrative is, is could be so much more inspiring because we are doing uh, extraordinary things um, in this city. And um, what, I, what I'm going to do is to just describe four things. Um, under the, um, the ecological vision for Banks Peninsula, there are eight goals, and there are literally hundreds and hundreds of us, including the council, um, all ticking off those goals. And one of them, goal four, is how we connect the native corridors um, of native bush um, so that it increases biodiversity and birds and um, insects and all of that biodiversity um, can, can flow into the city. So, so take uh, Whakarapo because it's a great example. We're connecting those corridors. Um, um, landowners are uh, either gifting land or, or um, covenanting land and we're connecting right the way around to uh, Te Ahu Pātiki, um, all through that Kaituna Valley, uh, well over a hundred, uh, well over a thousand hectares of connected bush. The Te Kahuhu Kahukura project um, is is basically uh, the vision is to coat the southern Port Hills with native vegetation. We have a project to plant ten thousand 
uh, Torturer and Potter Cups. We're halfway through. These are the things. So what I'm saying here is that protection is a really important part of your urban plan because if you protect and covenant, um, then it's there in perpetuity. Um, and um, basically, if, if you've got that image just of Whakarapo, you've got those native corridors connected. And what I believe the urban plan is, uh, and this, in some ways, the, the connection's there, but the, the, um, you know, the, the red zone, um, the, all of the um, vision for there, needs to be much more ambitious. We need to um, connect along the Apawaho um, Hethcote River network, and that's a wonderful network of people, um, and, and also the red zone, the green spine. But wouldn't it be amazing if, uh, if that was all connected and we wouldn't be a garden city, we'd be a city in a forest, a native forest. Um, so that's the first thing, protection. The second thing is if you're going to plant or, or covenant or do all of those sorts of things, you've got to control the pests. It's incredibly discouraging if you've got communities out there planting. Um, um, Otamahua Quail Island's an example. You know, it's pest-free. Um, the, the community have planted over a 1,000 trees. There's recovering native bush. The bird count there, I, I did a bird count with my partner 30 years ago. It's extraordinary. But the deer are coming over and, and clobbering it. Now, Doc's dealing with that. So, so I'm just saying in terms of the urban plan, um, we believe you must have um, a pest and, and you've also a weed, a weed control. So that trifecta of protection, um, um, pest control, and you know, connecting those corridors and weeds, um, it's, it's, we're going to have an absolutely extraordinary um, urban forest in, in Otatahi. Um, now, the, the fourth point I want to make is, is around the Banks Peninsula Native Forest Climate Change Group. This is a group of incredibly expert people um, trying to get their heads around um, getting a return for landowners who are sequestering carbon on their land. And anyone who's had anything to do with the ETS, it kind of, you take one step forward and two backwards sometimes. But what, what I'm suggesting here You've, the, the council have set up a really great um, um, climate resilience team under um, Hannah Luthwaite, and and we are, are so excited about that as the um, council looks to offset its um, carbon footprint. Um, but what we what we and I, I the the urban plan says that you're going to do a de desktop and that de desktop analysis of the current urban forest. Um, to locate areas that can be included in the ETS. Well, um, what, what we think is, you, you, while you're doing a great job, um, you, you, you've got some very, very hungry projects, carbon projects coming up at you with the stadium, um, with the um, um, recreation, um, uh, the recreation sports center. And, and what we'd like to talk to you about is that, um, wouldn't it be great in, in, if, if these um, you know, protected areas right the way across Banks Peninsula, but the urban and peri-urban parts um, in the immediate future, um, wouldn't it be great if we, um, instead of the council going off and offsetting its footprint with carbon credits from somewhere else, why don't we buy local, get the um, return back into the landowners of Banks Peninsula and we, we can have biodiversity credits, carbon credits. And when we get on to the next part of your consultation, which is the rural forest plan, uh, personally, I think they're connected. Um, I think we need to be thinking of uh, connected native forests going from Akaroa Heads, starting now, um, right the way around through the uh, Whakaropo Harper uh, Basin. And by then, it will be connecting with the heart of the city and, and and all of the things outlined in the urban plan. Um, I just want to finish by saying um, we're very enthusiastic about the plan. We think it should be much bolder, um, um, and um, we do want to acknowledge the in, 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 fantastic work done by the council's parks team. We work very closely with them, the biodiversity team, and the recently set up climate change group in the council. Thank you.
Good. Very well done. Very well done. Yeah. Thank you, Penny. Okay. Well done. <clears throat> Good. Now, I think Greg is um, up on deck now. How are you, mate? Can you hear me? Good, thanks. Yes, I can. Sorry about the uh, technical issue earlier on. No, you're right, mate. Far um, away. So I'll start. Um, yep. Thanks for the opportunity to speak today. Sorry I can't be there in person. I'm in Wellington for work. Um, Christchurch City Council declared a climate emergency and an ecological emergency more than four years ago. That should come as no surprise to anyone who lives at home in Christchurch. What should come as a surprise, perhaps even a shock, is the wholesale clear felling of established trees across our city. The fact that Christchurch has less than 14% tree canopy coverage, and the biggest shock of all, the fact that the tree canopy coverage targets being recommended by council staff is only 20%, and the protracted time frame for that target to be achieved. By international standards, that target falls well short of being bold or courageous. In terms of the climate emergency, they are also failing to demonstrate the necessary urgency to which action is, is required. In North America, American Forest is the oldest national non-profit conservation organization in the United States. They championed the creation of the US Forest Service and persuaded Congress to provide stable funding and launch the tree equity score, a tool which is used to help US cities measure and expand their tree cover. In 2010, the national average tree coverage of major US cities was 27%, a figure twice that of what we have in Christchurch and far greater than the targeted mere 20% goal currently being set by our council. With their deep knowledge, American forests have recommended an average of 40% tree coverage across cities in the US. That's 40%, not 14, and have a, a target date set by 2030 to achieve that, more than 40 years ahead of that of Christchurch. New York, Denver, Shanghai, Ottawa, Los Angeles, and numerous other cities across the globe have all unveiled initiatives aimed at greatly increasing their urban forests because of the ability of trees to reduce city temperatures, absorb carbon dioxide, and soak up excess rainfall. Closer to home in Melbourne, Australia, a city which currently has a land area twice the size of Christchurch, has a population 13 times larger than ours, and an existing tree can be coverage of 22%, they too have set themselves a target to increase their tree canopy coverage to 40%. They plan to achieve that by 2040. In our sister city, Adelaide, the council there have set the following targets. To boost tree coverage in areas that only have 20%, to, um, sorry, to, to boost tree, tree canopy coverage by 20% in areas which currently have 30% tree coverage and to do so by 2045. And for areas who currently have more than 30% tree coverage, for that to be maintained and to ensure no net loss. In Christchurch, however, the first major city in New Zealand to have declared a climate and ecological emergency, so-called Garden City, the target set under the advice of council staff, as mentioned, is only 20% tree, can tree canopy coverage. The target date set is not within the next 20 years like cities elsewhere. No, the target set in Christchurch is not for another half a century. In simple terms, that equates to taking more than twice as long to achieve half as much. Now, I wonder how many of those sitting around Council's table today will be, how old you will be in 50 years, and if any of you will actually still be alive. <laughs> Professor Tim Nash of Victoria University, when interviewed by TVNZ about climate change, said, it's frustrating that we almost have to be punched in the face before we take it seriously. We're hurtling towards a tipping point, global temperatures rising by 1.5 degrees. The big question for the council, the mayor and um, elected members is to ask, are the targets being recommended by council staff really taking the emergency seriously? The other questions to be asked are, since declaring the emergency, has the city council acted at pace? Are the tree canopy goals and targeted dates of this council aspirational? Do they measure up to international standards of your peers? Greg, have you got a um, Greg? Tr sorry, mate, have you got a video that you want to play as well? Um, there is. Yep. <coughs> okay. Um, I'll just, just finish the rest of my oral submission in the video. Um, yeah. You've demonstrated courageous action in the past. It's time for you to, to do the same today in terms of tree protection and tree retention throughout the built environment. In terms of planting avenues of trees, rather than just focusing on planting trees in existing green space. And most importantly, for the tree canopy coverage of our city to be increased right across Christchurch. If you can now play the video, it would be appreciated. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Eco warriors, doctors for the environment, weather health warnings, 
In Western Sydney, there aren't enough trees and it's killing people. People are, are actually literally dying from heart attacks, from heat exhaustion, from complications of medication that happen at high temperatures. Um, and this is happening on a much bigger scale than people realise because it's really a silent killer. And to prove the point, on a scorching summer's day just two weeks ago, the doctors compared the temperatures of two parallel streets in Turngabi. Bulleye Road, with hardly any trees, hit 49 degrees. A hundred metres away, Favell Road, lined with mature shade trees, the mercury reaching 29 <coughs> degrees. That's 20 degrees difference. You're here in Bulleye Road, does it get hot in summer? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And do you think more trees would be a good thing? The more trees you have would cool things down? Definitely, any shading that we can have would cool the area, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Trees can be the difference between life and death. With so many new suburbs being stripped of trees, the doctor's group is concerned people are <coughs> isolating in air-conditioned cocoons, not great for the environment or their mental health. If it's too dangerous to walk outside, it's the mental health of the community that's really impacted. The doctor's group has teamed up with the Worldwide Fund for Nature to highlight the ecological and health benefits of trees. New suburbs with barely any room for trees and homes with dark roofing are spreading across the west and southwest. More people die each year from heat waves than from all the other disasters combined. And trees are one of the ways that we can really reduce people's exposure to heat. Mark Burrows, Nine News. Okay. Very good. Thank you, thank you, Greg. That was a very good presentation. I realise that's Australia, but I mean, the temperature's rising internationally. We can't afford to get. Okay. Th thank you once again. Good on you. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks for your time. Bye. 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 Yeah, so here we have Bye. Graham from Spark, please. Lorena. Um, yeah, uh, my focus for this morning is around infrastructure and the impact of trees on telecommunications cell towers. Um, so we support the urban forest plans and these are becoming a really good initiative across New Zealand, um, but trees in the street need to be thought about as to the root structures and also how tall they're going to get so that oh, okay. when they're in front of infrastructure... Who's this person? <laughs> Just Sorry. Um, <laughs> all right. So I'm Graham McCarrison from Spark. <laughs> No, 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 that's right. Just, just um, put, put so, this, so, so, we can mute her. Can mute um, Everyone on Zoom is muted. Okay. So, Far so away, mate. going back, so this is about trees. So in the submission, there was a nice little diagram about the impact that trees buildings can have on cell phone coverage. So it's not about not having trees, it's about having appropriate height trees near infrastructure or providing for pruning of trees within annual plan budgets. It's that simple. Uh, it would have been nice that infrastructure was part of the development of these sort of plans. Um, always my message, I was here giving a presentation on telecommunications to Greater Christchurch partnership yesterday and, and if you think about the messages for telecommunications it's about our data so telecommunications becomes the most important thing we have going toward supporting climate change initiatives if you're thinking about tree protection start to put in little electronic tags within them start monitoring how they're growing and all those sorts of things is one data source for that. So it's as simple as that. The recommendations are in my submission. We're here to kind of help, looking forward to being part of the technical group, looking about um, appropriate trees. Uh, telecommunication shouldn't be forgotten when uh, public documents are being prepared. That's me knocking on the door regularly because we've not been part of your engagement processes or get invited late, so. Thank you, thank you, Graham. We've got 
Uh, Tyler wanted to have a question. In yeah, I just wanted to know about uh, your future plans in regards to your infrastructure requirements. I know that a major competitor is obviously going alternative ways. What does Spark look like going into the future? Um, if we're talking satellites, um, we're all doing the same thing. Um, so satellites are complementary technology to what's on the ground, so fibre and poles. So uh, Spark yesterday and, and last week announced partnerships with uh, uh, SpaceX to do a similar coverage footprint, um, but also using Lynx uh, as well. Sorry, so the reverse of that. Lynx for um, our coverage footprint, same as two degrees. Yeah, so, so yeah, it, it works well for Canterbury. You're right, Tim. You're done. Uh, Yanni? Um, just two, two quick questions. One is, um, have you been involved in the review of our infrastructure design standards around... No. Right, okay. So that's We one. would like to be. Okay. And then the second question is, do you, do you think, given the proliferation of telecommunications, utilities uh, and poles, yep. is, is there a way going forward where you would see greater um, degree of alignment with just having one resource rather than every company having their own resource? Because it does seem like quite a proliferation of the same type of utility that takes up valuable space in the footpath where we could be putting trees. Totally. Um, so, so in the last six months, you will have seen uh, One New Zealand, so Vodafone, have announced and set up their own pole company. So the sale of their pole and cabinet assets, passive assets, Spark and Two Degrees have done the same. So our the two degrees deal hasn't been completed, but is close since going into a company we set up, which is called Connexa. The aim of those pole companies is about amalgamation, getting more co-location, working with developers around uh, finding a single or multiple sites to have three providers, lots of IoT stuff on there to provide that. And as we start looking forward. Hopefully it'll mean less poles in streets. But if we can get beside developers in Kaungora in particular to design, sell this antennas <coughs> to be part on top of the buildings basically so you don't need pole infrastructure in these very densified environments. So yeah, that's very much part of our agenda. Thank you mate, that, that's a great great answer. Thank you, thank you very much for your presentation. Ta. So next we have, I think, on Zoom, Jackie and Bethany. Have I? Uh, kia ora kotu. I am Jackie Howard from the Sticks Living Laboratory Trust. Um, Bethany will not be joining me today, unfortunately. Um, so I will get things going. Um, Thank as you. I mentioned before, Living Laboratory Trust. We were founded on the Stix Vision document from 2000 to 2040 um, to create a living laboratory in the catchment. And we also support the remaining four visions for the catchment. Next slide, please. Um, so for our general comments on the submission, um, in general, we do support the um, urban forest plan. And in particularly, we strongly support their overall plan of council to prioritize and encourage planting trees. Um, we specifically support the targeted canopy cover over waterways, as this is vital to river ecosystem success. And canopy cover over waterways increases native animal abundance, reduces evaporative loss, and naturally controls pest plants. So prioritizing this will be a quick win for the city. We also support the focus on partnering with community groups and local landowners to accomplish planting goals as it supports local communities and extends the value of council's contributions. And lastly, we also support the commitment in objective 4.1 to promote community planting days. And we find this quite successful in our catchment, getting community involved. For our recommendations, um, we strongly suggest that council consider the following. Um, one moment. So we can suggest that um, planting native tree species should be more strongly and consistently emphasized in the plan. Planting exotic trees brings long-term consequences such as spreading exotic seedlings into restored areas 
and providing resources for introduced birds and insects that native species often fail to benefit from. This is contrary to the plan's goal of providing long-term benefits. By planting native trees, this will help build a sustainable native bird, insect, and plant community. Currently, most dedicated goals around native plantings are in objective 2.4, which we feel separates out native planting goals from the broader planting tree effort. These goals should be incorporated into the planting guidelines in section one. Objective 1.1 and 1.2 should also include a goal to encourage the planting of native trees over exotic trees wherever native trees would accomplish the same goals. We also strongly suggest um, that the council consider acquiring land along the Pahatakikanui and in the red zone. This will allow high value areas of urban forest to be established early, thus connecting native planting corridors, shading waterways, and providing continuous habitat for native animals. Additionally, this will improve public access to urban forests and support the completion of a source to sea walkway. And overall, we think this would be beneficial in relation to the overall health and rehabilitation of the Pawtucky Kanui itself. And that is everything um, on my end. Are there any questions? Uh, no, there is not. Thank you very much. You've done a fantastic job. And thank you for the time and effort you put into your submission. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Okay, so next we have um, Georgina Stanley. On. Oops, nope, there down. she goes. I was going to say on Zoom, but it's not. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is my first time submitting in decades. So um, I'm here on behalf of um, Smith Street Community Farm Trust. Uh, we're a eastern suburbs trust uh, that's looking at food resilience. Uh, so for us, uh, we would like you to consider planting more fruit trees. Um, it's a really awesome opportunity to plant more trees in our city. And um, as it's a city, um, we have um, tree, fruit trees and nut trees provide recreational um, opportunities. Um, that we see in the red zone, um, but it would be nice to have more of those spread all throughout the city. So utilising our community parks more effectively for uh, fruit and nut trees would be a really huge win for the community. Um, and considering Christchurch is 15% of our city is food insecure, uh, it would be really awesome if we could tag um, the amount of trees that we're going to plant to that food insecurity. So I would really like to see 15% of all new trees planted being fruit and nut trees. Um, because landscape intervention um, has a tangible effect on um, food insecurity. Food insecurity is located in place. So if you live in a suburb, uh, you can, and you're wealthy and you move in, you'll be more likely to be food insecure if you move in into certain areas. So making impacts in certain locations uh, will really actually have a huge impact long term on our city's food insecurity. So that's what I'd like to see. Well, yeah. Questions? Tyler, please. Kia ora. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> any, any locations of interest that you'd like to talk uh, about? We're, we're at Eastern Suburbs um, Trust, so we, we're little, so we can only spread so far, but there really are um, quite good maps out there already about where food um, deprivation indexes are. Um, yep. So aligning, uh, so doing some, your, having your urban forest plan, having some social benefit um, and aligning those two, that would be good work. Right, thank you. Yeah. Tim. Yeah, thank you. And um, it's a shame that the trees that were planted in um, uh, Long Manchester Street, with, they're not com kumquats. I had a talk with Tina about it a while ago. There's something that the rats like them, but you can't really do much with them. Um, but I'm just wondering what bushes and things like that, because, you know, you look at all the variety of um, berries and things. So if, if we looked separate to this, but looked at a vision for, you know, sus sustainable food, Yes. Would that be something to, because I mean the berries, it's just so much bush-wise, depending on how you define a tree, because it looks well, like a bush. Well, the tree, the urban forest plan, you really need a three metre tree to hit a carbon target. Um, so, uh, but long term around parks planning, I think that you could, there's an opportunity to create um, edible parks, um, edible, edible community parks um, that have more of a, um, a sustaining sort of value to a community. So, 
And I suppose with regards to carbon um, reduction, you know, all those people buying those packets of, <laughs> that, that, that get delivered, yep. if you look in England and the amount of um, traffic that's put on the road from um, sales by uh, internet is insane. So, um, yeah. Yeah, Thank you for that. yeah, that's the, um, if you can produce food locally within inside your sub, um, city, you're yeah. going to have an impact on your carbon uh, production, um, yeah. carbon consumption of a city um, long term. So, yeah, it's a win. Thank, Thank you. you, Celeste. Hi, Georgina. Um, I just wondered if you had any thoughts on the concept of edible neighbourhoods. Um, they're great ideas. Um, so I think that the trick is with edible neighbourhoods, and we've been doing a bit of research into the community because everywhere you go, you really want to be able to plant trees or put food where people are going to access them. Um, we looked at streetscapes and people are uncomfortable with um, having a, a, a blend between um, fruit trees on their front yard and fruit trees on the, on the pedestrian walkway side because it means people uh, can access their property when they don't want that to happen. So there's security issues around that. So linking um, an edible landscape up into a suburb would be uh, specific nodes would be probably the most, what's looking like the community is saying is what they want the most. So that would be your uh, little pocket parks and community parks. Um, so it's all located in one area um, and that people can access. So all your information about how to harvest and how to plant, um, yeah, all of the things are in one spot. Yeah. And do you think it would be useful to do that as part of our suburban master plan? Oh, it would be lovely. Um, yeah. So <laughs> one example would be in the New Brighton Mall, some of the businesses have taken it upon themselves to put in gardens with plant, uh, herbs you can pick and they use it in the restaurants, which yes, I think is great. But it is. Expanding that vision further? Um, definitely. Um, it's That's a partnership between um, you know commercial enterprises and, um, and, and streetscaping. So um, there is uh, there have been a few um, people involved in doing... Um, edible streets, so planting on their berms. And what they've found is that uh, the neighbourhood doesn't access it as much as they thought they would because there's perceptions and also risks around um, dog feces and people, you know, pollution from the streets. So you'd probably want to put fruit in, and edibles in quieter streets or low, like Brighton, which is a pedestrian yeah. primary thank, thank, space. Thank you, Georgia. So, yeah. that, yeah. that, yeah. that, okay. Very good. No, you're, you're doing a good job. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for what you do down there. It's great. Okay, okay so Lionel, please. I'll be speaking as the uh, Provincial President for North Canterbury Fair and Farms uh, submission. Um, so in, in all we do support the aspects of the plan in terms of its vision. Our big concern is really about the mention of the extension of the plan to cover rural land on Banks Peninsula. Um, and the fact that this would really need to be done with consultation with rural landowners and users. But we actually don't think there is a need to have the extension, especially given that the rules are there currently to designed to protect vegetation, i.e. vegetation clearance rules, and to protect and encourage biodiversity in the area. There doesn't seem to be any consultation so far with the rural community in terms of this. Um, in Appendix 2, where you state how you've developed the plan, you say that you've set up a working group to assist with developing the plan and workshops were held <coughs> with various interested parties. If the plan was to include rural areas, then consultation with rural landowners and users is needed, and it doesn't appear to have been done. Um, and like I said, the Goal one to plant, we state that uh, rural land use for the rural area of Banks Peninsula is currently about, in 2018-19, was 11%, and that by 2030 and 2070, you wanted to see that at 12 and 15% respectively. Um, yeah, there's just no sort of discussion or justification about extension of an urban plan 
and to cover the rural areas. Any questions? Button on? Um, no, apparently not. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yep, Sarah, please. So, based on that, when you look at the um, urban forest plans, so it's a plan mainly for the urban area, which wording or which parts of that do you have the problem with in that you would be looking for changes in? Uh, so the main one is obviously in Table 1. Yeah. It's 1. 1.4 of, of the, um, the goal one. is obviously about developing a rural plan, um, extending this to the rural sector. Yeah. Um, what's the justification for that is the question. Okay, so if that was a goal that said, yeah, you know, while the wording is that, if the meaning of that was to then develop a plan in conjunction with the rural community for the rural area, would you be happy with that? Be because at the moment it's just a brief thing that says yeah. extend it. But if that meant develop a new one in conjunction with those people, that would be okay? I, th I think that that would yeah. probably be more respective, yeah, having thanks. a completely separate plan for the rural sector of that. Yeah, thanks. Well, certainly consult extensively with rural landowners yep. and rural land users. Yeah. Mm, good, good question. Okay. Righto. So that appears to be all the questions. Thank you very much for coming in. No problem. Thank you. Okay. Is Clive here, please? Thank you. Good to see you, mate. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name's Clive Paris. I'm submitting on behalf of the Avenue Community Group. Uh, the ACG is a, a neutral, non-political, entirely voluntary residence resident, organisation representing approximately 8,000 households in Avonhead and the surrounding suburbs of Rusty, Burnside, Brimborough and Island. Our role is to liaise with government and non-government organisations to ensure sustainable development in the area that it represents in which the local community is at the forefront of decision making and and development. At the outset, the summary of feedback circulated by Council on 2nd of June 2023 does not include any <coughs> reference for the, to the proposal for participatory management of canopies in the ACG submission. We felt it was disappointing because it indicates to us that the Council was already determined not to take our submission into account. And I'll use this hearing to explain our participatory management position. Fundamentally, the ACG wants the community or communities to be at the centre of management of tree canopies and urban forests, which means A, there needs to be a mechanism for residents to notify the council of issues with maintaining existing tree canopies or urban forests, which triggers the process of council assessing the issue and addressing it. B, where new plantations are contemplated, local residents should have an opportunity to provide feedback on the type of vegetation proposed and factors such as the potential for allergic responses and respiratory issues should also be taken into account. We're mindful of the costs of undertaking consultation and propose that the council pilots a community-driven feedback gathering process whereby local community groups are given the responsibility of collating and passing on feedback from local residents. The council can develop checklists and other processes to monitor the integrity of the feedback gathering process, but should leave the imp implementation to community groups in order to minimise the cost to the council staff itself. And further, the council should trial community management of vegetation where the local community groups express interest in this. Areas of vegetation that can be safely managed by local community groups should be handed over for community management of the council monitoring process. Any such maintenance activity should be voluntary, albeit with the council providing necessary resources for the purpose. The ACG considers that such an initiative would save on contractor costs which can be significant if the pilot projects are successful and are taken up by more community groups in other areas. And finally, the ACG requests that the Council takes on board its proposal to trial community management. The ACG would be willing to practice to collaborate with the Council on developing and participating in any pilot pro project. Thank you. Hey, thanks for coming in, Clive. Just one in terms of the 
um, the quantum of the management, so to speak. So uh, you, I'm just thinking in like an out area. Are you thinking the smaller parks as such where you'd be planting yeah. or, or yeah, Avonhead we, Park? Or what, what are you thinking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. smaller areas. Like we need to address, in, in recent times, get rid of issues such as Tall Trees Avenue and um, Kittleston, Kittleston Drive. Yep. Issues that we've had there. Yeah, okay. Okay, now that's really useful. So it's not just... And, 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 and in days gone past, the cemetery issues with the gum trees. Yeah. Okay, no, that, that's really useful. We might just flag that, Andrew, to have a couple of questions at the time. Great, thank you. <coughs> Thanks, Clive. Just a quick question for you. <laughs> You're popular. Yeah, I'm just interested um, in uh, your view on... Uh, the responsibilities that we have as a city, does it? do you think it sits primarily with the Christchurch City Council or the residents in terms of uh, tree canopy over well, the city? I, I think it's obviously both. I mean, it's, it's participatory. Um, we, we've got to be collaborative with it, and you've got to take the community with you when you do these things. Um, we're not, the, the Parks and Reserve do an amazing job. Mm. Um, and it's a huge job, and we get complaints every every other week about grass not being cut or trees not being cut down or whatever. But um, so if you're you take saying the, kind if of you like take the community with you. You're saying you're like fifty fifty responsibility. Um, you know, individuals to plant trees in their backyards and that sort of thing. Yeah, I don't know if it's fifty fifty, but just so long as you you know if you can get local agreement within the communities itself. There's always going to be people in the problem in the community that are not going to work with you. With you, too. All right. Thank you. Oh, just one quick, one last one actually. Oh. Um, listen, we we sometimes get um, residents coming to us, um, offer an older in life. We've got large street trees, and we know that the the benefit, and we've seen it in the video earlier, of having large street trees for the community as a whole in the neighbourhood. But sometimes they have impacts on individual properties and leaf litter, those kind of things. Do you think that there's a community way to help deal with that, um, as well as the stuff that's in parks and things? Because the street trees is often where we get the most conflict rather than the stuff that's in parks. You, you get conflict in streets when there's a group of people together. Um, but if you, can, you only need two or three people to agree to convince the rest of the community how to go about it. Yeah, and and if you have strong groups like even in community groups, quite strong. Yeah, um, and we get a lot of agreement within the within the group, and it's not hard to pass that on. And then if you take the council staff with you, um, it's it's not hard to to get a, a agreement. Yeah, I'm just wondering if we could do something on that. Yeah, we just need to work closer with the uh, parks and, and and we do it with the with the cemetery group, uh, yeah. and we've got an amazing relationship with the park ranger and and those that administer that. Yeah, but even at a street level, helping residents who are struggling with the leaf litter and stuff to, yeah. Yeah, to, to help maintain the community appeal and stuff. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, cool. I can. <laughs> uh, and I didn't have my speaker on. Arinka and Robin, can you hear me? Press your mute button, mate. No, you're, you're on. You're on mute. You're on mute. Is that it? Can you? I think they've put mute on it. Now. Yep. Yeah. There you go. Far away. We can hear you. We're on. Okay. Thank you. Um, ah. Now turn off what? <laughs> Your cell phone? Yeah. No, it's not my cell phone. <laughs> okay, start. Yep. Hello? Yep, go. Go for it. No, that is it. Okay. Hey, this is uh, Arinka and Robin. Robin, Robin. <laughs> Hang on. Have they got another device open? Yeah. Ask yeah. if there's yeah. a computer oh, going. So, yeah. I thought it was cell phone. Yeah. Technology. Hello. 
It's their end, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It, the, the, there's, some, there's something else turned on at your end that we're getting back feed with. Okay. Uh, should I go and mute? No, can't hear you, mate. Okay, you 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 start talking, and we we'll see what we can uh, come up with because you've got a presentation here as well. I think. Okay, can you see us now or what? It's good. Just just go. Just go. Okay. So basically, we support this urban forest plan. But it is, it is important to keep all the mature trees in the garden. We already have, for all the obvious reasons, uh, for shade, oxygen, bird life, natural Trees are, uh, the deciduous trees are important as they lose the leaves in the winter, leaving the sun in, in the winter, leaving the sun in, and shading the summer. Um, people's personal create beautiful streetscapes that members of the public can also and keeping the very important garden image for our visitors and tourists to enjoy. Council needs to have checks We notice that the 20% recommendation for green developers is being largely and by not providing car parking that creates unintended consequences in the future. E.g. Women and children will be unsafe walking to their cars. Congestion and will increase as cars circulate and circulate, battling for car parks to the city, creating more pollution and congestion as in recent press reports. Green spaces and private gardens have found to be important in assisting with water dispersion to avoid flooding. Is that better? Yes. <laughs> must be yours. Your no, it's not our end. The older properties also have found an important role. Oh, oh, sorry. Green spaces and private gardens have been found to be important in assisting with water dispersion to avoid flooding. The older properties have also have also an important role to play and need protection from indiscriminate development. It is great that there are now some protections for heritage gardens and areas, but more needs to be done. The planning permission for these properties is the responsibility of the council, who should not allow developers to cut corners. We agree with identifying heritage trees for protection, which they used to have. We agree with the red green zone as a special place and should be preserved with limited development as it is an amazing sacred place as it is. A memory of the sacrifices people had to make as a result of the 2010-2011 earthquake should not be diminished. We support this plan and look forward to continuing liaison with the council on the very important matter of shaping the future of our city. Okay, so um, um, just, you know, the council needs to have checks and balances. Um, to assist developers to keep the vision in play, we noted that 20% of the recommendations for green space for developers being largely ignored, and by not providing car parking will create unintended consequences for the future, e.g. women and children will be unsafe walking too far from their cars. Um, and congestion and pollution will increase as cars circulate and circulate looking for car parks and access to the city. So that was basically the first couple of uh, paragraphs that, that was echoing around. And um, we, um, that's really it. Um, Robin is going to um, 
sort of cap what I have to say. And um, well, I think it's very important to keep the mature trees we already have for several reasons, historical reasons, heritage. I mean, they were planted by our forefathers. Do we respect those forefathers? We should. I'm sure most of us do. And that's our way that's our way of respecting and remembering them, especially along the Avon River um, banks. Uh, it's, it's very important to keep those mature trees. Um, it's more important to have mature trees than not have them, than avoid having them. Right, and just about the photos that you can see up on the wall, that's sort of the before and after of two different properties that show um, what what was there and then what was there afterwards and how many trees and gardens have disappeared just from those two top properties and it's happening all over town. Um, the one property that you see there it, 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 uh, with the green space in front of it is an older, um, I think it's a council or yeah. housing um, complex that has yeah, created, that, that's left a green space there, somewhere for the children to play. So, um, yeah, preserving the green spaces are very important and also the fact that private gardens are also just as important to keep and preserve as part of the um, tree canopy. And we are the garden city. People come here to see our garden city. We don't want to lose that wonderful reputation by cutting down mature trees. Okay, Th thank you very much. It was a wee bit difficult at the start. We're certainly hearing you loud and clear now. And thank you for the effort that you went to. <laughs> Good on you. Thank you. Okay, Marie. Welcome. Uh, kia ora koutou, uh, nei rā tu mihi mai o hākia koutou. And I'm a Marie Gray, I've, I've spoken a number of times from the Summit Road Society. We own four reserves on the Port Hills and run Predator Free Port Hills, a community trapping project. And we have a very long relationship with Port Hills Ranger Service. Uh, we do support the overall direction of the plan, um, but would like to see it uh, bolder, more ambitious, and in particular resource. The council does have a lot of really good plans but then those plans need to be resourced through the long term and annual plan process. Um, with our focus on the Port Hills, we would really like to see the restoration of the gullies of the Port Hills uh, important for biodiversity, sedimentation, and increasingly as our climate warms around climate resilience. Um, we need to set the conditions for nature to take over. So in places where there's seed source, that means fencing, but in most of urban Christchurch, uh, including the city side of the Port Hills, that's around planting, large-scale planting. And the other thing I really want to emphasise that when you create forests, um, you can't just have the capital investment in planting, but actually ongoing um, maintenance in the form of uh, pest control and weed control, because they are the biggest threats uh, to establish ecosystems. Um, in urban areas, we'd like to see that supported with mini forests, um, uh, green corridors, backyard biodiversity, and, um, and street trees as well. Uh, focusing on natives, that's something that we really prioritise. Um, and um, all of these work together to create uh, this canopy cover because the landscape scale projects are what provide the main habitat for our, our native biodiversity and then they spill over into the city through these little pockets of biodiversity around the city. Um, we are very much in favour of uh, initiatives that support kaitiakitanga um, and providing opportunities for community groups uh, to undertake native planting, weeding, predator control in their local reserves. Um, the urban forest plan is a very good start. It just needs to go a lot further. Uh, just uh, as an example, we would like to see the financial contribution process um, <coughs> move from 20% to 25%. And that's just a start. Actually, it would be like, good to see this go a lot further in time as well. Um, we would really like to commend the efforts of the park rangers. They are extraordinary. They are extraordinary. 
and are their effort to um, plant uh, trees across the Port Hills, the Red Zone, you know, across the city and Banks Peninsula. <coughs> um, the council is a cemetery to uh, Te Kākuhu Kahikura, um, a landscape scale restoration project. I think that might have been mentioned earlier, possibly by Penny, uh, around uh, restoring and connecting a thousand hectares of native bush on the southern Port Hills. And that's really about providing that opportunity for spillover. So then that needs to be supported by a kind of whole lot of community and council initiatives and private landowners on the Southern Port Hills from Taitapu uh, around to Victoria Park and over the harbour side as well. So I think that um, sums up the key points. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on this submission. Kia ora. Thank you very much. A anyone got a question? No. Thank you very much for Thanks. taking the time and effort. Thank you. Thank you. Colin. <coughs> Ah, kia ora, many friends. <clears throat> um, want to support the forest plan and to um, be for it to be more ambitious. Um, we've got a rich and very valid history of recombination. Um, we want more nature and more of our deep uh, natural heritage in the urban environment. Uh, we want more kofi for the, a city of golden winters um, to attract the Koremako bellbirds and tui. The, um, I think we, there needs to be more oversight uh, you know, amongst uh, developers and, and, and uh, consultants, uh, contractors, to make sure we, we're getting the right uh, balance there. Um, we do want native first. Uh, and greater than 50% of our prominent native trees as, as being native. Um, we're facing the sixth great extinction in the world. Um, so in a sense, this is not negotiable. We've signed up to international agreements uh, on biodiversity. Um, so visibility is critical uh, because extinction of experience leads to extinction of species. If we don't have it in our uh, you know, daily lives, then it becomes invisible and um, no longer relevant to, um, to our identity. Uh, forest is an ecosystem and it feeds our critically endangered wildlife as well. Um, so why can't we have our native forest front and centre, right here in the, in the centre of, um, of, of, the, of the square? feeding out of the uh, chalice which reflects our uh, ancient buried forests. <clears throat> um, I've spoken to many community groups over the years about all of this and they love this kind of a concept, so why can't we just get on with it? We have um, a spatial plan for landscape connectivity of patches and stepping stones um, and we can incorporate big and little patches uh, across the city. Um, groves of nature in all of our uh, in all of our parks, such as this award-winning uh, pocket park concept uh, from the Ellerslie Flower Show some years ago, um, and our corridors uh, that join up all of these stepping stones. Don't believe that we don't have lots of native trees that are suitable for our streets. Visibility is critical, and of course um, our um, our rivers side tree corridors um, can also be designed to reflect deterity. Uh, we could do this uh, much better. This was a part of the um, original plan for the inner city Avon River, but it was kind of passed by for in, um, incorrect reasons. Um, and we've got a whole range of native species that are suitable to this kind of environment in which it feed our, uh, our wildlife. We know how to do it, and we know how to mitigate any problems. Um, and don't misunderstand the preliminary results which sort of imply that only 10% support native trees. But in fact, the Christchurch City Council's own random citizen surveys to, in 2003 show that 58% of citizens wanted more native plants in their neighbourhood and only 2.9% wanted less. 72% wanted more native birds in their neighbourhood. And our birds need our plants. One of the other critical issues to, to uh, consider is, is biosecurity. 
we need to be culling and not uh, expanding the number of um, some of our very serious weed threats um, in the city. I'm going to suggest that we're a city of multiple Ks. You can read them all there. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and one of the most critical ones, and, and very distinctive for Cam Canterbury Plains and Ototahi Christchurch or Karaitiana, is Kofi. Um, and this can pr produce that city of golden winters, which feeds our important nectar-feeding birds. I'll give you this free brand for free. <laughs> Uh, you don't need to spend another million dollars on, on branding the city. <laughs> uh, this will also feed into the National Park City strategy. Um, and finally, um, I want to... Whoops, what happened there? Uh, finally, I just want to shout out for our lovely uh, cabbage tree, our tea coca, um, and, and to love our the wonderful silhouettes that it creates against our wonderful skies. Kia ora. Thank you. Now... Tyler had a question that's going to last about seven seconds far away. <laughs> Kia ora, Colin. Absolute pleasure. Uh, I'm just wanting to get a bit more... Um, uh, I wanted to question your thoughts on developers um, and providing more of an oversight on the development of native trees within our city. Can you provide some insight into that? Yeah, I think we need to be have a stronger, um, uh, you know, um, r rule about losing native trees and native trees, big trees, you know, which are important um, carbon sinks, mm -hmm. um, you know, on all our properties, not to just sort of wipe out and clear out, you know, scorched earth kind of policies. Uh, we need to kind of police that a little bit more rigidly and, um, you know, uh, allow houses and developments to occur around those and to protect what's there, but also to have a more stringent replacement um, uh, rules um, that, that reflect the age of the tree that's been lost. You can't just replace a hundred-year-old tree with a five, you know, one or two-year-old seedling, but uh, multiply that up to, um, you know, fifty trees to replace a hundred-year-old tree if it's really got to go. Thank you, thank you, Colin. That, that's great, great answer. Thank you very much. Right, who oh, now? We're getting towards the, uh, the end. So Mark, Mark, please. Ooh, afternoon. <laughs> All right. <coughs> Can we start on the first slide, please? This is the last one. <coughs> Thank you. Okay, look, I want to talk about the foundation of this whole conversation. And it starts when our forebears settled the city. So please look at the first slide. And what you'll see is a map of Christchurch to be, a map made in 1848. And in the centre of the map, you can see the town of Stratford. They had to even put the name Christchurch in the right place. If you've got good eyesight, you'll see it's at the head of the harbour. It wasn't built there. But Stratford beside the River Avon, and in that surrounding area, the map is entirely blank. Well, except for the jewel of Rickerton Bush, which is the tiny piece just to the northwest corner of the location Stratford. And just to the north of that is another tiny patch of bush, Papua Nui bush, long erased from everyone's memories. And if you go down towards the Port Hills and you drill down on this map, you'll see other tiny remnants on, in the hills and further out on the peninsula edge of native bush, tall forest. But essentially Christchurch in its moment of creation was a blank slate. There were no trees hardly to speak of. It was a barren if you were into trees, you would have despaired coming here. And our early settlers were greatly challenged. The city was exposed to every element of weather without any protection, without any amenity, 
and the people who first settled the city were tree enthusiasts. Next slide, please. And an earth, this is a view from the Port Hills showing the city a few years after its establishment. Still a barren. You can just see Ripton Bush. You can just see Papanui Bush before it's erased. And beyond that, way across the plains, Wood End Forest, or Wood End. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and here we are today. Here's a view from Kashmir, looking across the city. It's an oblique view, and it looks like a continuous canopy. Wow, what an extraordinary achievement. In just under 175 years, the city landscape has been utterly transformed. Next slide, please. Now let's drill down on a bit of detail. Here's a, an Apawa street side image of tall introduced trees. Next slide, please. Here's a familiar view in, in, in our beautiful park where people can walk through and experience being amongst and underneath large, beautiful trees and with much colour. Imagine Christchurch without its autumn colours to cheer us as we face with some dread the onset of winter, which is rather tough. The colour our introduced trees, our big introduced trees, bring to the city help define its character and make it a pleasant place to live in. Next slide, please. And in winter, the large deciduous trees allow their light through. And if you're into trees, hey, you can look at the detail of their architecture, which is another impressive story. I just want to make the point that all trees, for the benefit of this planet, are native to the planet. And this notion, this rabbit hole of eco-sourcing, is actually ecologically a nonsense. We live in a world which, and we ourselves, all here, from diverse places, origins around the world. And this focus, this narrow focus, is a misleading conversation. Next slide, please. Here's an example of integration, a beautiful Kareru. It's surrounded, festooned, by wild rose, the blooms of wild rose. It's sitting on a silver birch. It happens to be in my garden. These, these beautiful birds and under, other wonderful birds will come back into our city if we have a sufficient presence of trees, of size, and stature which provide safe nesting, safe roosting, safe habitat for eating. And the kareru, incidentally, its favourite food, you must observe if you're into kareru at all, is the introduced tree lucerne, which came from the Canary Islands by accident with the very, very first ships that came to Christchurch because they put their livestock out to graze on the Canary Islands on their route to Christchurch in 1850. And that the wilding uh, tree lucerne around the city is a primary source uh, of food during the winter, tough months, for the Kareru. Okay, now through to my remainder of my presentation. How, how are we going there, Mark? How are we going for time? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, we're not doing too flash, but you're doing all right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Um, look, just in terms of this, the Christchurch Civic Trust and its concern about the future of the city and this wonderful opportunity with focusing on an urban forest plan, we urge a continuing emphasis on large trees of presence in the city and including introduced deciduous trees. We're also keen to see a refugia for rare trees in the world because the world's uh, freedom is under threat as well. And Christchurch is already an important refugia for some species which have become extinct in their places of but, origin. Thank you, Mark. That's, uh, have you got much more to go? 
a couple, just a couple of other things. Okay. We would also like to see in the red zone an arboretum of all the representing all the trees in the city, the full diversity of trees that we have. And look, right down to the bottom, I'll say this, that the public health benefits of tree cover are well known. Mm -hmm. And they're in proportion to the scale and size and, and density of the trees. And social equity requires increasing the benefit of tree cover for the entirety of the city. At present, we have the privileged, wealthy, leafy suburbs, which were predominantly treed early on. And we have a responsibility as a community to push for more presence of trees, greater presence of the trees across the entire city. And clearly, the benefits in terms of uh, climate resilience, addressing overheating in the urban yep. environment, yep. And carbon sequestration are part of that package as well. Thank Good. you. Hey, well done. And, and I enjo really enjoyed the history lesson of early Christchurch. So that was, that, that was very inspiring. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Garth, please. And then we've got one more after Garth. <coughs> yeah. uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr Mayor and councillors. You've heard uh, a number of presentations that are virtually macro-environmentally, but we're coming from a the point of view of micro environments. Um, so you, you received this extremely long document, but we see it as being extremely short on explaining how tree cover recommendations in the document are going to be delivered in an area such as ours, Central Rickerton, the area between Rickerton Road and Blenheim Road and from the railway line to Matapo Street. Um, we are particularly concerned that the so-called developers are going to be allowed to opt out and in return they just have to pay a sum of money unspecified. Now the key issue is how much money are they going to have to pay and what's going to happen to that money if, tree, if it's going to be used to plant trees somewhere else. Why aren't the trees going to be planted in the area they have been taken from? Now, Central Rickerton has been denuded of trees by these so-called developers. They have been allowed to come in and cut down every tree, every shrub, every bush, every blade of grass and replace it with concrete and gravel and stone chips and some bark. So uh, we've had three developments very close where there is actually no room for planting any trees at all. Double story uh, developments. In, for example, in 17 Dewey Street, there were trees lining the western boundary and the eastern boundary. There was plenty of room to put in a development between the, the boundaries. But they were, the first thing that happened was they were all cut down. Right? And what's happened? Okay, so a very fancy billboard was put up, enticing would-be buyers. Oh, it had trees on it. And a little, a little note underneath saying, oh, the final may not appear exactly as this, right? And so there's not even, not even a garage. There's actually only two car park spaces for four units. Now, the development could have taken place within the boundaries of those trees quite easily. But greed has overtaken the needs of the environment and the needs of the residents. So we're very concerned about this opt-out and also this idea that, other, that trees can be planted somewhere with the money, but where? So what, areas like ours? They just remain treeless. That is not a good environment for people to live in. Thank you, Garth. That, that's very clear. Has anyone got a question of Garth? No? Thank you very much for coming in. Good on you, bub. Okay. So the last one is Difford.
from Pep New Heritage Group. Welcome. Oh, uh, tēnā koutou, uh, ko David Williams, um, toko ingoa, uh, no Papa Nui toko kāinga. Um, so the Papa Nui Heritage Group, um, I've been listed late on this, so sorry councillors keeping you away from your, your lunch, um, but I usually bike with a group called the Wednesday Wheelies on a Wednesday, and uh, I've sacrificed that to be here today, so please take that, please take that into account. Uh, pardon? No, I caught a bus. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, the, the Papua Nui Heritage Group, we are, um, I was told not to say advocacy, but we, we are advocacy from, from time to time. Um, they're a group of uh, people really interested in, in the Papua Nui area. Um, people like my lecturer at university, Jim Gardner, uh, started them off in 2001. Um, this submission was put together by Margaret Lovell Smith and Murray Williams. Uh, who told me that I had to be at 11.15 to speak, um, but here I'm at 11.20 speaking, so that's that's all good. I was really interested in one of the questions that came up, um, because we're looking specifically at the Memorial Avenues as one of our big things, and communities can work together. Um, in fact, um, a couple of sad days ago, we were all raking our burns uh, to get the deciduous, sorry, Colin, um, uh, leaves onto the onto the road, and then then Monday the council comes and sweeps it all up, and it's all neat and tidy um, down there. Um, so the the Papua Nui Heritage Group, and and I guess Papua Nui, um, in terms of the picture that Mark put up there, uh, that the the Papua Nui bush is obviously part a very important part of our, our history, going back uh, to pre-European times, the Mahunga Kai Trail. Um, and the Papua Nui, uh, one of the meanings of Papua Nui are the platforms that um, that uh, mana whenua used to um, spear kereru and other birds uh, in that area. Uh, though between um, the early years of settlement, that was, as was pointed out, very little uh, forest there, so that was used for building. I think in the space of about six or seven years, that whole um, timber town uh, had removed the forest and it was put up as um, uh, created into a suburb. Uh, I was uh, one of the pictures too is that you can get an impression. Um, I worked for the press for a number of years and visiting one of my former school students, Kashmir High, Kamala Heyman, and looking at her office in um, Gloucester Street, it does look like a forest. It looked, you know, looking to our house in Times Road, you would think that there was a continuous forest. Uh, going right, 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 right across the city. Uh, so that 70 acres was was destroyed. Papua Nui, um, according to the the plan, we have uh, 15 percent. Uh, so we're doing pretty well. So you can probably get us up to 20 years um, really quick, Mr. Mayor. Um, and I've put on your uh, tables a invitation to the. Um, the, the uh, planting at which was the old Bridgestone um, Firestone factory and we've got a, a, an absolute, if some of you will have met him I'm sure, Dennis McMurtry uh, who is pretty much a live wire, he's involved in various Papua Nui groups including the Heritage Group and, and Rotary and putting it together to show what we can as a city do in terms of, of the planting so um, you're, you're, um, I think the Mayor is going to be there so you're all invited to that um, so we can get up to that 20% pretty pretty quickly. Um, I did like Colin's comments on the, the yellow on the kofi, that um, you know that may be something that could happen down the Memorial Avenues, but uh, please don't get rid of the deciduous trees first. Um, a point that Margaret has made, and it, I guess it's very easy for us all being NIMBYs, you know, not in my backyard, um, we've got a property next door to us that could be high rise. Uh, the plans we've seen are, are, are a couple of double story houses, uh, but who knows? And as I pointed out in that video, that trees are actually an important part of our infrastructure. That's how they should be thought about, um, not uh, nothing, nothing separate. So there are 15 memorial avenues, and in September 2022, the Papua Nui Heritage Group was delighted to learn that the city had recognised 15 Papua Nui Memorial Avenues through the trees and plaques by adding them to the district plan schedule of significant historic heritage for protection. 
So those 15 avenues were planted by returned soldiers after World War II, so they're an important part of our heritage. However, they have not been entirely protected. Right, Condal Avenue, uh, trees were removed uh, for a rest home at the um, Blyes Road end uh, and not replaced. Right, And that perhaps gives us uh, a vision and a little bit of fear about what will happen uh, to our area, such as the Cranford Basin, if there's a whole lot of housing that goes ahead uh, in terms of us uh, losing, losing trees. Um, so we'd like to raise a question about whether the council policies and plans are all compatible. So for example, the tree policy, the urban forest plan and the district plan, changes for housing intensification, we have a concern that some of Papua Nui's tree-lined streets, including that that adjoin the Memorial Avenues, may be vulnerable uh, to, to developers. Um, and as, as I stressed, we're, we're a local group um, made up of individuals who have a sense of ownership. Uh, and as I say, um, come and meet Dennis McMurtry, who provides us with the, the muscle and, and enthusiasm. Uh, he does a lot of work with local schools, Papua Nui High School and um, Papara Street, who are right on the Rutland Reserve, and numerous plantings uh, that he's done in both places there. Yep, so. Thank you. And I'm, lo I'm looking forward to coming along. Yep, thanks. Good. So thank you very much. It's right on time, so perfect. Okay. Thank you. So, we do indeed. We move to the report. Right, now we've got the um, item 11. Now, Mel has. Uh, um, declared a conflict with respect to the Summit Road Society submission. So thank you, Mel. Um, so with Urban Forest Plan, Toby and Andrew uh, rushing forward. So can, can I just check when you're proposing to have the lunch break? Have you got a time? It's just it's on the agenda. We're expecting lunch around one o'clock. Hi, Antonio. <coughs> Hello, councillors. Uh, we've also got Tony Armstrong, who's one of our arborists and our transport team with us, who are obviously a big part of this plan as well. We're just going to give you a quick um, run through of this presentation. Um, um, you've, you've seen it before, but there's a couple of updates there, including some questions that were asked um, in a briefing and also um, in the pre-council. And as always, I pushed the wrong button. So Toby will run through it um, again, um, just to highlight, and I guess mostly for the people who are listening in, the process, um, the results of the consultation, summary of the feedback and changes made to the draft, which are of course all highlighted in the current report. So Toby, fire away. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so just going over the process again, so we're at essentially the green box. So we've developed a plan it's gone out for public consultation. We've received the feedback. We've incorporated that into the plan with some changes. Um, we're at the point of adoption, all going well. And then the next part will be putting it through the LTP for the funding process. Uh, so consultation was open from the 2nd to this, uh, 2nd of Feb through to the 6th of March. Uh, our Have Your Say page received 2,800 plus views. Uh, Webinars had over 500 views during the consultation period and we received 290 submissions from individuals and groups. So the submissions that came through were largely in support. 82% um, of them were in support with feedback, uh, which we're going to go through, I suppose, the big topics of that feedback and you've also heard some of that through the deputations today. So the five key themes that came through were um, ideas on how we can increase canopy cover over the city, uh, a need or a want for greater tree protection, so retaining what we've already got, considering what kind of species that we plant, uh, increasing the targets and the time frame, or shortening the time frames, and um, how we can engage with the community, existing community groups already working towards these common goals. So you've got a copy of the updates to the plan. Um, some of the updates are just listed there. So we've uh, added some more uh, text around the inclusion of the red zone. 
Uh, there's additional actions added for uh, an additional action for adding new trees to the significant tree register. Uh, there is some strengthening focus on planting native species throughout the document. There's an acknowledgement that not all areas will suit trees for ecological reasons, and those areas need to be taken out of those targets. Um, there, as you saw and you've heard, there is, um, there's been feedback on the targets and whether they should be increased in the timeframes. Those haven't changed within the documents. Um, str we've strengthened the alignment with the EWI management plan. Uh, and there's some new, new actions added to investigate and implement programs for increasing and um, planting and retaining more on land. And then you'll see that some actions have been changed to funding, uh, funded, and that's because in between the time that the draft was developed and now we have had some of those things start, which means that it's now changed to funded. Apologies, are those changes in Big Tin Camp? Just yes. where are they? They're, on the yeah. they're, they're in the report. They're tracked <coughs> in the report? Yeah. You should see them as track changes. Yeah. Um, I'll do that. Uh, yeah. oh, okay. Sure. Um, so some questions have been raised, um, I guess, once we released um, the information back to the councillor. Um, in particular, um, Councillor Johansson, you raised a question around um, the continually assessing suburbs with low canopy cover to determine what can be done. So that action's changed. Um, and um, as Toby mentioned, with the allocation between drafting the plan um, and now, of the uh, Crown better off funding to this program, um, we, we're now able to commence. Um, sorry, and what I should point out is, of course, we're going to continually assess the work that we do going forward right across the city. Um, I've covered, covered off that one as well. Um, and how many submissions um, related to the potential loss of sunlight? Um, 10 out of the 290, so around about 3% um, of the 300 odd. Um, obviously, people in Christchurch are very conscious of getting enough light in winter in particular. Um, and the other th part of that was uh, consultation with local community regarding species. And, and I think everything we've heard this morning really reflects um, Toby's earlier um, slide and, and these, these matters. So as councillors know, planting schemes will be developed prior to planting on any public land. Um, we've explained to councillors, but perhaps not, uh, or we, we certainly presented in the webinars and we presented um, at the university symposium on using a recession plane approach to trying to ensure that people weren't negatively impacted um, too much by too much light on their properties. Um, and of course, the appropriate delegations um, need to be exercised pre-planting, which all, all sit with the community board. Um, so the community boards will see all of the planting plans for approval prior to implementation. Uh, I think I mentioned last week, you'll get quite a raft of them initially because, because it's going to take us a couple of years to get some material ready. Um, no doubt um, the community will want to engage pretty actively certainly in the, in the early days, with what the outcome might be in their local parks or streets. Um, there was a question around how was the plan developed um, across council, presumably meaning within council. Um, these are the teams that, that were involved in the plan. We had, lots, uh, we had two or three uh, cross council workshops that were really well attended by multiple departments, um, which really just, I guess, highlighted how important everyone believes um, this topic is. I th think that's it. So mm -hmm. we're now open to questions. Woohoo! <coughs> right. Oh, I always start on this side. I always give Kelly favouritism, so I'll start on this side. <laughs> um, <laughs> Melanie, then um, Sarah, then Tyler. Um, to 
different questions. The first one, um, just around the fund. Sorry, could you just speak up a little? Sorry. Sorry, there's two there's two questions I've got. One's around the um, the funding that we sort of talked about earlier. So um, I see that um, for the ones that have um, funding required, that's for the long term plan period going forward. Is that correct? That's correct. And anything that's for the next financial year is already funded. Correct. Well. That's correct. Yep. Yeah. There's no funding required in the current annual plan deliberations. Okay. And then the other one is um, on page 167, there's the um, the different targets, and um, that talks about the different land use types and having different targets for each one, which makes a lot of sense. I was just wondering if you could speak to two of those. One was um, the street space. Um, and the other one was the rural, and I just wanted to understand that a bit better. Um, and also why it says about excluding the expenditure, and if you can talk to that. Yep. Uh, so when determining, um, from a broad level, when determining what those targets would be, we took into account uh, the land use. So for street, there's a lot of stuff already happening in that, so there's not as great a capacity. We also looked at what the current canopy is. So uh, working with the university and a report they produced, and they, they talked about measures of success with other cities around the world, and they looked at cities and things that had targets that were greatly over 100% and how they really struggled to ever achieve them or get close to that target. So we took those things into account um, when determining what those increases were going to be. And then we worked with the so we worked with the transport unit as well about how that fifteen percent sat. Um, with the rural, it was a similar thing. Um, there's a lot of farmland and things. Uh, we looked at the current canopy cover and um, basically what we thought there might be capacity for as a target for us to work towards. Mm -hmm. So I would have sorry, as we heard um, earlier too um, from Federated Farmers. Um, the action is to now commence the rural, a look at the rural forest plan, um, and those targets may well change. Um, I think it's really clear that we need to engage quite quite heavily with um, with the rural sector and all of the groups involved in looking after that land um, to make sure that they're realistic. So. Um why does this exclude Banks Peninsula? Sorry, and then Banks Peninsula, so we didn't have, when we did the city, we had a lot of really good base data from canopy cover surveys. We didn't have that for Banks Peninsula. Mm. And we also realised that there's a lot of active groups out there doing a lot of stuff, and we wanted to engage with them, and we knew that that would take more time. Mm. So we didn't want to delay what was happening in the city for us to work with that. We, we realised that probably needs a different approach to the way the city functions, and we wanted to ensure we got that right. Yep, so, so just one more, but with the rural, um, so with um, that projected 15% by 2070, is that you looking at the land that we know that's maybe not in private ownership, but in, well, <coughs> it's in, um, it's owned by either council or by um, organisations that do planting and things like so, that? So it's all based on our uh, planning maps yeah. and what that land is zoned on. Right. Yeah. So Thanks. it will be a mixture. Sarah? Oh, thank you. Um, so leading on from that, just with the Banks Peninsula, that rural thing we heard from Fed Farmers, um, is without altering the wording in the document and bits and pieces and amending it today, uh, is someone able to just get back to them and clarify for them that the reason they weren't particularly engaged is because there will be a different plan for that area and that they will be involved, because I think that would help ease that concern that they had. That would be really good. Um, so that, that action is scheduled for um, the, the next after this. financial year. Yeah. So absolutely. Yeah, yeah, but just letting them know ahead of time yeah. would be great. Um, so the, the several submissions, well, a few submissions and a couple of the speakers today both mentioned the... Um, the pest, the nature, nature of pest species, both um, flora and, and fauna. Um, and I'm just wondering if one of the, in goal three, we could add, you know, an appropriate pest control. And while that may not necessarily be the biggest thing, like in the urban, urban area, it will be on the, you know, the Port Hills and through the Otago Avon River Corridor, those kind of things. And what would you feedback on that? 
Um, yep, absolutely. And we do, um, we're very mindful of pest management with all the programs that Paul Devlin and his team lead in the Port Hills. It's a big part and a challenging part of any restoration work. Um, we also heard from some really good dialogue around the desire to bring food into our park yeah, environment. that's another point. And, and, just... and so finding the balance, because that brings pests, yes, yes. so finding the balance is actually the, the key yeah. challenge. Yeah. I'm just wondering if um, in, in to achieve goal three, we had like a, it was 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, um, and maybe a 3.4 that said um, with appropriate pest management or something like that. So um, we... And I know that, you know, there's a, a new, um, you know, Peninsulas yeah. come into the city, and there's going to be a pest-free sure. city and stuff. It's something that we'll um, we'll have a close look at for the long-term plan. Yeah, the funding for that. Yeah, but I'm just thinking actually in the document itself. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the other one was resourcing and and the targets. So there's been some commentary about the targets not being ambitious enough. I think the one area I think that we've seen where the benefits will be the the strongest for that community um, space is in the street trees. And I know that's a really tough space to do it, but that's the one area I think that we're particularly unambitious in. And without changing the overall target, I'm just wondering why by 2070, for example, we couldn't go from 9% over 40 years to say 20% when we know the huge benefits that the street trees particularly are going to give to us with a, with a heating urban environment. Um, look, we. We were mindful of not setting overly ambitious targets, and some of the numbers that were quoted by submitters today were from cities who um, have quoted overly ambitious targets and are now realising they cannot achieve them. Yeah, but I'm thinking so, 20 sorry, I just, not 50. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> and I think it's, it's obvious to all that the street environment is the most challenging, and so more work needs to be done in terms of planning, infrastructure design standards, um, analysis of cost to bring to council so that the targets are realistic. Because but I was thinking that by we don't want to set a target it's unrealistic. and it fail. It's as yeah. simple as that. Yeah, but we won't know in t for another 50 years on that one. Um, no. Yeah. I mean, no, we can model, the, ta we can model the targets yeah. and we can model, with more work, we can model the cost of achieving those targets. I'm just thinking that process-wise, to change that target target because it is in the document, would need a whole review of the, the actual plan. Whereas if we put the slightly slightly more ambitious 2070 target just for street trees in now, if you did decide it was easier, then we could, you know, we wouldn't need to bring the whole plan back and review it to change that target. Um, look, I think any plan should be reviewed, a plan like this, a network plan probably should be reviewed, whatever that review looks like, probably every five years. Mm. Um, uh, and I yes. think that's probably the right time to, you know, that gives us time to tackle some of these more challenging issues and bring more meaningful information back to the table. Mm. So I, I sort of resist changing the targets right now until we've got some facts and some data for you. Because we don't want to put something in that's unachievable, unrealistic. Well, it might sound nice now mm. and be cheerleading, but can we actually do it? It's only 20%. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Tyler? It's doubling. We are currently doubling. Yeah. Good, guys. Um, just a couple of questions. So is this a living document? Yes. So, living in the sense that um, <coughs> it's a framework. It's a planning framework, and that's how it should be looked at. It should be it should be built on year on year on year, and as I say, brought back to council to reconsider how we're going. Are we getting it right? What do we need to tweak? But we don't intend to have to re restart the whole process. Yep. Okay. I just wanted to ask about the tree protection mechanisms, <coughs> particularly in Rickard and Garth. Actually, brought up a really interesting point in regards to developers. Can you talk to us about what regulations are currently will will potentially be in place with this new plan? It's actually well, it's probably John. Uh, hello, <laughs> would you like to? That's a tough question. Sorry, I apologise. Yeah, yeah, no, that's sorry. all right. No, it's it's not our expertise, so I wouldn't even go there. Um, it is probably a district plan matter because we are looking at the um, permitted uses on private land. There is no blanket protection for existing trees on private land. 
So while we don't like seeing it, developers at the moment have got every right to cut the trees down. I'm not saying that I subscribe <laughs> to, the, to that particular yeah. approach, but um, I think it would, would we, we thought about it. We considered the idea of protecting existing canopy on existing land uh, so that the developers don't cut everything down. But it was pretty much unenforceable. And we, yeah. um, it probably would be viewed very much as a draconian encroachment on private property rights to protect those trees, unless they are historic heritage and that protection, uh, that tree has been scheduled in, uh, with the agreement of the owners. Just for mine and the public's knowledge, what defines a heritage tree? Uh, I can well, yeah. answer that. So <laughs> totally we've there. got an assessment methodology for determining that, uh, but largely it generally comes down to 100 years plus or a historic event associated with that tree. Mm. Okay, so... Historic is separate to significant, though. Yeah. 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 I'm, so, see, I'm seeing multiple avenues in which we might be able to protect our trees even further in regards to heritage. Oh, I know that oh. development gets hindered through trees that are in, you know, in, in an interesting position. Um, I, I completely understand that, but I'm wondering, I mean, Clyde Road is a prime example of um, developers knocking down trees without, you know, they're quite substantial ones too, um, and putting in different development there. I'm just wondering what levers can we pull to try and protect their tree canopy cover and ones that have really low tree canopy cover? Yeah. And in that instance, the argument is we're trying to um, up tree canopy cover through private properties. We know this. We need the private sector to come along with us on the ride. But there also needs to be measures, and I thought that this would be the measure, but obviously the district plan might be the new avenue to go down. Am I correct in the, thinking that? The RMA, which determines the district plan, okay. is, yeah, is uh, where those restrictions come in. So blanket protection has been taken out of the RMA. So mm. we can't do blanket protection. So we need to, there's certain criteria we have to meet under the RMA for our district plan as well. Okay, and in regards to contributions, if they, I, do, I, I can't remember what briefing I heard this in, if they knock down a tree, then they contribute yes. to the council to go towards more tree canopy cover? So this is, this is still a proposal. Obviously, we'll, we have just closed the submission period and will be further submission period on, on, the, on that plan change, plan change 14. Yes. Um, and obviously all that is subject to a hearing and council decisions afterwards. But the proposal at the moment is to require that every property, private property that is being newly developed contains 20% tree canopy cover, taking into account that that 20% may not be achieved until the tree is mature. Now, the idea behind it is that if there are existing trees on the property, that those trees can be used towards the 20% tree canopy cover. Yeah. Um, again, it's up to the owners to either do that or cut the trees because they are in the way of a new building and plant new trees. So or it could be a combination of... That's around 30K, right? The financial contributions are only required if the 20% is not met. Mm. So if somebody mm. chooses to have, say, 10% uh, tree canopy cover on site, but they want to pay for the extra 10%, then we collect that money and plant the trees once we have enough and we have an identified area as close as possible to the to the site where development is occurring. So it's the idea is to... Um, uh, provide an env environmental benefits through planting trees as close to this site, development site as possible. Okay, okay. That's all the questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mark, please. It's a very short question, I imagine, Mark. <laughs> we'll see. <clears throat> ah, thank you. Um, just really keen to, to follow up down the track with the um, district plan team, I guess, to try and work with developing you know, some plans towards protecting trees. So, you know, had that on notice, I guess. Um, interestingly, one of my very early experiences as a surveyor was surveying trees to protect on a property so that we could subdivide and build around the trees, which can be done. Um, on to other matters. Um, I heard you mention community boards for approving um, a lot of these plans. 
will there also be, I guess, chances for community boards to input at the front end of that process to then have those plans developed for their areas? Um, I actually wrote a note um, listening to one of the submitters, actually, that, that you guys sitting in your community boards have probably got a much better idea of how to prioritise lower areas in particular. Yep. Um, yeah, so absolutely. We, we, we can put a call out to community boards to identify yep. um, which parks and mm -hmm. perhaps streets you'd like to see planning focused on. Yep, which would be really pertinent in my Hornby patch being one of the lowest canopies to um, pick oh. up on that. With the Hornby bush being mentioned in Broomfield Common for one is one that I'd really like to work on pretty early yeah. on. So. Sure. Okay. Um, um, then also really interested to hear your plans around um, empowering the sort of voluntary sector um, to help with increasing the growing capability of, of say nurseries and, and so forth. Yeah. I hope you've got that in hand as part of this plan. Yeah, so look, in particular, um, you know, we, we hope that with creating these comprehensive planting tree plant canopy planting models, we'll be able to really activate interest in local communities and get them involved in the planting. But as importantly, as we always hear, um, it's the aftercare that we we really struggle with and it has a, you know, it has a higher cost. So it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity. Yep. And I guess with some of that voluntary sector would be, say, you know, secondary schools and primary schools to it's have the whole gamut, yeah. on board would be great for looking at The easiest well. ones to catch are usually the, the primary school kids. Teenagers are a bit more challenging, but um, okay, very thank, capable. Very thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, if you can keep your questions pertinent. Uh, yeah, keep the questions on task, please. Pauline, you're next. Because um, there's a lot of people here waiting to see what's going on, and I think the vast majority of people are going to... Um, support it anyway, I can't see it not. So, not that I'm telling people what to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just had a, a couple of questions that came through the Otsutaki Housing Trust, and one of them was that they thought the 20% canopy cover uh, for medium density residential was too high. Um, so can you explain um, why you think it's not? Um, look, we've got a set of target, and Toby can give you the detail, but we've got a set of target for the city, and that's the 20% target overall. Toby, do you want to elaborate? Yeah, but that's so not per property necessarily, is that what you're saying? This is where we... Um, so these targets are over the whole of the land type, so the 20% is over all residential, so some will be higher, some will be lower. That's that's what we're aiming for for the whole city by 2070. Um, the, mm -hmm. the rules around Plan Change 14 um, is a different thing, which talks about that 20%, which would be the medium density housing Right, component. okay, that's good, I can explain it to them. And thanks, and the other thing is, the, they talk about the costs are disproportionate, and they mentioned $45,000 per tree. What does, do you know what? Yeah, so that's not part of the urban forest plan, that's the calculation through that plan change 14, okay, which great. Then <coughs> those details start. will that's come through as part of That's yeah. good. And I had a question about the pest um, management as well, wondered if that strategy could be rolled into this one at some point. So rather than being two because they're so with, linked, aren't they? With the pest things, we do have the tree policy, which has a whole lot of uh, things around pest and weed species. Yep. Um, we talk about ensuring that we've got appropriate species. We talk about looking after things in the urban forest plan, um, that aftercare, which will all entail that pest management as well. Uh, we've got the biodiversity strategy. So just because it's not specifically listed in here doesn't mean that it's No, I know, but I mean, it would be one less strategy, wouldn't it, if it's set inside. Yeah. Anyway, that's just something for the future. Yeah. Thank you. Righto. Um, just two wee questions from me, just quickly. Um, the, what the Federate, and this is probably in there, and I haven't read it all, but and this is mainly for the people watching, the Federator's Farmers um, question, is that sort of taken into account a little bit? Yep. As I mentioned, you know, it's an action to kick off in the new financial year. Yep, no and problem. The first thing no. we'll be doing is engaging with yep, them. Yep, yep. No problem. And this doesn't, this policy, this urban policy, doesn't stop the removal of trees and booms if they're causing significant damage to services. There's still a way through that. Yes, yeah, it okay, doesn't. Excellent. Yep. Um, Yana, you had a question? Yes, um, several. Um, so I just wanted to check um, with the better off funding that we got, given the submissions that we've heard today around doing more, can we use the better off funding to fund the plan change? to increase the number of significant trees in the tree register? Uh, that's a, not a question for me, really. 
Um, we don't do plan change. We'd have to allocate the funding back to council to reallocate. Sorry, the, well, can I just get clarity on the money that we've received? Because a number of projects have now been funded, and I understand we got better off funding. How do we prioritise how that better off funding gets spent in regards to the tree policy? Oh, sorry, the tree, the urban tree plan. So the better off funding has been allocated to employing staff to start planting trees. The, re the residual funding is then applied to the initial um, planting schemes and get them moving. So once it, that better off, that's all the funding, the better off funding is being applied to right. for um, this work. And then beyond that, which is after year three, we will be hitting, um, we'll need to fund it through the LTP. Right, so given the sense of urgency that people have raised with us around what's happening with private development um, and the request to do more and be bolder, if we wanted to get additional trees protected through the district plan change, can we get how much that would cost? That's already underway. So we're about to come out and start look, listing, uh, putting out, asking for more trees who, right. uh, to be nominated. So that's okay. coming through soon. We've talked about that. I, I think the concern is that in the plan it's yeah. unfunded. Uh, not plan change 14, but the planning department already have that on the go. Yeah, so that's... So that work's already underway. And the other thing I understood is that it's the underway. Ministry for it's the underway. Environment was looking to change the policy around, or well, the process around protecting trees. Where did we get to? That's that? still a work in progress. So we haven't got there okay. yet. Is that okay. all good, Jan? Um, no, just want to some of the other concerns that have been raised in the deputations. Um, the increase of edible plantings, have you um, put any um, feedback or resolution into the actions around um, having greater visibility of what we do around edible plantings? No. Could we, how could we, what's the best way to do that? I mean, I've made a note here as an amendment that the Healthy Food Action Plan action to increase edible plantings be incorporated as an action, would that so I think the, be okay? the urban forest plan facilitates more fruit trees being planted through, you know, if we want more trees planted. So that would allow more fruit trees to be planted. Um, as far as those planting edible forests, there's already people who come to community boards <coughs> to set that up and set those plantings up. It's so already, it's already happening. It's already in training. We, had a, we, Sorry, we, we would expect we had a deputation the best way for us. that to happen would be for the members of the community to come forward to their boards and yep. then to us. Yeah. Do it through but that avenue. Rather than us try and plan or scheme something. We've already had this on our, our board. We yeah. just had a deputation, to a submission to this today that asked if we could put a target in around edible planting, right? So but I'm just the asking. The, sorry, the avenue is to, rather than force people mm -hmm. to do it, is to let them use the system to come through and suggest it to you guys and you'll help them. I think the submitter, it's, the submitter also mentioned that some of them hadn't been successful because the local community hadn't engaged strongly enough. I think that's the key. There's got to be that ground-driven desire, not a council-led on, on those um, community gardens because they are so heavily reliant on the community. I, I get that, but setting a target as part of an urban forest plan around increasing edibles... The target should be what the community want, not us mm -hmm. setting a fake target okay. Um, okay. is what I'm trying to say. And just the telecommunications provider, the, the, the submission from Spark, did you have any reflection on how they could be incorporated into um, a review of infrastructure design standards or were uh, they we, in, engaged as part of the development <coughs> plan? We didn't engage Spark necessarily, but we did try to engage with Enable uh, and through the tree policy we talked about uh, design around infrastructure and things. So. The concerns raised by Spark are addressed in multiple other documents, and when we update the design standards, that's always looked into as well. Right, and you engage with them as part of that process. Uh, I don't personally do the design standards, yeah, but, but we can the organisation sure does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And just the final question from me is: given like um, that, we've had pretty much overwhelming submissions from people wanting us to be bolder and do more. Um, if we wanted to increase the targets for both timing and percentage of increasing tree canopy cover in the areas with the lowest coverage, what, what could we do? Sorry, can you? The best advice I would give is let's get on with it, get something in the ground and, and start measuring and monitoring and then see where we're going to get to. Fantastic answer. Yeah. Great. Now, <laughs> Victoria's got a very small question. Sarah's happy to move it with a couple of amendments and Mark's going to second it. So, Victoria. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, th thank you, Andrew. Most of my questions were, have already been asked, but I've just got one residual oh. one for Andrew. Oh, I'm just waiting until I've got his attention. I'm just not comfortable because I haven't talked to him. Please I know he's busy. Yeah. 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 Andrew, I've, I've just got one further question, which is residual uh, from Sarah's questions, and it relates to the amendment that Sarah's yeah. Councillor Templeton's put up. We're going to get an opportunity to debate that. I'm, I'm concerned that we don't know enough about the implications of raising that target to 20%. And I, have you got any further advice for us before we consider that, particularly around the cost of the implication, perhaps the resourcing, the deliverability, the effect that increasing target may have on your capacity at your nursery? Is there anything else that you can give us today to help us deal with this amendment? It's, it's, um, it's very... It's pretty difficult, to be honest, until we start yeah. looking really hard at um, infra infrastructure design standards for different parts of the city. I mean, the standards that are being applied to new subdivisions are quite different to how we have to approach brownfields developments and so forth. I don't think we can add a lot, Toby. Um, yeah, I mean, the other thing is... We talk a lot about ensuring that the trees we plant have the space to grow and things, which will take, you know, that also has an impact on the number of planting and things, but it means that we get healthier trees through to maturity and bigger canopy cover. Um, the 15% is pretty much double what we've currently got, uh, and we will be reviewing the plan and we'd have an idea of what that impact would be at that point. The flip side is you could go, well, yeah, put a 20% target there, a bit and review it again in five years and it may have to come down or it could stay. So I guess it's it's a matter of materiality at this point. Um, I think one thing that's not lost on everyone though is how important that environment is and how important it is to get it right. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I'll make them really quick. There's two and they're on the amendment. Do you guys all like trees? That's why. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but not that one. Right, okay, so yeah. then the other question is, be, why didn't you make it 20%? Uh, so it was in consultation with the transport unit and basically looking at what those success successes look like overseas and where it kind of got to a point where it became difficult and that increasing by 100% seemed to be like the upper limit of where places right. started to... Right, so your struggle. recommendation was based on what you believe is the best outcome for the city and, and you and you guys all want to increase the canopy don't you not not necessarily the best outcome it's it's aligned to what we believe is achievable with our current understanding right which may change as we start and move forward yeah fair yeah okay cool that makes sense So just while the guys are having the conflab down there, we've got two amendments from Sarah, but we've also got a raft of amendments from Jan. Do we want to carry on or do we want to stop for lunch and come back in an hour? I thought we had to do that for money. Yeah. Okay. Yes, so we've, we've got yours incorporated because you moved and you had a seconder. Yes, but um, keep going. Because people are waiting. Well, people are waiting. They're all here. So they've gone to the effort of being here. Can't hear you. I think staff are going to need time to be able to give advice, particularly on the amendments from Yanni. So right. They need, they need time to have staff advice on this. Number B. On 3B, yeah. Yeah, yeah, these ones. Well, they no, sure, this is serious ones. on these. Yeah. We're okay. going to need time. We've got what well, we're going to have to have staff advice on Yanni's amendments, so we are going to stop for lunch. And we will be back here at half past two. Yep. No. Which is PX. And then we'll do this after, after PX. The PX. Yes. Okay. Two o'clock. Two o'clock. I can't guarantee that.
We're just going to rip into PX. Just confirm we're off, offline. Yep. Resolution to exclude. We have to um, move into PX, of course, do we yes, not? Yes, we do. And thank you, Pauline, and thank you, Kelly, for moving all those in favour. I'll put the motion all in favour. Okay, thank you, carried. So, uh
Andrew and team. Um, have you got any advice for us on the uh, Yanni's amendments that you can probably see? There. Um, look, we're happy. That it's not our advice, but we're happy for them to to be voted on. Um, in terms of the first one, uh, the planning team is intending to put up a bid in the long-term plan for this work. They're doing all the early work now and can't really comment much on the rest. Okay, so you're happy with that? So I will ask Yanni if he's got a seconder. Second. Tyrone. Right. So we now, we got, we don't, oh, we got questions or debate? Mm. How far, we never really did questions, did we? Yeah. The, the substantive has been, yeah. It would need to be part of the LTP. <coughs> it should be reflected in the <coughs> amendment. So, do, do we do these ones now? Yes, right. we do the amendments first. Well, <coughs> yes. well, well, Sarah's amendments are part of the substantive, That's so we've correct. got to do Yanni's amendments, which, um, is there any questions, discussion, anything on that? No. So we just need to reword one the of the the num the Yes. No, no, you're going down, you need to go back up. Number one, uh, number two. Consider. No, request that the council consider funding the district plan change as part of the long term plan. Unfortunately, you won't be able to put that in the annual plan this late. Okay, so, so if you change, if we got the words changed to what Yanni is after, or do you want to leave it at that, Yanni? It'd have to be the LTP. So the amendments have been moved and seconded. So unless the mover and seconder agree to changes, this is what's on the table currently. Okay. Happy to get a report back on it, but I don't want to wait for the LTP because by that stage, you know, it'll be delaying it even more. So, do, should I just request a report that, yeah, request that council seek a report on how? Well, if it needs to be a decision, then it needs to be a report. So, request that council. Um, seek a report on how it could fund the district plan change to add additional trees to the significant tree register as a priority. And then it's simple. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Is, that, is that it? Is that, yeah. you happy with that, Yanni? Yeah. Oops, we're changing something there. Otherwise, yep. Okay. <clears throat> Do with anyone want to debate this? Sarah. Does number three need to be more specific for staff? It just says increase them, um, but it doesn't say what to, or is it, I'm not quite sure what you're after, Yanni, is it putting, taking it from some areas and putting it in others, or, because staff won't be able to action it if they don't know what it means. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, so, I interpret that as, um, you know, council would like to see advice on how we can fund adding more trees to the significant tree register. No, no, the next one. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Oh, sorry, I thought you said two. Sorry. You, your report covers all of this, which is very good. I thought. Yeah. Look. Um, well, it's the, the plan is not that specific down to yeah. a suburb by suburb level. It hasn't set individual targets for individual suburbs. It's set a minimum for all. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you want? And I mean, I'm happy to that chuck some percentages. It's prioritising low canopy areas, mm -hmm. which you have said you will do. So, yeah, what you're after is the areas that have a low canopy That's in the plan already, no. Councillor Templeton. Mm. It's already there. Everything's all. We don't need. <laughs> we, we we have the targets, so mm. so um, we'll put it. Yeah. 
Right. Yeah. So this is what I raised in the workshop. Can we have some targets? And we, do you want me just to say that we set targets? Is that better? There's no I mean, use setting targets. As we heard from the staff, you know, it's got to be by and by communities. And I think the plan is really good how it's set out. They've said that about the fruit trees and other things. So, no. Staff have been clearing their advice. Andrew, in relation to number three, because there isn't any specificity to it, understanding that the plan already states that it will do low canopy areas as a priority, mm -hmm. is it that that is reconfirming that requirement? How would we go about meeting number three? Um, well, Aims actions three. rather than words. Yeah. Um, getting on with it. They are prioritised. We've already started the process of prioritising um, these locations, getting the board to approve those and getting them in the ground. And, and you know, and it's three to four years before we can start monitoring where that's going to go. That's right. So, uh, Melody's the more come up. Melody's postulating we do, the yeah, you do longer it's yeah. going to take. I just want the staff to finish their yeah. advice before we jump to the next one. Yeah. I just wondered if you could add the word aims to increase, because I think we'd all agree with that. Because yeah. it's non-specific, that clause. If you well, put it's not, sorry, it's not very clear. Are, are, we, are you asking us to have higher targets for low canopy areas oh, than mine. other areas? Mm. <laughs> or are you asking us to raise the minimum uh, I, I'm, entire city. Like, yeah, raise, you could do that if, if that's easier. If you look in the charts that we've got, and again, this is why I rate it at the workshop, is there any targets we have around these actions? There's none. There is one that is currently unfunded um, or says funding required. So, again, it's kind of hard without having the specific targets. But based on what people have said through the, de the submissions, People want us to be bolder and do more, right? So I want to send a signal that we're going to do more. So if you want that just to be um, increasing the tree canopy cover targets um, across the board, and we can refer to the, just add 10% to the ones in uh, page 167. Um, so just to increase the targets over a sooner period of time. It's unclear as to the council's put up amendments. He's now trying to relitigate own amendments well, as I understand right. it. Yeah. I just wonder whether we should take five minutes and maybe the staff... Good. We took, what happened was we took five minutes to get our head around this and then all of a sudden we've got it here in front of us and it's getting changed yeah. again. So it's making us look a bit daft. Yeah. I wonder whether so, whether shall we take five minutes and get Yanni to get exactly what he wants on the screen and then we can vote for it, yes or no? How's that? OK, five minutes. Thank you.
Well, I'm scared to say welcome back because I don't know what's going to happen next. <laughs> <laughs> we have now we have now got all the amendments ad, ad, um, added into the, the substantive. So we've talked about this for hours and on end. So I'm just going. We have a mover, which is Sarah, and a seconder, which is um, Mark. Um, so I'm going to put in motion. Oh, we just say thank you. <laughs> th nice. Thank you for all for putting up with us. <laughs> thank you. So I'll put this motion. All those in favour? Aye. Against? Hallelujah. Thank you. <laughs> we actually have an urban tree farm. Right. Now. Yeah. Right. <laughs> on the main uh, We are now. Not as emotions. Okay. And more to come. So we are now on to item number 15, and Mr Macdonald is going to give us the benefit of his past experience. Um, well, thank you, just very briefly, <coughs> with this one. Hopefully this is the less of two contentious notices of motion. Um, I wouldn't say two eagles, no. I'm not about you than that. The, um, the, look, the reality with this is it's effectively just calling for a bit of a, re a review into the way in which our temporary management delegations operate. Um, I think at a high level, when uh, if you think about the mechanism that we're using to do this, it's a notice of motion, which is uh, something that any councillor can bring to the table, provided it's consistent with the, the rules to get it here, uh, calling on a um, you know particular action to be taken. I think this is kind of the thing that you know we probably could have. Um, you know, I, I think it needs to be workshopped through with the council in conjunction with the chief executive. And I think the real benefit of it is it actually will put a, a very clear line in the sand um, between what sits at the council desk and what sits with council staff uh, to, to get to a situation. So I'm hoping that uh, others will indulge me in terms of just having this looked at uh, so that actually we don't end up in situations um, you know, like potentially here. But I just think it's incumbent on all of us when we do identify issues and to use the notice of motion process to do that. And, and to bring something forward. So, um, yeah, at a really high level, I just think it would be good to get some clarity around those rules uh, and, and what we uh, do in terms of what we delegate to council staff. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of kind of it, really. Okay. And there's obviously staff advice attached. So, mover. He's a mover. Yeah. He's a seconder. You must have a second. Yeah. We've already got that. We have a question? We've got Mayor quest at the table for oh, questions. Oh, sorry. And yeah. <laughs> you're quite right. And we have got... a. Uh, Andre has a slight amendment which uh, just took, which the team have got. Sorry, Andre, I should have mentioned that. was that. one from yesterday, wasn't it? Yeah, that was mm. one from yesterday, and we've we just incorporated it in. Uh, but it requires, I think, half of the council to vote to include it in the, the majority, majority to, to do it. 51%. So. To accept the amendment, yeah. And then vote. So you'd vote to accept the amendment, then vote on the amendment. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Just waiting for it to come so up. So we'll just get it up and then we can highlight it so everyone's aware. It's just adding a bit of work to, the, um, to it. So you want to add that to. Yeah, so there's, there's, again, there are, there's, there's two parts to it. There's why don't you put it as A and B? Well, no, well, I mean, if people don't want it included, they can just vote down accepting the amendment to the. Notice the motion. So, let's, yeah. oh, so, so where are we at? We're now with questions. Can I just check clarity of the road closures bit? I'm assuming that you mean temporary road closures because anything that's a formal road closure goes through a really full extensive process. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, all I don't know. Andre, do you want to add something to yours, maybe? Just so that. Yeah, yeah, I should. But what I'm on about here. Well, uh, and so a number of weeks ago I put forward a notice of motion asking for this, but the notice of motion was declined. The reason cited that um, we already get sent Starwick notices, if we already got sent them all, I wouldn't be asking for it in the first place, but we don't get sent Starwick notices for all road closures. So in some cases we might have a road close for a number of months. Um, we don't necessarily get notified of it. We'll find out when a resident might come ask us a question. We can't answer it because we haven't been sent any information about it. The website may not tell us the information we need. Hence, we have to tie up a lot of time with going to the Chief Executive Office to ask for questions that we could have been answered if we were given the Starwick notice in the first place. So there's an efficiency to be found here. Um, I could list you about five or six road closures in my area. They're main thoroughfare roads, 
but because they don't have anyone necessarily living directly on where the road is closed, there won't be a letterbox drop done. Um, but there's no notification sent to any elected members, um, and therefore the public aren't communicated with either, despite it being a road that they use every day. So all I'm asking for here is we find a way that when roads are going to be closed, it just flicks a note through, uh, full warning, to elected members, so then when residents ask them, they will know the answer, and also so elected members can communicate that with the public at no cost to the rate part. So I'm offering to help with communications for free. Pretty good deal. Good, good request. Sarah. Thanks. Um, question for Mary. Um, thank you for the advice on this. There's a, a lot of work that goes into the temporary traffic management. How much, is, um, how much staff time will be taken up um, by the transport team doing a full review of all of the, all of the traffic management um, planning stuff? Um, and will that potentially impact the delivery of things like surf and craft and those kind of things that staff are also currently working on? Uh, uh, interpretation is that this is not a full review of the entire temporary traffic management system. That uh, it um, appears that some councillors were unaware of the scope of the traffic management when they passed the delegation or gave the delegation to the CE that was then passed down to our officers. And it was in particular what councillors were unaware of was the things around trials and pilots. Yep. So it is that um, area that we are proposing, as you'll see in the advice, is the area that we focus on in the review and uh, look at that area and see what is the best process for that. Um, if the <coughs> councillors wanted to review the entire process and uh, have a greater input, it would ground the city to a halt because you'll see that there's uh, about average of a week um, 2,700 traffic management plans. If we were to write reports and bring those to you to decide you would be meeting in here every day and, uh, and having to make decisions, and we know how challenging that can be at times. <laughs> so so, so uh, we, we are not interpreting, we're just interpreting, reviewing yep. that portion of it that the councillors have signalled that they were not aware was in the scope mm. when they made the delegation. So, do you believe that the delegations themselves specify that? It's just that councillors weren't aware of it at the time. Uh, I d the d uh, delegation is not, uh, doesn't specify in detail that. It talks about temporary traffic management as delegated. Uh, the interpretation from our legal people is, uh, from external legal advice, is that pilots and trials are within the scope of temporary. Uh, but that may not have been apparent to councillors when they made that delegation. OK, thanks. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry, Tim and then Jake. Yeah, um, just, uh, Andre, are, are all the roads council roads that you're getting the information, the, the, the breakdown is, or is it, is, is it a mix, or...? Oh, they're all council roads, yeah. OK. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so we so so councils are aware that they're closed. It's just that they don't generally um, necessarily generate a start work notice like council works might. Because yeah, um, so, so Mary, I'm a bit confused because in all the years I've been here, I haven't there hasn't been an issue, or I've never realised an issue. And I don't want to speak for my colleagues on the Sprayed and Kashmir Heathcote Community Board, but I think the information to us on temporary road management is actually very, very high. So I don't think, um, Sarah or, or Melanie, that we've ever really had an issue with this. So I, I'm just a bit confused of... So that, that's, I think that's why uh, we are not one... Um, we are, we'll, we'll give you some advice. There are two websites that are there that people yep, can go on and yep. have a look at road closures. There are uh, There is advice that goes out, but um, we would say don't look for the solution now um, the council has offered one solution, but we think it would be best actually if the review <coughs> identified wh what the problem is and where it is and came up with the best solution that is achievable mm -hmm. and doesn't add a whole lot of burden and slow things down because otherwise it will have a capacity issue for staff and it will be funding implications. So let the review identify an uh, option and come back with it. Um, as you said, uh, it is the, it's, um, we haven't had this problem occurring before, so it's, it is uh, 
worth looking at the problem that's occurring and finding a solution for it. Thank you. Okay, so before I go any further, I'd like to actually see what the appetite is for this. Uh, Andre's moving it, and Sam will be seeking the, the amendment. Uh, so the so addition. The addition. Yeah, so it's, it's Councillor McDonald's notice of motion, so he's moved it. It's on the table. Councillor Moore has an addition that he's proposing. The meeting needs to agree, the majority of the meeting needs to agree for this addition to be added to the notice of motion. Yep. So, so, that's, so that's what we need. That's what I'm asking. So I will add yeah, after debate. this. Is it yes. before or after debate first or not? After, since this, no. or we have to decide Accept whether Andre's first. proposal will be accepted by the meeting. After that, the notice of motion still needs to be seconded, and then we can move into debate. Yeah. Right. So is everyone happy for Andre's proposal addition to go into the substance? Ask a question. Yeah, well, I can say, all those in favour, Andre, going in, please say aye. There's a request for a division. There's a question from Councillor Johansson, I think, before you vote. Yeah, I think it's a bit hard to expect us to support something when we haven't even had a chance to ask questions to clarify it. So, is it possible just to clarify? Because this issue has been raised previously at our informals and at community board. So, I'm just trying to understand why we'd need a resolution or a notice of motion to get that advice back. And just from what I've heard, staff saying, I just wanted to understand, are staff currently doing a look at um, these processes to, with an aim of improving them at the moment, or do they, will they only do it if the notice of motion passes? Can, can I clarify one point in that and why I've come here? I've been trying for over a year to start getting notified of road closures, and in a high growth area, there's road closures all the time because water works, some last many months. I've gotten basically nowhere in that year. I've tried um, going through community board channels, tried notice motion there. Um, I've raised it at about five different elected members exchange, gotten nowhere, so I'm trying this way. Yeah. So, so yeah. Staff are supporting the notice of motion to do the review, mm. to provide this advice back to us. Well, I just wasn't clear from the comments we just heard before from the, staff. Yeah. Well, the last notice of motion I put forth for this was declined outright. So, I, yeah. So we'll be told why. So, so he's, clipping, few, he's clipping so, it on the back so of the, Sam's one. The advice as it goes on, the on the first part of it, uh, we had identified that if a review was going to take place, which area it would need to take place in and not the entire process. So that's the area of uh, temporary and uh, pilots and trials. Uh, there we don't have a comment to make around uh, the second part of it, apart from the fact that if it, if it um, councillor do wish us to look at that, that they don't predefine the solution, that they actually let us look at the problem and identify the best solution rather than predefine the solution. Just for a little bit of clarity, but in answering what Tim was saying, that um, years ago there were no road closures. When we, a person I used to know, used to do uh, roading jobs, you had to leave the roads open no matter what happened in case the fire engine came along or something like that. Since the earthquakes come along, there's been a lot more of an appetite to close roads to enable contractors to do the work a lot better. In the I think we need to clarify that a bit, but that's come from central government because I used to do events for 100 years and until the last probably 15 years, then the requirement to do traffic management plans for the yeah. smallest thing, so it wasn't council driving this, it's been directed <coughs> from central government. So, so members and mayor, I would just like to get off first base if that's possible. We need to know whether you are prepared to accept the addition that Councillor Moore has put in. Can we get there, whether it's a yay or nay? Or division to someone through whatever at? route, no. and then we can move into the full notice of motion, whatever that looks like. Okay, so we'll do the division on no Andre's. Question before there was a we question. Go to yeah, so if you don't want to know what's going on in your ward, vote no. <laughs> um, can I just suggest, can we se separate those two bits out? Because split them out? No, do that. Sorry. Yeah. It's, yeah. Because it's, Sam has agreed uh, to support this addition to his notice of motion, and under standing orders, the meeting then has to agree in the majority that this addition is going to be included in the notice of motion going forward, so they cannot be separated out. Can I just clarify? Yeah. It's just <coughs> Sorry, just, I'd just it's like just to a, clarify. It, the only thing we're voting on in this division is to accept it into. Yeah. 
the additional part, which is about to be highlighted, that bit. That is all you're voting on, as to whether and to include that into the notice of motion. Thank you, Megan. And and then, if that passes. Sorry. Okay. So is everybody clear about that? Right. So we're doing the division by the sound of it. Thank you, Katie. So remember, this is to just. Add the element. Add Andre's bit. <laughs> it's just a boss. It's just a boss. Yeah. Okay, uh, Councillor Moore. Yes. The big did it said no. Councillor Johansson. <laughs> Deputy Mayor Potter. No. Councillor McClellan. No. <laughs> Councillor Barber. Yes. Councillor Goff. Yes. Councillor McDonald? Yes. Councillor Kewen? Yes, we're fine. Okay, we're good. Councillor Fields? No. Councillor Henstock? Yes. Councillor Scandrit? No. Councillor Harrison Hunt? No. Councillor Coker? No. Councillor Templeton? No, Councillor Donovan? No. Councillor Peters? Yes. Mayor? Yep. Yeah. Eight yes. Nine no. Okay, so that is declared lost. So we now go on to the original notice of motion from Councillor Macdonald. Yeah. So are we now, Sam? Are we now debating your notice of motion? Yeah. You need the seconder. Uh, Victoria. Um, so just again, now that it's been seconded, no further amendments or proposals can yeah. be. Brilliant. Thank you. So we now go into debate on the notice of motion, which you will see in front of you. Right, here comes debate number one. Melanie. Can you bring it up on screen, please? Yeah, it's there, isn't it? Yeah. It's not Dad, I have to do a project for school about the City Council and what ratepayers think of it. Are you a ratepayer? Oh yes son, unfortunately I am, replies Dad. A lot of waste of money in my view. So much bureaucratic nonsense. They take forever to get anything done and our rates just keep going up. That doesn't sound good Dad, says his son thoughtfully. We have to do some research too. I was reading in an article in the paper that the new Mayor is making progress on cutting bureaucracy. The article says the mayor, that the Mayor said the Council has one less meeting per month and meetings have less business than they used to. A lot of other stuff is getting sorted out in the background. Oh, I hadn't heard that, said Dad. That's great to hear. I definitely want my hard-earned money to be spent efficiently. But what I don't get, Dad, is that there's this big fuss about council staff being able to do some trial traffic management projects for a cheap price. They sound like the kind of thing ratepayers would like. And I also read the mayor doesn't like them. And that doesn't make sense, son. I voted for the mayor and he said he was the man who got things done and he's good at spending money wisely, said Dad. My teacher said the council was thinking of spending more money to remove these trials. Bloody typical. Oh, sorry for searing, son. I've had enough. Dad, that's OK. I know you're upset. My teacher also said that the residents have a declining trust in council like it sounds like you do too. Well, son, it's not surprising when apparently even the elected councillors have no trust in council either. I agree, Dad. I heard that one of the boys in my cricket club has a parent that works in council. He's feeling bad that the mayor said something mean about his parent and refuses to apologise. Dad thought for a minute, looking surprised. That's bullying, son. That's not acceptable from leaders of our city. Make sure you're nice to that boy, son. I will, Dad. 
And let's hope we see some improvements with that council soon. I hear there's another rates rise coming, so I want to see some value for my money. Thank you. Have we got any other debate? Timothy. Yeah, thank you. Look, I, I just don't know where it's kind of broken down because I have never had any issue with getting information on our traffic management plans. Is there, is there, a, pro, is there a problem? No, no. So I, I think it's a real shame that this has come up, and I do kind of reflect on the uh, speaker, Harrison McEvoy, who t spoke, you know, like to see councillors and just waste, seemingly wasting time. And I'm sure that we could have sorted this out in one of our um, briefings. And I think that's, that's where it should have been, rather than wasting time around this table and wasting a lot of people's time. Um, I'm just really disappointed how we've got to this point and um, we were going with it. So I can totally understand the sentiment, but I think there's a breakdown here, and not just with, between us and council staff, it's right across the board with us as well. So um, I'm not going to support this. Okay, Sarah, and then Mark. Thanks. Um, I'll just start briefly by addressing Andre's issue, because I get it, like I have residents who um, come to me and I didn't know ahead of time. Um, there is a process and it's broken, we need to work out how to fix it, rather than coming up with something new. But I don't think that um, adding it in here was the way to do it, because I'm voting against the other thing, you know? Um, and otherwise I'd just be voting against it. So I'd rather try and work on it separately. However, this notice of motion implies that staff delegations are ambiguous, yet I have not seen anything to support this. And I think we need to be clear that just because someone who is not a subject matter expert doesn't understand the scope of something <coughs> doesn't mean the thing itself is, un is ambiguous, just that, that the person doesn't have the background knowledge and training to understand it. Sure, let's have a briefing so that councillors can learn more about the TMP delegations and ask some questions but I'm certainly not going to vote for a motion that implies that staff have taken advantage of ambiguity. Our staff are already stretched past capacity, and I'd much rather they were focused on getting stuff done, the surf and the craft projects, the roving footpath crew and other projects, than spending precious time on paperwork. If councillors are upset about traffic management plans being used for trial pedestrian and cycle safety projects in our communities, then the notice of motion should have limited it to changing that and being clear that they disagreed with the current delegations, not implied that they were ambiguous. But let's just have a regular briefing first to understand the issue and then look at what to do. And remember that uh, ahead of the election, there was a meeting where mutual expectations were discussed that looked at lowering the number of meetings that we had, getting fewer consultations out. Thank you. Mark. Thank you. Um, I can see the sense in taking a look at the allegations and making sure that they're fit for purpose. Um, as a timber traffic management trainer in my past, I know a little bit about timber traffic management and how it works and where it can be used. Um, so I'm more than happy to see us go through a process and just make sure that the, the delegations we have delegated from the council to the staff are actually fit for purpose and that there's not any ambiguity that could cause any problems like we've had recently. So um, happy to support this and um, let's have a you know, joyous track forward and try and get back on an even keel. Okay, thank you. So, Kelly? Vic? Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, I'm in two minds here. I mean, on the face of it, um, I support uh, council staff doing their job and doing it well, but there have been times in my lived experience as chair of the White High Coastal Community Board where things didn't uh, go to plan. For instance, I got a phone call from a chap who um, wanted to know why there were newly painted yellow lines outside his dairy. And um, I said to him, look, you know, this, can't, this must have been the previous community board because I don't recall this coming before us. And then six months later, it did come before us. Um, and we voted it down and those yellow lines were painted out. Now, something is seriously wrong with the delegations when uh, an action happens six months before it comes to the due process. So that wasn't the only occasion. There are an, another couple, but I'm not going to uh, embarrass our council by bringing those up as well. I just think that there is, a, um, there is definitely something at play here that we need to look at, um, and so I will be supporting this. Victoria. 
Oh, thank you. I think <coughs> this motion is really about good governance. It's about uh, our processes. It's about scrutiny and it's about accountability. As councillors, it's our job to ask questions. And it's also our job to support and enable our CE to run a really good ship. And I think that this question, this motion, is raising a legitimate question about the appropriateness or otherwise of those current delegations. As a councillor, I expect accountability of decision making by our staff. And I also expect that we have appropriate checks and balances in place to ensure that staff are providing us with sound advice and are making good decisions when they're exercising their delegations. Now, the controversy created by these works would suggest that the checks and balances that are currently in place are not working, and therefore it is entirely appropriate that we ask our CE to review these delegations. Now, notwithstanding the obvious safety issues that have been raised, there are two major factors uh, that have influenced me to conclude that the delegations require review, and the first is that these have created significant and material change. We've heard people talk about that today. And the second is that they were purportedly undertaken to improve safety for pedestrians and cyclists while the museum was being redeveloped. Well, that's a five-year period, and five years is, tempor is hardly temporary in my books. And furthermore, Park Terrace is some distance from the museum, and the built environment around the Park Terrace end of it is quite different to Rolleston Ave. So this just doesn't wash with me. And it concerns me greatly that our staff didn't turn their minds to the likely controversy and the public backlash that this, these worked have caused. So that's why I think it is entirely timely and it's appropriate that we ask our CE to review the delegations. Thank you, Victoria. Anyone else with the uh, James and then Andre? I totally agree with what Victoria said, and it's kind of hard to, um, to add to that. The only thing that I, I would address, and it is probably the elephant in the room here, because this is why I think that it's important that we take these steps, and I don't get any pleasure out of the situation uh, that we've been through, nor to staff, uh, when we go through things like Gloucester Street, Park Terrace, and ultimately that's why we're sitting here today dealing with this notice of motion and the one that's coming after that. Um, that's not fair. I don't think you know the frustrations on councillors, on management, on staff all throughout this organisation is actually not really fair on the community. But I think at this point, good governance is about saying, hey, the onus is on us. Um, at the end of the day, it's our head that's on the chopping block uh, with elections every three years, uh, and staff aren't coming to work to do a bad job, neither are elected members coming here to do a bad job. Everyone's trying to do their best, but there is a gap there somewhere. So this provides us the ability to do a bit of that stock take and say, let's do a bit of a reset and provide best endeavours to get this right, because what has been happening, for whatever reason, isn't as good as what it could be. So let's reassess, make sure that we're on the same page, and ensure that what we've got and what, um, what we're delegating is fit for purpose. So I, I see this only as a positive thing, and I think it would be um, really sad if, if we didn't do that, because you know, we always need to keep looking at what we're doing and making sure that we're improving things where we can. Um, and the history has demonstrated that it hasn't been quite right, and I, for one, am keen to fix that up. So supporting this note as a motion, I think, will go a long way in achieving that. OK. Andre, please. Thank you very much. Eve, about five times a week um, in this job, um, people you know, they'll ask you, oh, how are you enjoying the job? And um, you'll say, yeah, you know, enjoying it. But everything in local government is a very long, drawn out, tricky, bureaucratic process. And um, yellow lines is a good example, because if ever you're t talking to someone, they might need yellow lines in their street. And we go, cool, well, we'll make the request. And the residents say, how long will it take? Maybe, you know, a couple of weeks? It's like, oh. oh. <laughs> Uh, actually, so actually, mate, as per the Local Government Act, um, we have to then consult the affected neighbours. A report has to be generated. It's quite a long, extensive process. So currently, um, currently our staff are stretched. We've, we're putting a, we put a huge amount of work with them. There's only so many staff. So I actually have to say to someone right now, you're probably looking potentially 12, 18 months, more yellow lines. Mm -hmm. So we do need to find efficiencies for staff. Um, we need to find a way to make things easier for staff, which is something that um, Mayor Major, I think, said very well in the campaign, is things take a long time. We need to find ways to make things easier for staff. Um, obviously, we have to find a sensible balance between efficiencies um, and consultation, making sure we're not um, going to have to come back to things later, absolutely. 
and I have got no real desire to want to make things more difficult for staff. However, um, I am quite comfortable with receiving this review um, and report with the facts that are in front of us. It is a conversation that we do need to have and should have. Um, we're a new council. We, we should look at these things, get briefed on them, find out what our options are. I, I don't see any harm in having that conversation myself. Um, in terms of uh, my amendment, uh, I spoke with Sam yesterday um, to ask him, and he was all too willing to look at changes to be made to this to, to come up with something to make it work. Uh, so I hope that's what we do. If indeed it does pass, um, I will be voting for it. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Tim. Um, just to wrap it up, look, thank you. These. Oh. Well, you go. For, yeah, if Aaron yep. wants to come in on. Yeah, he's wrapping. You're into it. Yeah. Uh, I'll just. There's not a lot to add. It's kind of all been said from, from both sides. Um, the bit that surprises me around this is this is only a, a request. This isn't an action. This is a request for this to be looked at. It's not saying that it changes as of today. And that's the bit that surprises me at this table from the number of people that often ask for uh, request information and request things to be looked at. Um, most of the people around the table, you can normally pick how they're going to vote, uh, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I pretty much you can draw it down a political line and the votes will go certain ways. This is no different to that. It was proven just before with the addition of Andre's point. Uh, the one person in the room that did shock me, though, was Yanni. Um, and I will call you out this time, mate, because normally you are the one requesting information. You are the one asking for things to be looked at. And you didn't support that going in. That shocked me. Everyone else at the table, on either side, I'm not shocked by because they always tend to vote that way. But your one did disappoint me, so I'm just going to say that publicly. The rest of you, I know how you're going to vote, so I won't be surprised at the result in a couple of minutes' time. OK, Yanni. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to reflect on the fact that it seems very uh, inefficient to me that legitimate concerns that councillors have raised through multiple channels, community board, informal briefings, probably Office of the CE, I suspect, I know I have around the notification, that we have to get a notice of motion amended to add something um, to do that. Like, it, there must be better ways of doing it. I've heard what people have said this morning, and I just think this is uh, not a good use of our time to, to have to go through a formal resolution uh, to, to do this, when we actually know um, you know, I think for all of us that were in the room when we voted on that um, could reflect on uh, lessons learnt from uh, either approving work or not asking the right question or having the right resolution. But when I've reflected on my own understanding of it, I, I recognise that I've got improvements to make as an individual because of what I didn't pick up in that report. And I'll take that on myself and next time a report like that comes in front of me, I will certainly be asking different questions of staff to get an understanding of what's being agreed uh, or what's not, or if required, putting resolutions to ensure that um, what I expect should be a, a decision would be a decision that, that we would make. So, you know, I just don't think that we need formal resolutions uh, through this process um, to review delegations that already exist um, around the ambiguity, when I actually think the delegations are actually really clear. It's just how we make decisions around those that that is the issue. Now, um, it also shouldn't take a notice of motion um, to get people notified of works happening in the area. I would hope staff would simply go away and just do that without requiring a notice of motion to effectively tell people when a road's shut and is impacting on, on them. And, you know, I think um, the irony is, that, or the thing that I'm struggling to understand is why both of these notice of motions were accepted but the other notice of motion to get notification to residents was excluded and rejected. And to me, that makes no sense. But I think we have internal processes where we should raise these issues together. We should try and work together constructively as a council to address concerns. Um, but I don't think these notice of motions today really help us do that, which is why I'm not supporting them. Okie dokie. So everyone's... Oh, Sam, I'm sorry, yes, yes. Okay, we'll just wrap it up. Um, uh, Yanni, the irony's not lost on me about wasting time when I've counted on my phone that you've taken two hours today on unprompted amendments and had to get staff to... Oh, sorry, you used AI to do your one. <laughs> <laughs> I was very proud. No, look, I, I think the, um, 
the irony isn't lost in that though, and and I think Victoria and James uh, put it really well, which is this is actually about good governance. You know, you, we've, people have talked about the just being able to do things and go and talk to staff about it, but actually when something's not working, you bring it to the council table. We're an elected council. This is in the public domain where people can have a say. So I'm just sort of surprised that a, uh, what seems like a majority of people don't want to have a look at a system. You know, I would have thought that, like Aaron said, there's actually no decisions being made. We're having a review into delegations that, in my view, are not working. Uh, I would have thought if you can't do it here, you know, for people that talk about being transparent, I'm unclear as to why you'd want to do it behind closed doors. So, you know, actually, voting on this now gets public advice and we can put it in a line in the sand once and for all. You know, the staff have talked about the delegations that exist already. Uh, Mary sat at the end of the table and said, you know, there potentially are issues within it that people might not understand. If we can't do that here, then why are we here? So good governance, in my view, is when something's not working, getting a review, and I would just be astounded if people wouldn't support that. Um, but again, maybe it is one of those political divides where, you know, um, ultimately ideology wins the day and not good governance. Okie dokie. <coughs> so with that, I will put the nudge to motion. Well, okay, far away. Yep. Thank you, Katie. Councillor McClellan? Yes. Councillor McDonald? Yes. Councillor Hinstock? Yes. Councillor Moore? Yes. Councillor Scander? No. Councillor Harrison Hunt? No. Councillor Coker? No. Councillor Fields? No. Okay, so that is Mr. lost. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, could I just make a comment, if that's okay? Um, Here, feel free. I, I uh, just want to say that I do respect Council's uh, right to debate processes and systems around the Council tab table, that that's what you're here for. I think it is most unfortunate when you criticise staff in the public forum when they do not have a right of reply. Um, and that, which is what you've done today, uh, when you moved off the process and the system and started up bringing criticisms of projects and things staff had done, I think that was most unfortunate uh, when staff do not have the right to defend themselves or reply to those examples. So thank you. Thank you. So now 16. Yep. 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 So now we move on to number item number 16. <laughs> James. <laughs> what would you say? Ding, 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 didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> Next round. James. Uh, look, it's pretty straightforward. Um, should we just move to debate? Unless anyone has any questions, but I don't need to take up any any more time for what's pretty clear cut. Okay, so. Bill, it, you're still happy to second. Who? Are you seconding this? Third? You're seconding. Yeah. Yep. So we'll move straight to debate. Here we go. Righto. So we've got Melanie, who will have another wee story for us. Do you mind if I'm. Um, and then Tyrone. As <laughs> the mover, Phil, I'll, I'll signal that I'd, I'd speak on it. I'm happy to speak. Phil, you only got You're all talking too fast for me at the moment. Sorry. Can I just ask two questions? One, why was this notice of motion accepted when we're currently doing a trial? And two, why was it also accepted when it's a community board decision, just based on what we heard this morning? Uh, so there are aspects of it that are a community board decision and there are aspects of it that are a council decision, is, is uh, my understanding. Is it, so cycleways is a council decision, the parking aspects 
uh, which are not covered by this part here, are a board decision. Okay. Is it accepted when we've currently got a trial underway? Uh, because this notice of motion is suggesting uh, ending the trial early. Okay. So we're, we're, in, we're, we're in debate, obviously. So Melanie was first, and then I think Sarah had a... Tim? Jake? Do you mind if I int introduce it as the mover, Mr. Mayor? And then... Um, just because I think the standing orders have got the times a bit different from like a mover and a right of reply and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. If you'll indulge me. Yeah. Is that cool? Yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll signal that I'll go, as long as you've got everyone else. You're talking too quick. Just saying, I, I, I'm happy to exercise my right as the mover to, to open debate. That's what I was saying. Okay, so we're opening debate. Melanie. Well, are you debating first, James? Is that what you want? I was just signalling as the mover, I, 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 would, I, I would happily for him to debate. Okay. okay, so look, um, the, the issue for me on this is not that no elected member knew anything about these works. The issue is that no elected member was able to do anything about them. So I raised some concern with what we're now discussing, uh, and that was because there wasn't anything in the resolutions that reflected what was mentioned in the information that we received. So I, I like encouraging cycling. I like encouraging cycling in a safe environment. Dedicated cycleways really do help achieve that. But I also like democracy and having an intelligent conversation with our community about the trade-offs around different options before their money is spent and before the work is carried out. So my preference would have very much been to explore widening the shared pathway along Park Terrace to accommodate cyclists in a designated only cycle lane. We've probably got like the, the widest grass verge in all of the city in this location, and our own Mayor, Phil Major, who knows a thing or two about civil works, believes that $40,000 to $50,000 to $50, would have achieved that, a dedicated off-road cycleway by widening the existing path. So I think this would be a far better result, in my view, for encouraging cycling and protecting cyclists. It would leave Park Terrace itself untouched and not exacerbate uh, congestion onto those other nearby streets. I think what we've got, which wasn't consulted on and wasn't decided by council, actually, in my view, compromises safety from what I've seen. You know, and in this short space of time since the work's been finished, I've personally seen a near miss uh, of a pedestrian almost, uh, almost hit by a fast travelling cyclist who didn't stop at the pedestrian crossing by Armagh Street just last Saturday. And on the same day, a car turning into the Botanic Gardens car park almost hit a fast travelling cyclist because it wasn't intuitive for that right-turning vehicle to check for cyclists in the opposite direction of, to the traffic flow. And I've seen a number of close calls and near misses from vehicles now turning uh, into Kilmore Street from Cramner Square, where an entire traffic lane is now being removed for westbound traffic wanting to travel north. So these changes exacerbate congestion on other northbound routes, such as Montreal Street and Victoria Street. And this key route down Park Terrace being halved in capacity to one traffic lane and replaced with bollards and a cycleway, look, that's one thing, but building a bus stop quite literally in the middle of the road is extraordinary. So I'm comfortable for the staff delegations to be used for relatively minor tweaks, but significant fundamental changes, like this Park Terrace example, should be, in my view, subject to full consultation and a council decision before they're approved and before the work's carried out. The fact that uh, a cost would be incurred to re reinstate the road, I think, is a really weak argument, given these works were undertaken by staff under temporary traffic management delegations. Look, if they can't be removed, then they're not temporary. The delegations become essentially permanent delegations where controversial work can be undertaken without any proper consultation or any council approval retrospective approval or retrospective consultation then becomes disingenuous at best or completely pointless at worst when the very act of implementing the changes without permission in the first place then creates the so-called compelling reason to not get rid of them. It's a perverse, self-fulfilling prophecy. So we're all very well aware of the uh, recent residence survey results, you know, really disappointing results, and we've uh, all taken that on board and had a briefing uh, around it recently, but one of the main reasons people dislike council is because they believe that the decisions have already been made. 
Now, where on earth would someone get that idea from? So to sum this up, I don't think there's any justification in persevering with something that's wrong simply because you've already started it. Thanks. Right. Um, who, Mel Melanie now. Thank you. Hey, Dad. Yes, <laughs> son. I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> I've been learning at school about climate change. I have to do a project about it. Not another project, son. I'm starting to think I should send you to the local school rather than that fancy one I pay for. I like my school, Dad. Hey, my teacher was saying that the City Council was goals to reduce carbon emissions in our city. It's such a great thing to do. It makes me proud to live in a city where our leaders care about our world. That makes sense, son, replied Dad. Dad, did you know that 53% of emissions are due to traffic? That's huge. Yes, it is, son. I didn't realise it was that much, replied Dad. Dad asked his son, can I please bike to school? Biking is better for the environment and better for my health. But son, cycling isn't very safe. There are so many cars around, especially around schools. I feel much better knowing you got to school in one piece. That's why I like to drive you there. Don't you enjoy the Mercedes? I do, Dad. And I understand your fears, Dad. But the council is putting in lots of cycleways. There's a new temporary one close to school. I want to try it out. The other boys say it's great, implored his son. My friends say that they don't have to weave around the people like they used to on the paths through the park. That does sound good. But I don't know, son, said Dad, worried. Let me think about it. Thanks, Dad, replied his son. And then after some thought, I'm not sure that cycleway will stay there anyway. In fact, I think some of the bollards have already been ripped out. That's not good, son. Another waste of my precious hard-earned money. Yeah, I think some people are angry about it as they want the road for cars and don't want to be frustrated by having fewer lanes to choose from and taking longer to get to wherever they're going. Surely not, son. I would have thought people would care about others, especially those trying to do the right thing. Thinking some more... Time's up. Son? No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'll let you to bike to school. I remember biking to school when I was young, and it was great. Thanks, Dad. I'm proud of you. Thank you, Melanie. Tim. OK, Jake. Uh, yeah, OK. Um, <laughs> I just had to... Yeah, um, look... Normally, when notices of motion are debated and received around this table, there's a lot of thanking. Um, sometimes it's genuine thanks, and sometimes it's a passive-aggressive way to say um, thanks, um, thanks for bringing it, but here's all the, here's all the reasons I'm not going to vote for it. Um, but I won't thank the mover of, of this motion. I think the idea, uh, I think it's rather incredulous to go out and talk to people and ask for their feedback on a project and then suggest that you'll rip it out before you've even seen uh, what they had to say. I actually think it's the notion is a little a little bit petulant, really. Um, and I think I think that um, you know people like Ray made a really good point. He made a couple of really good points in terms of working on this as as we as it progresses and as it goes on. And I think we absolutely should do that. Um, yeah, yeah, that's that's it. Okay. Right. My turn. Oh, right, Victoria, where you go? Pardon me? You've got Sarah and... Sarah and, and Tyra, both of you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the story. Oh, no, I didn't get that side. Thanks so, for the story. Sorry, we'll do, we'll, Victoria, you had a question? Yeah. Oh, oh, debate. No, I'm in debate. Uh, it's a debate, sorry. I'm yes, getting please. Confused. Yes, please, you, you go, and then I'll work down the other side. I want to thank uh, Councillor Coker for a story today, both stories, but... The reality is that this motion is not about the merits of cycling, and actually this motion, nor is it about the science of climate change. And this motion is most definitely not about contempt and lack of respect for cyclists, as some would have you believe. And if anything, it's actually about contempt and lack of respect for all residents of Christchurch, particularly those who weren't consulted prior to these works being undertaken. I think it's a legitimate expectation that our residents have that they will be consulted on important matters, such as this, where there's material changes. And it's a major route in and out of our city. 
as with so many of the issues that we face at this council table, it's not binary. There's no right or wrong answer here. And regardless of how I vote for today, it's going to be unpopular with the sum, and we're all in the same boat there. So for me, voting on this, I'm going back to basic principles, and I urge you all to do the same. And for me, that one basic principle is about common sense. We know that public trust and confidence in council is really low, and public perception is that common sense in council decision-making is not very common. You've heard it said here, people have their perception that council do their own thing anyway, and this debacle plays right into that perception. To me, it's illogical and it makes absolutely no sense to consult after the works have been completed, then retrospectively seek approval. To those who say that this is a waste of money to rip it up, well, my response is that it was a waste of money in the first place. There was no problem to be solved, and there was no evidential basis for that decision. And actually, I think as a council, we are jolly fortunate that we have not been slapped with a High Court injunction or a judicial review. Now, that would have been a waste of resources. My closing remark is that I cannot condone the practice of retrospective justification. That does not equal consultation. This is asking for forgiveness, and that is not the same as seeking permission. Uh, to me, this is not acceptable as a councillor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tyra Ryan. Oh, here we go again. Let's all play the game once again of turning something teensy tiny and almost perfectly formed into something that feeds off this insatiable modern addiction to polarisation. Perhaps we feel more comfortable in an oppositional world. Perhaps we just can't get enough of it. But people must look at us and want to know what we're on. I mean, personally, I'm high on life, but um, it feels to me like some of us are absolutely tripping. Because if, but if they're tripping, they're not doing it on a bicycle, that's for sure. And it would seem in this strange oppositional world that things do indeed work in opposites. We talk about efficiency in the, and in the next breath, we want to waste staff time to undo something good that works really well. We talk about saving money and then we happily decide we'll spend it if it equally serves our political aims. We'll talk about doing things more cheaply and then don't even want to explore doing something clever that achieves exactly that. Are you confused? I am. I'm confused about a narrative that's always trying to find reasons to stop stuff happening. I'm confused about a mindset that is about stopping stuff happening. I'm confused about a hatred of bureaucracy and regulation that can be put to one side if it means you can stop stuff happening. Which sounds to me like you want to do things like they were done in the olden days. Well, I want to get off that trip get out of this strange universe, and I hope you can all follow me, because as we step out of that universe and into the future, you may hear the olden days calling, because they want their values back. Sure. Oh, that's hard to follow. Um, <laughs> it is 2023. In New Zealand, we have faced historic atmospheric rivers, a massive cyclone, and over 700 homes effectively red zoned, over half in our largest city. Thousands died, um, die early from air pollution from vehicles on our roads. Hundreds more in fatal crashes and thousands injured. Across the world, massive heat waves, flood and biodiversity loss threaten swathes of the world. And we are sitting here bickering about a few metres of low cost, safe cycleway and footpath to help people improve their health and well-being and reduce their impact on the planet. What has happened to strategic governance roles and to building trust and confidence? What this city needs is a council pulling in the same direction, on previously agreed direction, not spending enormous amounts of time and energy on the detail of operational decisions. While it was a previous council that signed off on our emissions reduction targets, and some clearly don't feel any responsibility for that, it was this council that earlier this year unanimously agreed on our strategic priorities, two of the six of which are particularly relevant to today's decision. Reduce emissions as a council and as a city and invest in adaptation and resilience, leading a city-wide response to climate change and actively balance the needs of today's residents with the needs of future generations with the aim of leaving no one behind. We also unanimously agreed we wanted to deliver a green, liveable city with neighbourhoods that are accessible and well-connected, supporting the goals to reduce emissions, and a collaborative and confident city where our residents have the opportunity to actively participate and have a strong sense of belonging and identity and feel safe. 
Are these just feel-good words, or do we actually mean them? What do we value as a city? A nostalgic fossil fueled past or a sustainable city for future generations? A driver waiting behind a bus for 30 seconds instead of racing up to the traffic lights? Or the safety of kids getting to school? It's the latter for me in both cases, and it's not going to happen to it by itself while we sit and bicker. A couple of years ago, Waka Kotahi changed the rules, not only to allow, but also funded to encourage this specific type of cheap and fast experiential consultation, so many because mo many people find it hard to visualise a design on paper. And it was always then the intent, as we saw in the report, to bring a report. We can't make progress without change, and it takes courage courage and vision for a better future. And courage should be found in this council, not in the kids just trying to cross the road. Uh, uh, I didn't actually write anything down. Um, I actually wanted to just talk from the heart for a little bit, actually. This notice of motion was quite a surprise to me. Um, seeing as that last line I didn't necessarily agree with it seeing as we got quite a few things over 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 our line in January and March but regardless of that there are a few things that I wanted to note and one of them is I actually quite ironically was biking with my daughter down the South Express and going onto the Islam cycleway going all the way through Hagley Park and I saw Jamie and his beautiful family playing um, at Hagley Park on the way to Park Terrace and Rolleston Ave and I used that to get safely from one place to the other, from Rickerton all the way through to my mum and dad's house, um, going down Peterborough Street and then going all the way to the, to the river. Um, that was something that I actually really enjoyed. And my daughter loves it. She tells me which way to go. We see so many things um, within that that made me feel really, really good. So I really appreciate the, or temporarily appreciate, uh, this, this um, cycleway being put in. Because what it's done is it's actually created one. Uh, a point of adventure for my daughter to choose which way to go, whether it goes down Rolleston Ave or up Peterborough. Um, but it also actually um, shows the connection that we can have through these cycleways and me to feel safe. I actually felt quite safe with those temporary measures around those black bollards being put in. I did feel safe. Um, and moving on to talking about the onus and the onus being on us, this notice of motion doesn't necessarily reflect the onus being on us. That's why I found it quite ironic. Um, that the councillor was talking about that. And good governance was another highlight that a lot of people are talking about, which again, is actually quite the opposite. This here is pulling up something that has been set for another couple of weeks. I'm really looking forward to seeing what the survey says, and it could go both ways. There's been quite a bit of attention on this, and I'm looking forward to seeing how it works out. So therefore, I'm not in support of this. Lastly, to close up, there is a, a term that has stuck in my head for the last, for a while now and it's um, empathy. And I'm not going to get into the details around why I think that, but there were some terms gone into the public realm um, about our council, and I just wanted to clear things up. We don't need to rein in staff, we need to rein in our commentary to provide trust in the council through those ways. Because remembering that Mary has talked about, quite simply, that they cannot have a right of reply. So that means that we shouldn't even open up in the first place. Not at our tenakoto, tenakoto, tenara tatakato. Kilda. Mark. Thank you. Um, this is, I think, an unfortunate debate for our council to be having. Um, I actually quite like what I see in that temporary cycle way. I don't agree with the way we got there, but. That's for another day. Um, I will not be supporting this motion for the simple reason that we're in the middle of this trial. We are going through that survey process and asking the good people of Christchurch what they think of it. And I really hope the good people of Christchurch get into that survey and really tell us what they think of it, be it good, bad or indifferent, because we need to hear from everybody, not just a few. So if you are supportive of this temporary cycle way, let us know. If you are not supportive of it, then do also let us know. One of the really good things I find with that temporary cycle way 
is how cheap and cheerful and effective it was to put in place. And I would be hoping that as a council, we might be able to find a way to move forward and do more of the cheap and cheerful, quick to put in place cycleways. Because I actually quite like the idea of interconnected cycleways throughout our city so that people can get anywhere on a cycle route, protected from the marauding car that I drive, and that most of us around this table actually drive. So hopefully the good people of Christchurch will get into this survey and we'll get a good balanced feedback out of it so that we can make some good balanced decisions going forward. And I really do hope that we can learn some lessons on how cheap and cheerful we can do cycleways rather than um, what we have been doing, which has been cheesing a lot of our ratepayers off. And um, I really hope we can, we can learn some good lessons in many ways from this and that as a city we can move forward and get into a, a bright new future where we can all live together and um, perhaps sing a bit of Kumbaya. <laughs> Pauline. Thank you, I wasn't really going to speak to this, but um, I have to pull Councillor Henstock up on something that she said when she used the words that <coughs> this project shows contempt and lack of respect for the ratepayers. And that is simply not true. And whether you're referring to councillors or staff or both, it is not true. You know that we all care and respect our ratepayers. We listen to them carefully when they come in. So I don't know how you manage to deliver those words and I'm, it's, it's not, it's, I want to retract those on your behalf if I could. But look, this is a trial and we've also seen an outpouring of support already and this feedback underway now. This to me is actually about a few councillors who don't like the roading changes and that's okay if you don't like them. But it's not okay to interrupt a legitimate process by using a notice of motion. Uh, Councillor Peters, you say you like the cheap and cheerful treatment. Well, it won't be cheap and cheerful if we interrupt what is currently a staff delegation to be able to introduce cheap and cheerful trials. They're not permanent solutions, they're trials. So today I won't be supporting the notice of motion. Thank you. Right, um, so Les and then Andre. Um, Tēnā koutou katoa. I just want to thank everybody that's come to speak today and um, I just want to acknowledge that we've had a pretty impressive turnout um, in the gallery um, and I think what I take from that is it's not surprising that there's a le this level of community interest um, because we know there's widespread support for uh, improvements to council, council infrastructure. People have told us they want to be able to travel safely they want us to combat climate emissions and create a healthier, greener city. What is surprising to me is that we're sitting here debating this issue at all. What we're talking about is a pretty straightforward, non-controversial upgrade to a busy inner city road. This, like many other temporary works, was delegated to staff to include as part of a wider upgrade to the museum. and We were well informed of the intent of this upgrade. What I find interesting is that there's a coin called doublethink, which is about holding two contradictory beliefs in one mind simultaneously and accepting both of them. So I've listened to some people in this room argue against cycleways for the reasons that they're too expensive or they're over-engineered. Yet here we are with a temporary solution that's fast, affordable, and it's fixing uh, safety issues in a pretty uh, innovative way. Yet here we are debating it again. We've also heard from some of these same councillors that we want more public engagement and consultation on these issues. Yet, we are looking at ending this trial before we've heard feedback from the community or before it's gone to the community board in July. So if we were to do so, we'd be cutting short this without learning anything from the public feedback and wasting time and money and short-circuiting democracy, both of which we told these councillors are against. To quote a fellow councillor, MacDonald, I do hope our colleagues will support democracy in a recent editorial on this topic. Well, I happen to agree and propose we do this by letting the public and the community board have their say. Finally, we've had a lot of feedback from the community this annual plan that they want safer and more accessible transport choices. Looking to the future, this discussion is more than just about a temporary roading improvement. It's about setting the direction for the future of our city and the leaders we want to be. We declared a climate emergency in 2019. 
which means we should be committed to ensuring that we put climate change at the heart of every decision we make. Today's vote is about turning talk into action by taking every opportunity to reduce our emissions and to provide safe and healthy transport choices for all of our citizens. <coughs> Andre. Thank you. Just something I want to make clear is that on the 23rd of January, all councillors were emailed um, this memo, which does read that it is proposed to extend the cycleway to Salisbury Street. It is proposed to install the works initially under traffic temporary traffic management plan in March. This was the time for us to begin to raise concerns if we had them. However, uh, I do recall the meeting, and Councillor Goff had asked questions. And if you watch it back, you can see how there was a they were simply at a crossroads. So look, these things happen. Um, trust have all learnt from it, but we have to deal with what's here in front of us now and the decision we have today, and the report that was due to come back to us next month. Just in terms of trust in council, just something I think also needs to be made clear, is I think everyone who came today, whether for or against, I don't think anyone has come in and gone home having more trust in council as a result of this here today and this notice of motion. I really don't think that at all. Um, right now, we've got potentially rates rises as high as 14% out in the eastern suburbs, and we're here talking about removing month-old infrastructure uh, before we even get the costs back to us, before we even get the survey results back to us. Um, I don't think we have got our priorities right in the big debate we are having today. I honestly don't. But for the record, I probably would and actually do favour widening the footpath uh, in Hagley Park. However, we don't know how much that will cost. We don't know how long it will take. Uh, and what we were told quite recently is there could be consenting issues. You can't just pave over Hagley Park very easily, as we will learn very soon. Um, so I'm keen on a wider footpath, but I actually need the facts before I know if it's something I would support as a result of removing this. Uh, but the good news is that report is coming back to us next month. Uh, it is on its way. Uh, we also, in my view, we can't criticise staff for a rushed process where we didn't consult properly if we're about to do the same thing ourselves, uh, which is what voting for this would do. We have an active survey currently running, and the even more good news is the report is coming back to us next month with the results of that survey. So next month we're going to have costings of what we might want to do, remove the cycleway, we'll have costings for it. We want to widen the footpath, we'll have costings for it. We want to truly know what the public think, we'll have survey results. So there's a fantastic piece of information coming back to us next month, and I look forward to receiving that next month, and I won't be uh, voting for this today and look forward to us exercising good governance and waiting for the information to come back to us in just several weeks so we can make an informed, proper decision for infrastructure that may or may not be there for another few years. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sam. Thank you. And as much as it might not seem, I actually do enjoy these kind of debates because it does put on the table people's differing views. Um, probably just one thing to note, though, I think um, Pauline had mentioned around Victoria's comments. I think you may have been referring to a second submitter from the climate change students. Yes, you're correct, and I apologise for that. Yes, I don't think yeah. that was quite, yeah, but that's, that's OK. Look, I, I think uh, if we're looking at um, good governance or how we should uh, manage a city on behalf of people, uh, quite simply, in my view, it's actually looking at how we got to this process. And uh, I will be supporting this today because fundamentally, I think we've talked about how we're getting value for money from these things. The best value for money would have been giving the options to the community to make a decision on and then implement. So I'm unclear as to why we think the best value for money is spending money putting it in, then potentially uh, removing it to put it uh, onto a shared path. So I guess the point I'm, I'm trying to make is that if we'd done this right in terms of, and it was obviously voted down at the last one, uh, so I'm not blaming the council staff, but if we'd, if we'd done this right and actually it had been a council decision, uh, you know, we would have got to a point where actually we could have made a, a sensible, considered one in terms of the money we're spending. So uh, I think the reality is this is going to be very, very difficult to remove in a couple of weeks' time. I think you know this kind of looks like uh, we won't be able to put or extend the path along Hegley, and I think the reality is because we have already sunk this money into it. So, uh, you know, my preference is still to remove this today, and um, because I think going forward, before we put in hard infrastructure, we should consult the community. It's as simple as that. Erin. Yeah, my, uh, my vote's irrelevant today, um, and uh, because. We already know which way this will go, but we'll ha we have the debate anyway, which, like Sam says, is a good thing. Everyone gets to let it all out. Uh, and put forward the cases of various members of our community. Um, there's some interesting points have been raised around this one. Uh, not all of them I, I quite buy into. Uh, 
one of some of the ones, well, like in a couple of weeks or a month, we'll get a report back that will um, tell us what we already know. Uh, the numbers are already at the table for it to stay. Uh, it'll be there for five years. Um, that's the reality of how the table works. Um, the sheer point path of order. widening would have been. Sorry, point sorry, of what? order. Point of order. That's completely disrespectful. So standing order, whatever it is that it talks about whatever disrespectful language. Okay, I'll bring it up. But it's completely disrespectful of colleagues to say that they're completely predetermined. Everyone's been really clear that they're looking forward to actually information arriving. So can you roll on the standing order, the point okay. of order, please? Are you? Sorry, I'll hang fire, mate. Okay, carry on, then. Did you say you retracted it, Aaron? Did you What's say? that? Did, what did you just say? No, no, no. I'll wait. I was, uh, I'm, I'm part clairvoyant. I identify as a clairvoyant, so I'm just predicting the future. That was all. I can. I can tell the future often. You need to. Sorry, I'm making a decision that was a bit disrespectful. So, could you just please rein it in a little bit, please? Okay. Um, I will keep my views to myself on how I think people will vote in the future. Thank you. Um, so, uh, getting back to uh, the debate, um, one of the interesting points raised, and it was in the newspaper this morning, was around the uh, emissions that you uh, get off the roads and how many people they kill a year, which is really interesting because it kills uh, more people than might have killed cycling, uh, and I'll come back to that. Why do we then keep putting the cycleways as close to the, or on the busiest roads we can? Uh, I was uh, the original mover of the cycleway network that we have adopted as a city. Uh, I was very supportive of that because I think cycling's fun and cool and good for the environment. Uh, I don't think it's dangerous. On average, nine New Zealanders a year die from cycling. That is a terrible number for every one of those family members, but more than four times that are killed as pedestrians. And it was good to see the cycle lobbyists today wearing their helmets when they're walking as well, because they're four times more likely to be killed walking than they are on a bike. Because once again, I'll say biking is not dangerous. And everyone who says that cycling is dangerous and keeps bringing it up to try and blackmail councils into putting in massive, expensive cycleways is doing damage to cycling. Cycling's fun, cycling's cool, it is not dangerous. And uh, if you live in your danger zone, then wear a life jacket when you're at the beach because you're 11 times more likely to drown than you are to be killed on a bike. Uh, so I just want to say that we shouldn't be putting the uh, cycleways on main roads or right next to them because of who wants to suck on the end of a tailpipe, which is literally what you're doing by biking in heavy traffic. The separated cycleways off-road makes a lot of sense, and I've always supported those. And the whole thing about the shared path down there, um, news flash, everyone, for you that has been living under a rock, we're about to open the shared path, the coastal pathway, in the coming uh, months or years, depending on when it finishes, that will be the most popular cycleway uh, walkway in this country. It is going to be a stunning addition to the city, and it's a shared path. Oh my God, it's going to be so dangerous. Uh, it's not dangerous. Shared paths work, and they work really well. Next time you're overseas, go and use one that's actually busy, and you'll see that people being courteous to each other can actually cycle and be pedestrians in the same environment. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Phil. Um, look. I'm a cyclist. I love cycling. I've cycled all my life. I've cycled all over the city. I've cycled in big cities like Paris and London, New York. Uh, members of my family cycle. We used to take our kids cycling 20 years ago when they were young, uh, all over the city to Hagley Park from Burwood, where we live. Um, and you know, my wife cycles to work a few days a week. So uh, I like her uh, journeys to be as safe as possible. Uh, so why would I be anything but thrilled uh, with this current proposal? Uh, simply because aspects of it uh, don't really make sense to me. And I think that it needs tinkering to balance both the interests of cyclists and car users. Um, because it's our job as city councillors to cast our eye over things that come to us and make an intelligent, informed decision. Uh, agree or disagree, that doesn't matter. At the end of the day, we have to bring it before us. and. Uh, and, and think it through. 
One of the most enjoyable times in my cycling career was during COVID. Um, the roads were almost completely clear and cycling was easy and did feel a lot safer because there were no cars on the road. And there was a group of us out there cycling just about every day, uh, not together. We were obeying COVID rules. Um, and so I get why people like beautiful roads with no cars on it and bollards up like those fantastic plastic ones we've got down there. Um, but obviously cycling during COVID was not sustainable because cars came back and people had to return to work. We had to keep the economy going. So to me, it's like, it's not a choice of one or the other. It's getting the balance right. Um, and I don't think the extension of the original project here does that. So starting with the, po the positives, I love the plastic bollards. I, I think it's a great solution instead of hard concrete um, little curbs that uh, people can, um, can smack into. Um, uh, they mark the route well, the plastic, they're not going to hurt anybody. Uh, I'm also happy with the changes uh, along the cycleway up Rolleston Ave. They make sense to me, up to the Armagh Street Bridge. And I'm relatively comfortable with the extension up to about Kilmore Street. But after that, to me, uh, I would divert off the road and, and use the existing path and widen that. Because that's what you see in many parts of the world. And I've cycled up the Champs-Élysées which is a very busy road. Um, there's plenty of room to widen that path. Uh, the bus stop in the middle of the lane makes no sense to me at all, I'm sorry. Um, it reminds me of the Hills Road experiment of years ago, um, where we um, council did a similar thing. Sorry, Mary. Um, you know, buses stopped in the main traffic lane and traffic backed up for miles behind. Um, in my opinion, it's controversial cycleways like this that make enemies for cyclists. Mm -hmm. um, drivers get annoyed with cyclists, and I don't want to harvest their anger uh, because um, they're frustrated that we haven't uh, done the sensible thing with our cycleways. There's a ton of room along that riverbank to do a great solution to get people right down to the end where Beely Ave connects. Cal. Thank you. <laughs> Right, I'm second to last, and then James. Right. <clears throat> May I start by saying that, and the people down the back will not, will not believe this, I am not against cycleways. I'm against how we are building them. I still cannot see the sense in putting this one here. To take out 350 metres odd of road lane and turn it into a cycleway when it runs parallel to an existing shared path less than four metres away is strange to say the least. I asked at a prior briefing what instigated the decision to be made to do this and I was told that some complaints had been made, received from pedestrians about their safety on the shared path. That's when a bike went past. I asked to see these complaints and I have not seen them to this date. I then asked how much does the Park Terrace Cycleway cost? I was not given a breakdown but concluded that if the original cost in front of the museum was 400 grand uh, and the total cost ended up at 550, I assume that the Park Terrace portion is cost circa 150 grand. I asked, did, did anyone think to widen the existing shared path by a metre and was told it was too expensive? I then explained that to widen a 350 metre long path by a metre is around about, for argument's sake, close to $50,000. It is far cheaper to widen the existing path, which will be a permanent uh, fixture, rather than spend 150 grand on a temporary solution. Um, the strangest decision was, to, is following up what Kelly said, was to put a bus stop which required the bus to stop in the only remaining lane to pick up passengers, stopping traffic altogether. Have we not learned from the Hills Road debacle of a number of years ago? Last month, as a council, we discussed at length the importance of having two lanes of traffic out of New Brighton over the Pages, New Pages Road Bridge, just in case of an emergency. In Park Terrace, case, Kilmore Street one-way system feed, fed into Park Terrace and did have a continuous two lanes of traffic all the way to Bailey Ave and even further if you go up to um, Memorial Ave. Since this cycleway went in, we have seen more congestion in Kilmore Street, especially at 5pm, when it backs up and clogs up, even clogs up Montreal Street one-way system. 
If we had another event in Christchurch, we need to get people out of town as quickly as we can, and Park Terrace would become a bottleneck. If residents want to come to and from the city by any means of transport they desire, we should make it as easy as possible for them to do this. And one, the last thing, one thing that concerns me a lot about this down there, I have been advocating for hospital parking for eight months. It is a small but simple fix which could have been prioritised well before this because it, that would help solve a far more important problem. Thank you. Three seconds. Look at that. <coughs> Righto, James. No, you're no, good? No, it's all been said. So, with that, I will put the motion. Oh, do you want a division? division? OK. Can I just ask Aaron? <laughs> 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 right, let's get going. Hey, I didn't oh, say. It gets dark at nine o'clock. <laughs> We've got more reports Chuck, to get. Councillor McClellan. Uh, no, no. I got distracted by comments. Councillor McDonald. Yes. Councillor Johansson. No. Councillor Moore. No. Councillor Donovan. Councillor Coker. No. Councillor Peters. The Mayor. Yes. Councillor Scandrit. No. Councillor Barber. Yes. Councillor Kewen. Yes. Councillor Goff. Yes. Councillor Henstock? Yes. Councillor Fields? No. Councillor Harrison Hunt? No. Deputy Mayor Kyle? No. Six four. Ten against, one abstention. Right. That appears to be lost by a very small margin. <laughs> <laughs> if we go for a judicial recount. Right. So now we've got three more reports to do. Uh, now we'll pick up again with item 12, the events and festival fund. <coughs> Who is coming to talk to us about that? Lucy's probably given up and gone home. <laughs> Have we got any questions, anybody, on this, or are we happy with it? You, you've got a question? Of course you have. Yes, she did raise it yesterday. <laughs> oh, that's all right. <laughs> well, it was. Thank you, Councillor. So it's a big question. No, no, that's right. No, no, you, Nigel's here. So it's a big question. Hello. Hello. Hey, Dad. <laughs> no. um, <laughs> <laughs> move on. <laughs> We'll, we'll move on to, we have apologies from Lucy Blackmore, who is going to present the report. She's at home ill today, so I'll go through a quick introduction and then um, box on from there if that's okay. So, um, I guess the purpose of the report today is for Council to decide on the allocation of the events and festivals um, sponsorship fund for the financial year 23-24. Um, we received 45 applications, totaling $1.7 million. There's $521,000 in the budget, um, less the 235000 that had been previously committed to multi-year funds. Um, what we're asking today is to carry forward, sorry, what we're recommending today is to carry forward some of the discretionary response fund of $103,000, which would allow in terms of $390,000 to be allocated from the events and festivals fund today. We have made a couple of changes to the to the matrix that I wanted to highlight. Um, one is about um, ensuring that any applicant has implemented a waste management plan, um, and the second part is to make sure that um, all those that are successful are required to include an accessibility um, options within their event. So previously we asked them to do that, and now they're required to do that. So there are two small changes that we made that we think is going to improve the way their events are delivered in the city. And with that, I'll probably just leave the report as read and happy to take any questions. OK, Paul and then Tyler. Thank you, Nigel. So uh, can you remind me, somebody pulled out and that leaves a, a $6,000 in the discretionary? 
Yep. Yeah. So I'm, I'm wanting to move an amendment um, to fund the Vegan Society that's been recommended as a decline. Um, they've applied for eight, eight, and if we could fund them for 4,000, um, would, would that be appropriate to come out of the discretionary? Or would it be more appropriate to take a percentage, a 1% off all of the others? Yeah, I think in terms of staff have made the assessment that are in the matrix that are attached to this report. Um, how the council would like to decide on that, it's up to them. But the preference from the staff, if you were to um, make changes to the assessment matrix to, to bring money, it would be best to, to come out of the discretionary response fund, the $6,000 that we had um, suggested that would go to the Autumn Bradley Spring Fair, but they've withdrawn their application. That would yes. be the cleanest way rather than taking a percentage off okay. every So I would like to move that as an amendment that we fund the Vegan Society $4,000 from the discretionary fund, please. And your second will be. Can I just point out, it doesn't come from the discretionary fund, it just comes from reallocation yeah. instead of going into the discretionary fund. And so the resolution would change to be $4,000 in allocated funding um, go to the vegan festival and 2000 into discretionary. the discretionary fund. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we don't have to, we just say just. Um, to approve $4,000 for the Vegan Society. Yeah. Well, this is all the, this is, yeah. Paul, so, sorry, did you have a, you had a seconder? Um, the so seconder is, Sarah, okay. So, I need a question. We're not doing notice and action. We're not, we're not. But that won't work with some policy, will it? Yep, thanks, Sarah. So, you should clarify something with me, Karen. Or we'll just with start. With we'll start through you. through me, yes. Yeah. Sorry, Nigel. Just to clarify with the Autumn Brad. Can, can, can we Sorry. actually focus on the, what's happening? Thanks. Okay. Thank you. So just on the on the Autumn just on the Autumn Bradley Spring Fair. So that has had been withdrawn previously, right? So so if they do need additional funding, they can apply for it through, say, the community board or whatever. That's still up for. Do you want to they receive funding through a different funding council. Great. So they don't need your funding. Easy. Cheers. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Right. Just and C's question. That four thousand dollars is that going to be coming out of the discretionary if we're doing that? So no, it just comes out of the fund now. If it comes out of the events and festivals fund, it can't though because it's outside policy, right? We will have to go to discretionary, and discretionary goes into the vegan expo. No, it's no. just a policy. We can, we can decide that. So to answer the question, we have the matrix that's based on what we've made our recommendations on. If council decides that you'd like to spend money in terms of out of the events and festivals fund on that, then you can make that decision. So there is an unallocated 6,000 sum. Staff have made a recommendation that this particular thing is not supported. It's absolutely within your, your rights as councillors to have a different view, as long as the money is available. And it is in this and situation. It is. And it's in now the substantive. So if we vote on it and it passes, it's gone. Oh, well, you okay. can choose to do we it. We can choose not, yeah. But generally, the money's there. Might as well use it. Has anyone got any more questions of staff? Is that amendment? The, the amend, Pauline's amendment is now part of the substantive. So we'd have to do it separately. Put it separately. Put it separately. Happy to put it. Because she got it in before. Yeah, that's she right. Was she did it before. I was too slow off the mark. You got to, got to get up early to beat this one. Yeah, okay. Can I say the staff will be Just walking out? <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so, Mark. Thank you. Um, just a quick question. I was really in, interested to hear you mentioned accessibility um, planning, and I'm just wondering: is that going to potentially alleviate some of the concerns that came out of the Sparks in the Park um, accessibility issues that 
where the parking for accessibility was not really suitable? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> oh, sorry. You're done. That was a very quick question with an extremely quick answer. Right. So. No, I'm sorry, I won't. Right. Now, I'm going to I'm going to put the motion that you see up there. Oh, sorry, Andre. Yeah, fine. And no, we have to do the amendment. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's going separately, Six. sorry. No, it's so you've amendment. separated the amendment out? Yep, so we'll need to deal with the amendment first. First, okay. So. And I'll just note that the amount now in four will be dependent on what happens with the amendment. Mm. So we are now voting on. No, we're on the vote. No, we're. Oh. 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 Yeah. We're doing, can we're I doing just the say, amendment. Can I, can I make it clear that um, that's been put in as part of the substantive rather than an amendment Let's because vote. it's yeah. yeah yeah so it's not an amendment so yeah we just vote right. on that motion so separately we, yeah. and, and that's right we vote on number six separately that's what I was trying to get to and then I got confused by my learned friend over here <laughs> no <laughs> Tyler yes if you like yeah we're here all day it's just around um <laughs> It's just uh, around, as you'd expect, the uh, Happy New Year um, Festival. I'm just wondering, um, say for example, if they reevaluated, say in six months' time, what avenues would they have to go down um, if they were accepted that 100 and they needed a bit more? Seeing as this is sort of a, a, an anchor project in our city, if you will. Uh, so they are. They do currently have private sponsorship opportunities, which will be further strengthened through support through council having their um, pot of money there. Uh, we do have. Uh, we are aware they are not of some potential private funding opportunities that may be available to them, um, and they ha do have the ability to downscale the event should the level of funding not be at the level that they need to, de to deliver that huge event. No, that's cool. Thank you. Okay, are we all happy? Can I actually go and put this there? Oh, that's right, he did too. Right. Good. Um, <laughs> look, just, just very quickly, um, when I asked about this in the briefing a few weeks ago, the Events Festivals Fund, as I understand it, the funding amount has been frozen for a number of years. If I recall correctly, it's six, which is an effective cut with inflation and so on. But the cost of putting events and festivals on since several years ago has as good as almost doubled. Um, so when we come to the long-term plan, I'm just very mindful of the need to look at funds like these because we need to continue getting the city rocking, rolling and thriving. So thank you very much. Okay, Tim? Yeah, thank you. Look, um, I'm not picking on the vegan um, festival, but I thought that the staff's comments on it were actually really good because sometimes if you... Excuse me, guys. Sam. Excuse me. Yeah, well, actually, our behaviour has to really step up. You know, we've got... This is public, so, you know, thank you. Um, the, the staff's comments on it were really, really good, and I think that the um, to sometimes push events to look after themselves a bit more is actually gives them strength for the future. And I think that the comments with regards to looking um, harder for sponsorship, and I know how hard it is to find. I've been spent 30 years doing sponsorship, so I know it's an easy thing to say. And I have, when I actually worked for council, I had people around this table telling me what I could do because they knew that it would happen and it didn't and we knew it wasn't going to happen but I do think we do there are opportunities and we do have to push these organizations not just this one but many others to get out there and and hunt and get more professional what they do so I can't support six because um, I think we should start pushing some of these organizations a wee bit harder because uh, at times I think they just see the council as a bit of an easy push and um, I don't think that's fair on staff, especially when we're not supporting them. Thank you. OK, any more debate, Sarah? I'd just like to point out that across our city, a large number of um, communities and groups, communities of interest, 
organise events and festivals and things, and it's mostly on a volunteer basis. They've got other jobs that they do, but the events and things that they run build community. And if we are a council that wants to build community, build community connection, which builds resilience, all of those things, then it pays for us to support that. If, as a council, we didn't provide the number of um, grants and things that we do to uh, groups and organisations to help do that, many of them would fail, and as a city, we would be worse off. Thanks. Right. Any more debate? No. So now I'm going to put number six first, because six, if it fail, rises or falls, has a bearing on number four. OK, so I'm going to put number six. All those in favour of number six? Aye. Against? No. Right. Yeah, it's very close. Just hands up. Yes, just hands up. All right, all yes, yes. Hands up. Keep them high, please. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's nine, four. Days. Let's check. One, two, three. Okay. No, no, it's proof. Yes. Yeah, approved. Approved. Okay. Yeah. That is proof. Thank you. So now I so put one to five. Put the whole well, what's left, one to five. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? Thank you. Carry. Item thirteen. Now James has got a conflict in item thirteen with the outdoor dining policy, so he won't take part in the vote. It, Thank you, Stone. Yeah, done that. <laughs> You're happy to move it? Yep. Tim's happy to move it, and Yanni's happy to question or second it? Quick <laughs> question. I see that we've got. I'm happy to second it, by the way. <laughs> yeah. I just see that we've got a clause in there that um, restricts the advertising or the signage around vaping and, and being smoke free. Is that correct? And I just wondered if, if we had any other controls on, on signage or advertising. On the on the furniture that's in the public place. Sorry, can you answer the question? Who are we oh. asking that question of you? To the staff. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Please can you repeat the yeah, question? Yeah, sure. So in the in the um, review of the bylaw, we, we've got. Um, there's reference to the fact that the furniture has to be consistent with um, our smoke-free policy. Yes. Um, yes. And I was just wondering, in regards to um, other forms of, of signage, um, so you know, is there is there any controls over what people can or cannot advertise on the outside furniture that's on public space? Uh, not in this particular policy, no. Right. No. But it would have to be consistent with our plans and yes. other bylaws and strategies, it right? It would, yes. So, um, are you concerned about? Well, things like I think we've got a, I think we had a alcohol harm reduction policy at one point. Um, I think we've had a healthy food action plan <laughs> strategy. We've we've got a number of sort of. Um, policies around different things that we want to do as a city. Um, so I guess the concern was around um, if there was any advertising that was contrary to some of the key policies that we have going into public space, whether we have any control over that or not. Well, in the sense that council controls what goes into public space, I guess if people want to have um, uh, advertising which is contrary to our policies, then we could control it and say that we um, don't want to see it there. Yes. Um, we, we have the, the furniture, which um, we, can tr can we say, specifically say we can control. We could say we control also the signage. Um, we don't have it in the um, policy at present, uh, specifically, but that is something that perhaps... Um, I think we could look at, look to include something along those lines, to tighten yes. up advertising um, mm. in, in those public spaces and outdoor dining. 
the, the main thing we're here, here for today is to um, seek your approval to go out for consultation. Mm. So, th th so there is scope to change what's yes. in the draft policy. Yeah. I'm, well, I would, you know, we're looking to get people to respond to this policy. So there are some things in the policy and some things which are, are not. <laughs> so, um, yes, so people may wish to say, well, we want to see um, want to controls that. on advertising within, the, within outdoor dining. Cool. So I just want to add to the staff sat at the top of the table, <coughs> listening to all the things that we've gone through today. These are very old policies sat from 1998 and 2006. So there are two. <coughs> we're turning it into one because they were difficult to understand, mm -hmm. difficult for businesses to get round, not round as in a round, actually really simplifying the process and trying to get a far better understandable policy and only one of them. So thank you for trying to achieve that and let's hope that's well received when we get into consultation and that we get some really good ideas to help improve it further. Yes. But it's, all, it's all been moved and seconded to grief. You, I saw mine. All those, I'm going to put that. There's no debate. Thank you. All those in favour? Aye. Against? Thank you. Carried. Well done. <laughs> Righto. And we have the last of the day. Suburban Regeneration Biennial Report. <laughs> Thank, Jake's happy to move it and Pauline's, Pauline's happy to second it. Before you sit down, have we got any questions? Start? Well, Cans I... Councillors, over you just to listen it, it, and right, see that thank you, Bruce. because we are trying to, through these ones, present some good news, some of the good things that are happening, and it's a good time, I think, to end the day on the good points. <laughs> so we have a five minute or very short presentation, no, no, no. you'd like very to short. proceed with that? <laughs> Um, so this biennial report out, outlines the suburban regeneration projects um, that have um, been funded and have been actively progressed over the last six month period from October last year through to March of this year. Um, many teams within council um, and outside of council have contributed to this report and the projects that uh, it canvasses. Um, it includes the urban regeneration, urban design, transport parks, community governance, engagement, communications, property, community arts, project management and contract management staff, um, also Christchurch NZ and our city making partners, um, life and vacant spaces and the Green Lab. So um, after this, my colleagues um, and I here are happy to answer any questions, but we may need to come back to you with answers um, from some of those other staff. Just a reminder that uh, this report is structured around the already agreed by Council highest priority suburban regeneration locations. Um, and this slide just sets out the structure of that report and just reminds us that uh, we share responsibility with others for um, making, you know, delivering good places in all of these suburban locations. The information on the master and uh, community-led plans that are currently being implemented um, can be found online as shown on this slide. So turning to the uh, higher priority suburban regeneration locations, um, recent progress in New Brighton includes the um, proposal to bring forward $300,000 for um, to sort of kickstart the urban, the New Brighton Mall upgrade um, as part of work uh, that we're doing to align public and private projects out in the centre. And also with a New Brighton, uh, the large-scale mural that was supported by the Place Partnership Fund last financial year was completed, which showcases both the local New Brighton community and also local artistic talent. And in Linwood Village, the um, additional funding that was necessary to um, get the contract awarded for the streetscape upgrade um, has been sourced through the um, government's um, climate emergency response fund. The next two slides show major milestones um, that have been achieved in the other master plan locations. Uh, to the left, the new coastal pathway connections at Tidal View and Wind Service Reserve, plus um, associated amenity enhancements have now been opened to the public, which represents the completion of three interrelated 
projects from the Ferry Road Master Plan. In the middle, uh, Waka Kotahi has confirmed a draft option um, plan for the uh, Brougham Street project upgrade, which will um, assist contribute to the pedestrian improvements and the cycle infrastructure anticipated by the Sydenham Master Plan. And also in Sydenham, um, it's benefited from Alive in Places rates incentive funding in relation to a space activated at 387 to 389 Colombo Street, which is now occupied by multiple artist studios. In Littleton, the new uh, public toilet block at Albion Square and also significant improvements at um, Te Nukutai of Tapua Naval Point were completed ahead of Sale GP back in March. And thanks to Life and Bacon Spaces, um, community use of the Collets Corner site in the town centre and also the uh, Littleton Orchard project on residential red zone land has continued over the last six months. Um, as noted earlier, um, urban regeneration projects underway in centres that um, where the community themselves have developed their own plan. Um, and in Divan Harbour, an identified priority in their plan getting to the point um, is a replacement building to deliver on the community and commercial activities that used to be um, provided by on the old uh, Godly House site. So um, the community board uh, recently approved the preferred lessee for a commercial hospitality lease proposed on Snodup Point Reserve, um, and um, what will occur next is public consultation on that proposed lease as it moves through that process. Many community-led placemaking projects were supported by Life and Vacant Spaces and uh, the Green Lab in other suburban locations. Firstly, around the um, Otakaro Avon River Corridor, the uh, community development progressed at the Revolution Eco Hub and also at the Richmond Community Garden, and also their lives licence agreement uh, with Lynn's for the East Times East. Uh, proposal came to an end and the assets there have been gifted to the Burwood East Residence, Residence Association um, with the support from both council and Rose for change. In Waltham, uh, community activation and enhancement at the former uh, Seven Oaks school site in Hassels Lane continued and Lynn's uh, uh, lives, sorry, completed their Enliven Places projects funded communal seating and wood-fired pizza oven. In Phillipstown, the Phillipstown hub has been developing a collaborative drop-in workspace, um, workshop space that supports access to tools, um, upcycling, upskilling, and also the, um, the gardening on and greening of um, rental properties in the area. And Liv's also brokered a site at 400 St. Asa Street um, for um, photosynthesis, which is a not-for-profit photography studio. And finally, in Maidaho, the Green Lab and the Maidaho Neighbourhood Trust completed a community co-design neighbourhood garden. Turning to community funding, we use the United Places Rates and Centre funding to support property owners who um, allow their vacant building or site to be used for temporary activations. And in addition to Sydenham, um, two other suburban locations benefited from that funding. They were the community gathering space um, Common Ground at 91 Estuary Road in South Brighton and the aforementioned site in Phillipstown occupied by photosynthesis. Another funding mechanism uh, that we use to support community-led projects that um, connect communities to their places and spaces is the Place Partnership Fund. Um, and two locations have benefited from that recently. Um, in Birdling's flat, it funded the now comp completed repainting of a mural which depicts the Māori story of Tikituna and the historic and modern connection of traditional Māori eiling at Lake Wairewa. And in um, Ooruhia, it funded uh, Project uh, Whakapai, an environmental hub at the Kapitahi Ka uh, Confluence Conservation Park, founded on <coughs> Mataranga Māori values uh, for Mahina Kai and also traditional Māori medicine. So that's the end of the presentation. Are there any questions?
Thank you. It's a, it, that was very well done, and, and thank you, Bruce, for um, suggesting that we listen to good news, because we have been a bit lacking today, well, in some respects. Um, Mark. I see them spread all over the city. As well. Thank you. Um, that all looks really good. Um, thank you for what you do. Um, I did notice there's a fairly large pit corner of the city uh, out the, the west end, which doesn't really seem to get any attention. Is it intentional, or is that something we need to work on? Um, I think, well, um, most of the Marsupin um, areas are more to sort of the east and the south of the city. Um, in terms of enlivened place places projects, they can pop up anywhere. So it's really just what's occurred over the last six months um, that will come to you today. Um, and we also have a number of tools that um, we present, and you've seen examples of how they've been used here by the community themselves. So we're very happy to uh, work with you uh, through the community governments teams in particular to introduce your communities to these tools so they can use them as well. Very, very good answer. Okay. So, uh, Celeste. This isn't um, a question, it's just a comment. It's just to say thanks so much for your work on this. Um, I do want to sort of um, acknowledge how uh, rewarding it's been to work with staff on this particular project so I just want to say a special thanks to Bruce and Rachel from Christchurch GZ. I think this is a really good example of where there is great co collaboration between council, um, private sector and community and I'm really looking forward to seeing some really great things come through this year so I just want to give a, a, a shout out to the people that have been working behind the scenes and with us really closely on this. Um, it's been really really great work and Lots of good things coming through now, so thanks so much. Thank you. Okay, Be before I'll put that. But before I do that, I'd say just say once again, thank you very much. Very well put together uh, presentation. So congratulations. So I'll put that motion. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Thank you. So we will now do a karakia. Go Kel. <coughs> You go, Kim. We've got it. Thank you very much for your indulgence.